Tradoon.
him through the mist. Oh, it was terrible. Back the big long more. On dark winter nights, when the mist hangs over it as it does now, we've known death come in many ways to the honest folk reclaimed by that dark stretch of water, and whose bodies have never been found. We know that those waters go down, down, deeper than man has ever plumbed. How then can these people tell us what's down there? It's something from the depths, something from hell itself. Something's got to be done. Angus, something's going to be done. <laughs> Everybody and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It is really good to have you here. Glad you could join us on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon, or whatever time it may happen to be. Whenever and wherever you're watching this. Whether you're watching hello, well, whether you're watching right now in chat, hello chat. Whether you're watching live or whether you're watching later on in the VOD or on YouTube, I'm glad you're here and a very, very happy... International Sawfish Day to you. Today, we're going to be learning about and celebrating these incredible chondrichthian fishes, cartilaginous fishes. And Geoloxa, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizer. It's good to have you here. We've got a lot of cool sawfish stuff to talk about today. And remember when I said I'd be streaming early today? Here we are, like... Almost two hours early. Good stuff. Anyway, if it's your very first time here, and it might be yours, Geoloxa, and it's probably the first time for some other people too, welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I know we're talking about sawfish today, but dinosaurs are what I actually study, what I publish on in the scientific literature, and what I dig up during the summers. You should check out the YouTube page if you'd like to see some of our uh, recordings of broadcast live from the field. We dug up at least at least three new species of dinosaur this past summer in June and July and August in uh, Wyoming and Utah. And uh, I live streamed whenever I could from there, whenever was feasible. So check those out. I wanted to show people what it's actually like to dig up dinosaurs. That's Kind of my whole purpose for being here on Twitch is to to give people an inside look into fossil science. Paleontology, what is it? How does it work? Why is it exciting? Why is it important to understand? Why is fossil science relative re, relative? Why is it relevant to your everyday life? We're gonna be talking about that today with regard to sawfish. We'll be talking about their fossil history. We'll be talking about of lore around them. We'll be talking about their conservation, their biology, and why they're important as animals and how fossils help us understand them in context. So yeah, and they are rays, Kennedy. Yes, indeed. Sawfish are uh, batoids. They're, uh, they're part of the, the ray clade. We'll be talking about that too. Yeah. And Geoloxa says, hello, regards from Spain. Ah, claro que sí, gracias, Geoloxa. E bienvenidos a paleontologizing de la área de la Bahía de San Francisco. It's good to have you here. Um, I hope uh, hope things are going well for you there in Spain. Shoot, if you had been here earlier this week, we were talking all about dinosaurs from Spain uh, on Spain's National Day. That was um that wasn't this week. Sorry, that was last week. So check out the uh, the VOD from that, or the YouTube page. I'll give you a link. But we were talking all about your country's dinosaurian fossil heritage. Um, here we go. Yeah, dinosaurs of Spain. Let's get back. JLB Smith. This is a book. There we go. 
were talking about coelacanth that day, or coelacanths in this moment. But yeah, it was uh, Spanish dinosaurs screamed at. There's a link. There you go. Yeah. Um, good stuff. And hello to you, Sculpin. And welcome, welcome. Let's see who's here right now. And we will say hello to everybody. Uh, we've got an interesting, uh, interesting viewership right now. Starting early, some of our regulars aren't here yet. Uh, Over It Already was first today. How are you doing, Over It Already? I hope you're hanging in there. It's good to see you. Welcome to Paleontologizing. And, uh, Shula Dama, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Arle. A fine Tradoon to you as well, Arlai. It's good to see you. Uh, go for Fluffernut. How you doing, Fluff? Welcome. Welcome. Tommy Platicus. Glad you're excited for the early stream today. It's good to see you. The Bread God Zero. All hail. Welcome, welcome. Praise be. Matt M33, I hope you're doing well. It's good to have you here. Ghostly Ghoul says, I saw a fish once. Har har, Ghostly Ghoul. <laughs> it's good to have you here. Melicia Total. Hola a ti también. And holy cow, Sculpin. Oh yeah. Thank you for those five gift subs there. Sculpin, holy cow. Thank you, thank you. There are now five people in chat. I won't have to worry about ads at all for this broadcast and for all subsequent broadcasts for the next 30 days. I appreciate your generosity, Sculpin. Thank you for supporting my mission of science outreach here as we try and get to our sub goal before the end of Wednesday's stream. Um, I'm not going to be streaming on Thursday or Friday this week or on Monday. So I'm going to be at TwitchCon. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But let me continue making my way down through chat. We've got Esther the Dreamer. Ciao to you too, Esther. Welcome, welcome. Trappy Jenkins. Hope you're doing well, Trappy. It's good to see you. Uh, Thalo, hello, hello to you. I hope all is well. Texas Cryptid. How are you doing? What's shaking? Uh, Moosey Fate. Oh, yourself, Moosey Fate. It's good to see you here. Baja Smancer. I dig that Apatosaurus. How you doing, Baja? Um, Andy then did. Welcome, welcome, Andy. Good to have you here. Neilf. I'm glad you've made it back as well. It's good to see you, Neilf. And All Puff No Tough. That's a name I have not seen before yet in this chat. Welcome, welcome, All Puff. Thank you for uh, for joining us here on Paleontologizing. Reanimated Bit is here. Says a wild Tradoon. You are a wild Tradoon, Reanimated Bit. <laughs> I'm glad you've made it your way back to chat. It's good to see ya. Golganek. How are you doing, Golganek? Welcome. Welcome. And uh, Kennedy, yes indeed, Sawfish are raised. It's good to see you, Kennedy. Uh, Sparhawk. Says, hey, Danny. Long... So long, no see. How are you doing, Sparhawk? Welcome back. Good to have you here. Yeah. And Safibshte. Um. <laughs> Is there supposed to be a... I don't know what tune to sing that to, Golganek. But I appreciate you. Haraz. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Haraz. And uh, Craig C, 1978. Craig, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Uh, still checking anonymously? I appreciate that, Sparhawk. It's good to have you back. Uh, and uh, Hermager Surfish. Yes, iconic song. We're going to be talking all about Sawfish today. And uh, totally, totally Tubular Tima. Hello to you, too. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Want to see what's on the 3D printer right now? Does anybody have a guess as to what we might be printing for International Sawfish Day? Any guesses? Hmm. Sparhawk says, I still want you to name a dinosaur after me when I get enough money to sponsor a dig of yours. Cheers, Sparhawk. May that come to pass. Uh, printing a body part. But what, Sculpin? But what? Hmm. The nose says iconic song. That is already done. Um, a saw says Baja Spencer. Well, if you'd put a fish emoji after that, you would have had it. I'm printing 
a whole sawfish. A little one. But in multiple pieces, because that's the only way I could get it to fit on the print bed. It'll be done in about three hours. So I should be streaming still at that point, and uh, we can assemble it. And uh, talk about the overall body shape of these creatures. And how they're more closely related to rays. They're act they actually are kind of ray. They're part of Batoidia. They're part of that clade, if I recall correctly. Even though they're sometimes they're called um, carpenter sharks, they are not sharks. They are a kind of ray. So we'll talk about that. Yeah. But now I'm printing the uh, the whole thing here. Let me show you so it makes some sense for you. Uh, sawfish folder. Here we go. Um, there we are. Does that make sense now? It's in three parts. So you're seeing it from this angle here. There's the rostrum, there's the torso, there's the tail. That is what is currently printing right here. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're still at about halfway up, so... I guess if I go like this, we're about right here. Something like that. There you go. Does that make sense now? Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Cool. And Newbie Muffin, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Feed me the science, says Newbie Muffin. I'm happy to. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Speaking of science, and being a scientist, and, uh, well, shoot. I am not going to be streaming on Thursday or Friday or Monday coming up. Um, you can type in the uh, calendar command to uh, to pull up this calendar here. Today is International Sawfish Day. That's what we're streaming now. I'm not streaming Thursday or Friday or Monday because I will be at TwitchCon in just a few short days. And I am going to be helping to host a special Twitch panel. This is going to be a really cool event. It'll be me and four other scientists and science educators uh, answering questions about doing science on Twitch. Newbie Muffin, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologize. Thanks for clicking that follow button. So yeah, like I said before, it's going to be Moo Hoodles, who is a science educator here on Twitch. She does uh, astrobiology and um, astronomy. Nerduino, who is a former NASA scientist. Uh, Nicotine is going to be our moderator. Uh, she's not a scientist or a science educator, but she's going to be a wonderful moderator for us. An MC, and she's apparently a big deal on Twitch, so we're really lucky to have her. Um, there's this dingus. I don't know who that is. I'm just kidding. That's me. Science Streams, a systems and molecular biologist. And a volcano doc, a volcanologist, volcano scientist. We're going to be talking about how to do science on Twitch. Why Twitch is a, a really good platform for science outreach. And, um, and honestly, why there should be more scientists on this platform. Part of this is kind of a pitch to our colleagues in the sciences, being like, hey, we're doing really cool stuff here. You could do science outreach through live streams. You could do it on Twitch. So, yeah, pretty excited about that. And uh, Sculpin says, watch out for the slot machines. Yeah, I'm not going to... I doubt I'm going to run into any slot machines um, as I'm running through the casino floor. But I'll be careful not to trip over them or anything. Um... While I'm there in Vegas, attending TwitchCon, I'm going to be passing these out to anybody who wants one. We were talking about those buttons, and I've got the first of them all made now, and I am pretty excited about that. Limited edition, handmade, paleontologizing buttons. I've been, uh, I put together a few of these this morning after I went and got them printed. go 
I actually had to do a redo on the design because they didn't come out properly at first, but the guy at the print shop was super, super cool, and I'll definitely be going back there. He let me reprint them for free. So big shout out to Kenny for doing that. That was awesome. Yeah, I drew that Bahas Mancer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, and then I've got... I might be, uh... We'll see how much time I have before, uh, before I take off. I might have to make some of these live on stream tomorrow. We'll see. But here is my, uh, circle punch right there. And the button press. This is what I make those with. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be doing about 100 of them. Although I might have parts for about 150. We'll see. We'll see how I'm feeling and how many I think might get given out during uh, TwitchCon. So if you are going to be at TwitchCon, make sure you attend the panel. And, uh, yeah. If you run into me, ask me for a button. Yeah. And yes, indeed, Tommy Plotticus, that is... The Yoshi's Trike site specimen. Um, I was trying to figure out, like, what... I want to put a dinosaur on the button. But what kind of dinosaur? And I figured, well, shoot, Yoshi's Trike is about as appropriate as it gets. Because this is a particular Triceratops specimen that I dug up back in 2011 with the Museum of the Rockies crew. There we go. There we are. There's me next to the skull of this critter. That's a cast of the skull reconstructed. Uh, if you ever go to Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana, you will see this on display. Whole mounted skeleton. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. You can even get a model Yoshi's trike. I don't know if they sell these at the museum. They should. The gift shop knows what they're doing. They should be selling these. Um, but yeah, Eofauna put out a model. This is this particular Triceratops specimen with the super, super long brow horns. Yeah. This is the Triceratops from the Yoshi's trike site, named after Yoshi Katsura who's the Japanese paleontologist who discovered the site back in 2010. Yeah. Uh, oh, with Ashley and her husband? Yeah, yeah. Ashley and um, and Lee Hall work at Museum of the Rockies now. This is true. Lee, uh, Ashley's husband, he was one of my, uh, my crew chiefs that summer in 2011. Yeah. Good guy. Lee and Ashley, good people. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, so, there we go. Find me at TwitchCon. I'll give you a button. Um, I'm really happy with how these turned out. I really like the color scheme, and I knew I needed to find some sort of design that would work well, some sort of color scheme that would work well with the purple of the Twitch logo, because I wanted to put the Twitch glitch on there. And, uh, I think it turned out pretty well. You really can't go wrong with purple and orange. Good combination. Yeah. And Newbie Muffin says, I love that it's not a toy, it's a model. I mean, it's more expensive than a toy. Shoot, these things are not cheap. Um. Yeah. There you go. Um, well, here's a link right here. But yeah, they are, uh, they're not cheap. Actually, that seems like it's gone down in price. I thought I paid like $40 for mine. Um, yeah, $16.66. 66. Oh, 16 pounds, 66 pence. Is that how that works? I'm not from the UK. But, uh... 
Yeah, 30 to 31 dollars for... That's not terrible, I suppose. Um, it's not often that you can buy a... A really, really high-quality, hyper-accurate, up-to-date dinosaur model of a particular dinosaur specimen. So that's pretty cool, if you ask me. It's pretty cool. Mr. Maxi says, is that the biggest trike that we've ever found? No, far from it. But it does have the longest brow horns. Yeah. Um, by far the longest brow horns, I think. And, uh... Yeah. Here we go. That's the image I'm looking for. We were talking about this yesterday. It's super cool that we've got enough Triceratops specimens nowadays. Most of them at Museum of the Rockies. M-O-R is the abbreviation. Those are the specimen numbers right there. Um, we've got enough Triceratops specimens nowadays that we've got precise data on when they're from that we can essentially watch these animals evolve over time. And this one, M-O-R 3027, Triceratops from the Yoshi's Trike site, is from the middle of the Hell Creek Formation. There it is right there, actually. M-O-R 3027. Right here. Uh, yeah, this is uh, from the middle Hell Creek. So these animals are, are changing over time. Their brow horns start to get a little bit longer, and then they get short and stout when you get to the top. But the nose horn starts off small, gets bigger, progressively bigger and bigger until you get up here with the Triceratops prorsus species. I don't know why I'd use quotation marks for that. It's unwarranted. But anyway. Yeah. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um. Anywho. So I was, uh... I was pretty excited about this. need to actually save this real quick. The uh, the new design and have that ready to show off. Because I've modified it a little bit since I last made a mock-up. So... Here we go. Let's do some magic here. Gradient... Merge visible. Put that back on there. And that too. Um, let's get to here. Delete. Delete. And let's save this. Printed. See, so that is a PNG. And there we go. Good stuff. Yeah. And Newbie Muffin says that really does be a proper drawing. Thank you. Uh oh, wait, what happened? Oh, there we go. There you go. Yeah. Not too shabby, right? Not too shabby. Pretty happy with that. And I think they turned out pretty well. Um, rather than, like, trying to print it at home, I decided to actually go to a print shop that had a high DPI laser jet printer. And I'm certainly glad I did. The detail is fantastic. So, if you're going to be at TwitchCon... Track me down. Love to meet you and give you a button. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Good stuff. So anyway. Uh, oh, Claire Burr, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Claire. It's good to see ya. Purple Purple. What music is playing? Uh, I've just got some surf rock music going. From the Surfabats. That's the group. I don't have a track name. And you're okay, Claire? Okay. I'm glad you're here. I know I'm early today. It's good to see you, Claire. Uh, but yeah, today... 
is International Sawfish Day. So why don't we get to talking about these incredible creatures? Yeah, let me play you a... A little kind of intro to these animals. Twenty years ago, on my first fishing trip to the Amazon, I was in a hardware store looking for rope and other supplies when Wait I caught sight of Welcome. something that stopped me died. dead in my tracks. Yeah. About a yard long, with a profile just like a chainsaw, <laughs> except that each vicious-looking point was fully two inches long. What I'd stumbled upon was the snout, or rostrum, of a fish the locals called the Araguagua. <laughs> this is an animal I'd been vaguely aware of from my youth, but which I'd never actually seen. In the comics and adventure books of my childhood, this creature was normally depicted as a sea monster, usually brandishing its serrated weapon at terrified skin divers. I don't ever remember seeing a picture of a real one. And until that hardware store in Brazil, I'd no idea that this large and wickedly armed fish might swim up rivers. They do. That's where the young ones are. The animal in question is known in English as a sawfish. Giants over 20 feet long have occasionally been caught. And legend has it that these monsters will even attack boats. Yeah, they don't actually. Unless very much provoked. Century, the Swedish chronicler Olaus Magnus states that this terrifying fish will, and I quote, swim under ships and cut them, that the water may come in and he may feed on the men when the ship is drowned. Yeah, that's not true. They don't eat people. <laughs> More recently, a story from India talks of a man hacked in two. If those accounts sound far-fetched, then more believable, perhaps, is this newspaper article from the 1930s about an attack off the coast of Florida. Hmm. The story goes that a fisherman harpooned a large sawfish in shallow water. Why would you do that? Beautiful animals. Snout, the tables were suddenly turned. It is sensationalism, Rockefeller, yes. We're going to be talking about why. Shudder to imagine that rack of teeth scything into human flesh. Despite severe injuries, the victim in this instance appears to have survived. I'm glad that the fish who was the victim survived in this circumstance. Very, very glad. Um, we didn't hear what happened to the fishermen, so I don't know. But I'm glad that the uh, the sawfish managed to survive, having not been the aggressor in this circumstance was not the one who uh, harpooned the fisherman. But I've long wondered if the animal that attacked him could be the most fearsome of any fish to lurk in a river. Hmm. A sawfish. This is an animal which is, I think, deeply misunderstood. We're going to talk about why. But first, somebody was asking about the rostrum. Which, not only do I have printed, but I also painted it very quickly this morning with a rattle can. But, uh, check this out. The rostrum of a sawfish. This is printed life-size for a very, very large sawfish. It is, uh... They get this big. They actually get bigger than this. But pretty cool. Right? So the rostrum, this is actually the nose of this animal. It's not part of the mouth, and so calling these teeth is maybe a little bit misleading. They're more properly called denticles because 
They're made of the same kind of tooth-like material that the skin of sharks and stingrays are made out of. Uh, it's dentin, so it's, you know, it is like a tooth material, but these are not the teeth from inside the mouth. I want to make that very clear. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. And not a very good paint job yet, but it's, it at least is not the original filament color, which is which is good. Yeah. Looks like a chainsaw on a fish, says Day on the BC Man. Yeah. Java sources, I would not want to get a swipe from that. Me neither. These fish do use those to defend themselves, but they also use it to acquire prey. Um, but yeah, before we get a bunch more people in here, I figured it might be a good opportunity to uh, take a look at a, another kind of sensationalistic source a little bit. Let me, let me get that out and show you. So I was looking for a book on these creatures when I was in the biosciences laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley, a couple weeks ago. And uh, they didn't have any books on sawfishes in particular, but this popped up. Uh, the book is called Dangerous Sea Creatures. This is a book which was published, I think, back in the 70s, I'm guessing. Let's look at the actual publication date here. Oh, come on, stay there. Publication date? Bingo! 1976. Yeah. Tell my wife, Dorothy. Oh. And now if we go into the index, let me find out where the sawfish were, because there was an interesting story in here, which I kind of wonder if it's true. But we're going to be talking about it. Um. Alright. Sawfish, 244. There we go. Sawfish, and look at this enormous sawfish right here. Gargantuan. They can get this big if they are not persecuted. I think it's a small tooth sawfish there. Off the coast of Florida, I want to say. Yeah. But uh, let me get into the book here, and I'll read it to you. Maybe we'll get some uh, appropriate... Um, ambiance going. There we go. That'll work. So the sawfish passage. Well, 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 Mama M Media. Thank you for that hot new sound, and thank you for the raid, Mama M Media. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Mama Media has a new sound for their four listeners. It's good to have you here, Mom. Um, how was your stream? I hope it was really, really good. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Glad you could make it. And happy International Sawfish Day. We are talking about these incredible creatures. One that would have uh, had a rostrum like this. This is my 3D printed sawfish rostrum. This would be from an exceptionally large sawfish. But they do get this big. Um, so anyway. Let's talk about those critters. I was just about to read a passage from here about sawfish. This might be a little overly sensational, but let's, let's get into it nonetheless. So this is the author writing. When I was about five years old, there was quite a stir in the small Florida town on the Gulf where I lived. A group of commercial fishermen had captured a sea monster and st strung the creature up to a gin pole on the boat dock. 
The word spread rapidly, and in due course I was taken down to the waterfront to stare in wide-eyed wonder at the fantastic catch. No one thought of charging admission. The Adam. And Kinamara, thank you for the 23 months. I appreciate that, Kinamara. No one thought of charging admission, nor was there an entrepreneur on hand with a straw hat and a cane to give a spiel about the creature that had been dredged up from the depths. It was just a big oddity to be viewed and discussed by those who might be interested. There, in touching distance, if I had dared, I beheld the monster. Someone had measured it, and it was common knowledge that the creature was 17 feet long. I was told it was a sawfish, although there were some who mistakenly called it a swordfish. If you stood around and listened, there were all manner of tales to be heard about the giant that dangled from a heavy line that had been tied up around its tail. Some, who, uh, who seemed devoid of imagination, casually remarked on how they wished many more could be caught because they ate entirely too many oysters and crabs. I found it more fascinating to learn to others. There are fewer than 40 full time. Uh, Mr. Maxi, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maxi, for those five gift subs. Three of them. I really appreciate that. Expedition. Holy cow, look. We are, uh, we're approaching our sub goal for the week. Good stuff. Mr. Maxi 19 just gifted five subs. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Maxi. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, so some of the onlookers who seemed devoid of imagination casually remarked how they wished many more of these sort of, uh, sawfish could be caught because they ate entirely too many oysters and crabs. Try blaming the dinosaurs. It's not true at all. And thank you, Hogan, for the hundred bits. We do have a hype train going. Good stuff. Uh, I found it more fascinating to listen to others who related wild tales that they had heard about how large sawfish would attack boats, saw them in half, and proceed to butcher the human occupants. Not true stories. Still others told how such beasts were known to invade swimming beaches and cut the feet off of all who failed to get out of the water in time. Also not true. People make up all kinds of weird and wacky tales about animals. One thing was certain. No one was going to make me believe that such a fearful-looking brute would be content to dine on oysters and crabs. The longer I gazed in wide-eyed wonder, uh, the more I convinced I became that this thing they called a sawfish was undoubtedly the most dangerous creature the sea had to offer. From time to time, I've been taken down to the waterfront to see extra-large sharks that had also been placed on public display. Their bulk and ragged teeth protruding from a gaping mouth had been a source of wonder, but pilloried dead sharks seemed commonplace in comparison with this giant I now beheld. Long, pointed teeth, so many that I could not pretend to count them, jutted at right angles from a broad, flat snout, protruding from the front of the creature's head. It resembled a section of a cross-cut saw with teeth on both sides of the blade. Feed on oysters and crabs, indeed. It's meant to be sarcastic, I think. And thank you, Golganek, for the 100 bits. Appreciate that. The years passed by, and my interest in sea life continued with fishing, observing, collecting, studying, and wondering, but the memory of that 17-foot sawfish is never dimmed. In the early years, I simply could not accept the fact that nature would build such a magnificent living weapon of destruction and then decree that it should be used uh, to grub about in the bottom mud, uprooting bivalves and flushing out crabs. It seemed tantamount to sending a knight in shining armor to, to dig potatoes uh, when he should be busy slaying fire-breathing dragons. Well, hey, 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 let's be kind to dragons. There are two primary species of these strange creatures in the western Atlantic and nine recognized species in the genus Pristis, uh, distributed around the world in tropical, subtropical, and some temperate zone waters. One of the most numerous is the common sawfish, Pristis pectinatus, ranging from New York southward. Unfortunately, they no longer live up near New York. They've been completely wiped out in northern waters since the 1970s. The real giant of the clan is the large-toothed sawfish, Pristis uh, paratetti, known to reach a length of 20 feet and exceed 1,000 pounds in weight. All are members of the order Rajiformes, which includes the rays and skates, and in turn makes them the relatives of the sharks. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Luis D. And thank you, Luis de Leon. I appreciate that gift sub to Jim. I really do, Luis de Leon. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Uh, I see food, I eat it, I saw a sawfish, I put on my safety goggles. There you go, Luis de Leon. That's probably wise to do. I'm going to I'm gonna put this on hold for now. Because um, we've got a hype train going, and I don't want to discourage people from gifting. 
doing anything like that while uh, while this is going. But take a look at this rostrum. This one is particularly wide right here. They usually aren't this wide, but this would be from an exceptionally large individual. Um, one probably over 20 feet long. And uh, what an incredible animal it is. Let's find another video about this right here. Um, let's see. I think we've got an International Sawfish Day video, don't we? Is that this right here? No, let's just take a look at this anyway, though. It looks like a shark with a hedge trimmer for a nose. You can't confuse it for a very much out there in the ocean. Let me put it to you that way. Hmm. My name's Greg Palakis. I spend most of my time working on the small two sawfish and endangered species that we have here in, in our estuary. Hmm. Salute to this guy. Greg Doing and good work. are on a tagging mission. They've worked with babies before, but today they want to go big. The goal for the day is going to be to, to catch five, six, seven, eight foot, you know, a uh, meter and a half to, you know, three meter soft. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? And, welcome, uh, welcome. Put a variety of tags on them so we can see where they go. Our hypothesis is that they hang around in the estuary for a small amount of time. Do we have any Floridians here in chat? The Florida Keys. And then once they're mature, they would come back here in every other year pattern to give birth in our nurseries. No one ever studied these animals. Uh, so the first couple of years, we spent a lot of time uh, learning about the, the smallest. Neil from De La Cafecito. Be a little bit bigger, you know, we, uh, you know, these live habitats, they start to move off the coast the of your state. Learn more about that, uh, Pretty cool. History. Anytime uh, we catch a sawfish is a successful day. These things are endangered. So, you know, anytime we can catch one, any more than that is bonus. Uh, this is where Balint went. Yeah, Javasaurus. Sawfish are, you know, one of the coolest animals on the planet. They're really, they really uh, are. An example of successful evolution to me. You don't have a long snout like that that has teeth on it by accident. Incredible sawfish animal. Sawfish are one of the top predators in our system. They use the saw to feed. They swing back and forth really fast in schools of fish, and then they come back and eat whatever was injured. Uh, they can also use it to defend themselves. They're raised, so they hang out <laughs> on the bottom. That animation there is really funny to me. Uh, uh, they can also use it to defend themselves. They're raised, so they hang out on the bottom for a, a lot, and they, uh, you know, they don't move too too much. They're able to pump water over their gills, so they can they stay still for long periods of time. Pretty cool. The reason cool. they're endangered is uh, the main reason uh, is because of bycatch. You know, fisheries bycatch because they have this, um, you know, this this saw, this rostrum. Uh, Live footage. The there you go, get leg. If they even think about getting near a net of any kind, they get caught really, really easy. Yeah. Greg wants to know where the sawfish go so that those habitats can be protected. And so people fishing in those areas can be taught what to do if they encounter a sawfish. Yep. We caught a couple recently here, and uh, we're hoping to have some luck today. Greg's not the only one. The state of Florida has an app that's good for reporting any wildlife, and sawfish are one of them. We did get a handful of reports from around this, this area. We're at five, six. We'll use a depth finder. So we're kind of targeting this, uh, this deeper hole here at the entrance to Tarpon Bay. So we're looking at, you know, between four and seven meters of water is where we want to drop these, these baits. So these are chunks of ladyfish, and uh, we've had good luck with this bait in the past. But we're putting that bait right on the bottom and in some of these areas where we've seen sawfish before. So hmm. uh, fingers crossed. While they wait, Greg records the conditions to learn more about the waters sawfish thrive in. This is a YSI. We're going to take water quality here, just uh, temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen. The abiotic information that we collect can help us determine why the sawfish are here. Looks like Suddenly, some excitement. Looks like Janelle's got something on, so yeah, Janelle. Get it. Show them who's boss. Unfortunately, <laughs> the sawfish wins this round. We were fighting it a little bit. It was definitely hooked up, and it looked like it was kind of using the current. We are just trying to bring it to the boat, and it uh, it broke off. So we'll get some more bait. It broke the line? Is that the idea? Again. Wow. 
I don't know a great deal about fishing. After waiting and relocating. The sun is setting. No luck today, unfortunately, but uh, we'll get him next time. A few days later, undeterred, the team heads back out on the water to give it a shot. Sawfish cut the line. Yeah, there you go, Luis de Leon. Anytime we can catch a sawfish, <laughs> it happens. A on the water, and we land the Look at that. To bring them to shallow beach areas, and we'll keep them in the water. Even though sawfish are docile, Greg still has to be careful of those chompers. But once we get it to shallow water, and uh, usually we use welding. I mean, the chompers are underneath the head, and they don't really... That's not what you got to look out for. you got to look out for, you know... The rostrum. I mean, that's what you gotta look at. Maybe she was referring to these as chompers, the narrator. But yeah. Gloves and we hold those teeth and the sawfish is secure so that it's safe and we're safe. We wear the welding gloves because they have those teeth. Obviously we need to be really careful, but those fish are pretty strong side to side so they can swing that thing and be just fine. We spend a lot of time, we use a variety of tags. We've kind of been thinking as a recovery hmm. team that it would be uh, decades before they would be to the point we could take them off the list. But you know, they're showing signs, some signs of recovery and, and we're optimistic that maybe- That's really good to hear. They would be uh, at least downgraded maybe to threatened or something like that. That would be great. Wow. Because they are currently endangered. All living species of sawfish are currently endangered. Um, very cool. Very cool. And, uh, but yeah, yeah. And Benutrice, Adobatus, Poyai. Kite species looks like an eagle. I've never heard of that. No, no. I don't know a lot about fossil fishes, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and that makes sense, Kennedy. That makes sense. Yeah. Daily Cavacito says, so great to learn something new today. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um, and these animals are protected. So take a look at this news report. from South Florida. This is from seven months ago. That's from this year. Uh, take a look. We're back with a rare and unique fish in Florida's waters, and few of us have ever seen it in the wild. The small tooth sawfish has been a protected species in our state for more than 30 years now. And only Local 10's Janine Stanwood has body camera footage showing the arrest of two South Florida men who allegedly caught one and are now facing serious charges. Yeah, do not persecute these fishes. That, uh, was a little suspicious to them. They saw some uh, flashlights in the mangroves. FWC, come here. Body camera video shows Florida Fish and Wildlife officers approaching men in the mangroves in Everglades City. Part of the boat is spray painted black. Trying to stay. Mm. Don't move. Hey, don't, don't, move. Move. don't move. Stay right there. Stay right Someone's there. Someone's trying to be in sneaky. In the stern of the vessel, uh, they had a white cooler in here. Mullet. Uh -huh. Watch out for its bite. Yeah, there you go, Beats International. They first see undersized fish. Listen to me, guys. Turn around. Turn around. All right, put your hands behind your back. But then, a shocking discovery. Sawfish in here, too. Uh, yep. A rare, endangered, and unique looking creature called a small tooth sawfish. If you catch one by accident, by law, you have to release it unharmed. It does have. The features uh, similar to a shark, the dorsal fins um, and the side to side tail. So this is the sawfish that was recovered. You can see it really looks like a cross between a oh, ray and a shark. poor thing. This is the rostrum, which is that saw like snout. There really isn't anything like this in our Florida waters. The small tooth sawfish is a critically endangered species. Dr. Neil Hammerschlag with the University of Miami says the sawfish used to be relatively abundant in Florida 100 years ago, but the population has plummeted. They were hunted historically for basically for trophies. I mean, they got they get to be really large, yeah. and then they've got this saw, which you know became a collector's item. But he says the biggest threat wasn't hunting; it's these nets called gill nets, which are no longer legal, so people make them by hand sawfish were getting entangled in gill nets because of that long saw that they have on their nose. FWC says that's what the men in Everglades City were using. We were with officers as they measured yeah. its size. 
from across the bay here. They could see uh, subjects were uh, what's called striking, dip, uh, throwing a net, uh, a gill net. Crazy Nut DK, thank you for the 24 months. If you think about really what appreciate that. looks like, you know, it's got this huge rostrum that is essentially going to make it uh, like catch on and get entangled in those nets and they'll wrap around and then they can't swim and it could potentially, you know, obviously lead to death. And this is really problematic when you're talking about, you know, a critically endangered species. We went to the listed addresses for the men arrested here in Miami, but no one wanted to talk. Geraldo Amador and Pablo Condi face charges including possessing fish over the legal limit, using any legal net in state waters, and taking an endangered species. Scientists and wildlife experts tell us Good. protections for the sawfish are in place for a reason. One of the things that have helped sawfish is a ban on commercial gill net fishing. Uh, particularly in Everglades National Park, if you protect them properly, you will hopefully see a rebound. That's the whole idea. Every one yeah. member of the species counts if we're going to have a recovery. In Everglades City, Janine Stanwood, Local 10 News. And the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission says the case is still pending and it's being continued in court in the next hearing. It's scheduled hmm. for March 31st. Justice for sawfish. Yeah. Um sort of thing is important. I mean, that might seem like a harsh punishment for someone catching fish, but these animals are endangered, and they need all of the help and protection that we can get so they don't become completely extinct. Their historic range goes all the way up to, like, northern New York. Or, I guess, past the New York Islands. Um, and now they only exist in the U.S. in South Florida. That video is from this year, Daily Cafecito. Here is a link right there. Yeah, that's not at all harsh. Makes me sick, says Moosey Fate. Yeah, me too. Me too. Here, I just plugged in my new mouse. Let me get this. Mouse settings. Feels a little bit more sluggish than the other one. So let's increase the cursor speed. There we go. I think that's going to be just about perfect. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Nice. Yeah. And, uh... Patrick Crusaders is another problem is the myth that fish can't feel pain and don't have feelings. That makes people very cruel to fish because they don't think it matters. I hate seeing fishermen just let fish die a slow death after catching them. I mean, yeah, Patrick Crusader, that's a really good point. Um, fish actually have been shown to have personalities. Um, here, take a look at this. Oh, stop it. If you spend much time next right. to There we go. Like animals do, um, we often find that once we start paying attention to individual animals and tracking them across situations, we might find something like what's shown here in this slide where it's showing two different guppies and also a predator pictured here in the foreground. Um, Jim says, I don't know how people could think animals don't feel pain. Uh, That's... Th a shockingly common idea. Like, I have family members who think that animals don't feel pain and can't feel emotions and that sort of thing, you know? Yeah. This guppy here is actually approaching up to the mouth of this predator, whereas there's this other guppy who's sort of hiding back in the weeds. And there's growing evidence that these individual differences here and how these guppies are responding to this predator are actually consistent through time. And interestingly, there's also evidence that these individual differences that are consistent here in one kind of context, this is sort of an anti-predator context, are also related to individual differences in behavior in other sorts of situations. And in fact, in a classic study actually using three-spine stickleback, 
um, Felicity Hunting for Stickleback. Yeah, an we've talked about them before many times. And how they responded to a predator. So some individuals like this blue one here um, was were really bold in that they sort of went up to the mouth of a predator, whereas other individuals like this one pictured here, this is hypothetical data, um, were more timid and they sort of hung back in the weeds. And then months later, when she measured these sticklebacks again, um, she measured them during the breeding season, and she found that the males that had been really bold toward predators when they were youngsters were the ones that tended to be really aggressive toward other male sticklebacks when they were grown up. And so what that hmm. means is that if you sort of plot Interesting. individual variation in boldness towards predators and individual variation in aggressiveness towards conspecifics, if you plot them sort of in the correlation plot, what you find is a positive correlation between boldness <laughs> and aggressiveness, or what we might yep. call a boldness aggression behavioral syndrome. So this is really what we mean by uh, correlated behavioral traits, or you can call it personality, or you can call it a syndrome, or whatever you like, is that individuals are behaving in a predictable way through time and across situations. When behaviors are correlated with each other, there are some really interesting implications. So this slide is meant to represent some of the things that, say, a red-winged blackbird does during the course hmm. of its lifetime. Um, so we tend to think that how a male red-winged blackbird, for example, behaves while he's trying to track mates, so how he sings, how that's not related to how he, say, behaves in a flock or, say, during competition for resources and his levels of aggression or maybe even how he behaves as a parent. But if individual differences in behavior are consistent across contexts, then that means that maybe what a male does, say, during competition for resources could be related to how that same male behaves um, as a parent. Hmm. And when these behaviors are consistent, then that might suggest that, well, then maybe this really bold and aggressive kind of uh, red-winged black bird might have trouble switching or sort of turning off this general tendency to be bold and aggressive when the situation changes. So he might be do great during competition for resources, but if he's too aggressive all the time, that might not be so great during the parenting context. Evolutionary biologists, when I tell them that what I study is correlated behavioral traits, they say, yeah, you know, we've known about this forever. We've known that <laughs> genetic correlations between traits can have really important evolutionary consequences, and rarely do traits just operate independently of one another. And if we think of personality as being sort of a, a suite or an assemblage of different behavioral traits that happen to be correlated with each other, there's actually a really strong tradition within evolutionary biology <laughs> of trying to study this. However, um, while there's this existing sort of framework for thinking about the evolution of correlated traits, the reality is, is that seldom have we actually tried to measure, say, or estimate the G matrix or the matrix of genetic correlations um, between behavioral traits. And most of these um, sorts of approaches have been concerned with kind of static tra traits that don't change um, mm. very much within an organism's lifetime. And obviously, when we're talking about something like behavior, this is something that can be really plastic. Pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff. There is another video here that I haven't seen yet, but might be interesting. We'll give it a quick watch, I guess. But, uh, yeah. Um, Oleb Dude says, I still remember when Finau, don't know who that is, caught that sawfish last year, then another the next week, both live on Twitch. Thing was bigger than his boat. I really hope he let them go. Very large sawfish are very old sawfish. And, um, yeah, shoot. Huh. Interesting. And Baha Spencer says, Ardenal, local vid. Well, 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 let's take a look at. Uh, he absolutely did and then called it an efficient wildlife. Well, good for him, Olive, dude. That's really good to hear. Awesome. And there are clips. If you can find me one of those clips, I would love to see that, Olive, dude. I would love to see that. Yeah. Z Hanger says, do you fish, Danny? I do not. No. Um, I don't I don't eat fish, so uh I don't I don't really see what the point is. You know? Although if it were in a if it were in like a research context, I would absolutely help with fishing for research purposes, but yeah. This is the very first photograph I ever took of a fish on the water. Uh, a gold cine rass. Oh, very cool. Here, we'll get back to this in a second, but let's take a look at this link first. Can you crank anymore? 
Hopefully there's no swear words. I gotta go for it. I gotta go for it. Brace yourself, because there might be. This is an incredible animal, and might get a little bit salty with their language here. I gotcha. So just be warned. That's a big fish, dude. He's, he's about to go, I think. Okay, I got him. IRL fishing streams. That's interesting. I wonder what kind of a setup he's got. If it's like a, a live view solo or what. We're going to have to let him go right away. He thinks it might be a sawfish. 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 Look at that freaking thing. <laughs> All right, all right. That thing's 20 feet long. <laughs> oh, my God, that's a sawfish. <laughs> that thing's that thing 20 feet long. Oh, man. My heart. We got to get him off the line. Um, we got to get him off the line drop. Then. We got to get him off the right way. Jenna, bolt cutters? Yeah. Cable cutters? You're not going to be able to cut it like that. I'm not going to be able to cable cut it. I doubt it. But I'm going to have to. Wow. You got it. Very cool. Very cool. Um... Thank you, thank you, uh, Oleb dude, for uh, for posting. That's really neat. I didn't realize that anybody had ever broadcast a sawfish on stream before. That's pretty neat. Pretty neat. And yeah, we got to get him off the line as soon as he knew. Commendable. Agreed. Big paleo salute to Oleb dude. Very, very cool. Yeah. Um, nice. And is this? The same one right here? I think this is a different one. See how deep it is here? I'm getting in the water. If that's what I think that is, dude, are you kidding me? I actually don't want any parts of this right now, dude. Chat, I think that's a freaking sawfish. <laughs> it's either a giant dorsal fin or that was just a bill that just came out of the water. Maybe you caught the same fish twice? It's possible. If it's a really big one... No chance. Um, it's a sawfish, dude. Yeah, oh my god, it's a sawfish. <laughs> dude, right there, man. Are you kidding me? Why are they in here? It's weeks want, apart. Oh, nice. I don't want to catch these things. I want a bull shark, dude. Why? Why? I know, I know. Very cool. Very cool. He's going to run. Yeah, I'm going to try to cut the hook as close to his mouth as possible. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Get the line. Cut the line as close to... The mouth as you can. Look at that rostrum you see it there under the water. Look how long that is. This is a huge animal. So that's a small to small tooth sawfish. Look at that beautiful rostrum. Holy cow. What an incredible animal. Wow. Wow. In the inlet, Fort Pierce, Florida. Very cool. dude. Is that on the Atlantic or the Gulf side or the Atlantic side? I'm not that familiar with my Florida geography, unfortunately. Okay. Atlantic side. Cool. Yeah. Look at that. Holy moly. Look at how powerful it is. Okay, I'll get on this side. A 17-foot boat there. We're going to let this thing go, guys. It's just... I did too, but then I was like, then I, I why, dude, I, I thought these things were rare. <laughs> they are rare, but thanks to uh, conservation efforts, they are becoming a little bit more common, which is good. They're starting to recover. Okay, ready, set, Just cut wherever you can, as close as you can, we're going to get them right here. Cut it right there, go ahead, go ahead. Good cut. Wow. Wow. I thought they were rare. <laughs> Dude, I tell you, like, sometimes... Very cool. Very cool. Thank you, Olub Dude, for, uh, for posting that. That was a joy to see. I appreciate that. See, this is the magic of Twitch, you know? Having that, uh... That live interaction. Appreciate you, Olive Dude. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. He's constantly complaining, but he's responsible. 
you know, that's a personality difference, like we see with fishes, too. Um, but yeah. Anyway, uh, Dinosaur Dave posted this. Uh, something to look at later. It's worth it. Oh, cool. Uh, very neat, Dinosaur Dave. Thank you. Here, let me let me save this. Here in my notes. There we go. Thank you, Dinosaur Dave. Very nice. Yeah. But are fish smart and do they have personalities? Let's take a look. Exactly 20 years ago in a cold Norwegian fjord. And it's no coincidence that the species that I photographed is a gold cine wrasse. Because the gold cine is a curious fish species. Here's Goldsini checking out the cameras of a hmm. baited camera rig recently. It just needs to check out this novel thing that has landed smack into its environment. You live in Norway. Very cool, Mr. Maxi. Nice. It was cold, but they could don't and at the Holy Lipton, thank you for those five gift subs. I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you, Holy Lipton. Five gift subs. There are five people in chat who will not have to worry about any ads for the next month. Thanks to you, Holy Lifton. Thank you for supporting this channel. Thank you for supporting me and supporting Science Outreach. Um, yeah, if we want to be on track to finish our sub goal by the end of this short week, because tomorrow is my last streaming day this week, because I'm going to TwitchCon, we're going to try and get to 66 subs, or 60, we'll say 67 today so if we get just 20 more then uh then we'll be on track to hit it this week so yeah yeah um and jim says of course fish are smart i used to volunteer at a local aquarium very cool jim very cool and the staff warned us that we need to be strict when feeding the eagle rays because if we aren't careful they will train us instead of the other way around yes yes um very nice and Sculpin says 53. No, I mean, that'll be on track for us to finish this week. Wednesday, you know, we've got today's stream and tomorrow's stream. Um, so if we want to be two-thirds of the way to 100 by the end of today, we've got to be at 67. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The notion that some fish are curious is not a new idea. But what does it mean? What kind of behaviors are fish capable of and what are the implications for fishing? For a curious fish person like myself, tropical coral reefs teeming with life provide excellent opportunity to study fish behavior and address questions in ecology and evolution. <laughs> Using scuba diving gear for a limited time, we can follow indiv individual fish and try to understand aspects of their behavior. I spent hours and hours following individual fish, taking notes on their behavior and categorizing it to understand what it is they're doing. Hmm. And when I embarked on my, on my first proper research project 15 years ago, I directed my attention to a phenomenon known as mimicry. What is mimicry and what is fish mimicry? Well, mimicry is something fascinating. It's fish disguised as other fish. Yeah, this is a thing that happens kind of a lot with... Um, mimicry is like... It happens a lot. This is a, a, a sort of thing that's evolved many, many times in the course of the history of life on Earth. And uh, it's common among actinopterygian so fishes, taking too. Taking on the appearance of another species. And these two fish may look alike, but in fact, they're two different species. One <laughs> is a labrid, like our friend the gold cine wrasse from my first ever fish portrait, and the other is a blenny, the latter <laughs> simply disguised as the former. Blennies are pretty vicious, aren't they? And there are they're good predatory fishes. Because while the labrid, the lower fish in this picture, is the good guy. It's a cleaner fish. It cleans <laughs> dead yep. 
tissue and parasites of other fish on the, on the, on the coral reef, and is thus providing a very important service. It plays an important role to the coral reef fish assemblage. The upper fish, the Blenny, is the bad guy. He's a villain. A trickster. Bites pieces of skin and grabs mouthfuls of mucus off the surface of other fish that are attracted to the cleaner fish. And this so-called mimetic relationship is obviously advantageous to the mimic, otherwise this strategy would not have evolved. Yep. But I was curious to know just how strongly the mimic is depending on this relationship. How important is it really for it to fulfill this sort of m this relationship to, a, to a, another fish? So hmm. we designed an experiment in which we oh, remove cool. the cleaner fish away from the mimic. Huh. And the results were surprising, except uh, besides having to work harder to feed itself, the mimic lost it co its coloration. It changed Whoa. color. Whoa, holy cow. Being a, a cleaner fish mimic. So That's this supported nuts. our notion that mimicry in fish can be both flexible and opportunistic, huh. not necessarily hardwired. In fact, the blue striped fang blenny is capable of taking on any suitable appearance. These tiny fish can really? make a choice regarding when a behavior and a, an appearance pays off or not. When is it profitable to be a mimic? When is it not? Similar observations were made by colleagues, and they simply concluded that the blue striped fang blenny is choosing when to be a clear fish mimic. That is wild. So. So basically, they can lose that coloration and then just have a completely different strategy for making a living and getting food. But when those blue striped uh, wrasses are around, the cleaner fish, then they can just mimic them and kind of ride on their coattails and basically scam the other fishes to take bites out of them. That's, that's really wild that like an individual fish can actually change strategies like that and its, its appearance changes. That's wild. So the reasons why I've huh. shown you these... It was a crab after all, <laughs> freelancing. <laughs> I want to take you into a, to the world of fish and, 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 and show you how fish can, be, can display curiosity. They can have curious hmm. behavior. They can be flexible and opportunistic, and they're capable of making choices regarding the most profitable behavior and appearance. Hmm. But, but does that really mean that fish are smart in the common sense of, uh, of the word? Hmm. Are fish capable of truly innovative behavior? Can fish, for example, use a tool? Normally, or one, ex one um, definition of tool use is the artificial extension of the body. And in case of fish, that would mean grabbing an object with its mouth that could potentially be used as a tool. <laughs> Urkan Rana, hello. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. In a self-feeding experiment with Atlantic cod, cod received food when pulling on a string with a rubber mouthpiece. Huh. And the fish in the experiment learned this quickly. Only problem was that while a cod was busy tugging on the string with its mouth and body weight, other fish would see this and they would rush in and get the food before the cod. All the cod in, in this particular experiment that's neat, Holy Lifton, that's neat. equipped with a large, brightly colored, soft plastic bead attached to their backs in order huh. for the movement of the fish to be monitored by video. And sometime into the experiment, a cod accidentally snagged the string and mouthpiece by the tag on its back. And while jerking free, it released the food. Only this time, the food was within reach to the cod. So <laughs> this technique was perfected by this cod to go over to the string, snag it with their, uh, with their tag on their back, release <laughs> the, the, the mechanism, and get the food. Two Very other cool. cod learned the same technique in two independent tanks. <laughs> So clever fishes. We actually have a 
a case here of truly innovative behavior and, and, and cod taking advantage of an artificial extension of the body that normally would never happen in the natural world of fish. So it's like tool use, basically. Kind However, of. However, tool use is not unknown in wild fish either. Huh. Here's the uh, black spot tusk fish on the, on the Great Barrier Reef. And it has a fantastic habit. It, it, it knows about a favorite suitable rock in its, in, in its surroundings. And while eating seashells, it will pick up shells and clams held for, uh, and hold these firmly in their mouths and smash it against their favorite uh, animal rock and thus open the clam and get to the soft parts of the, um, of, of, of the seashell. It's kind of like a sea otter. Um, sea otters will also have like a favorite rock and they'll actually keep it on their, I was going to say on their person, but they'll keep it on their body at all times. They've got like a, uh, like these flaps under their arms and they'll keep the rock in one side or the other and they'll just swim around with it all the time. It'll just be there like a little pocket that they're holding it in. Um, and then they'll use that rock for, uh, I mean, you've seen this before, right? You know about this? Rock pouch. There we go. Take a look at this. See? There's that little pocket right there. And so they'll keep a rock inside of that, and then they hold the rock on their chest as they're floating on their back, and they'll they'll smash mollusks against it to break the shells open. Yeah. And there is an otter stream on Twitch, too. Can we get a shout-out for Marine Mammal Rescue? Yeah. You didn't know they had a pocket? Yeah. Cool, right? Cafecito? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. A little known fact about sea otters is they have a secret place that they can stash things. Chloe here is going to show you. Hey, notice the clam disappears. And it reappears. That is a fold of fur that the otters can use as a pocket so they can store things thus freeing up their paws until they need the item later on, just like now. Yep. Thank you, Chloe, for the demonstration. That's where they'll keep their, uh, their favorite rock. It's pretty neat how that works. Uh, here, let's try this one. Sorry, it's a little loud. Let me turn it down. They also have pockets. These are actually pouches of loose skin found under their arms. Sea otters use their pockets to store food and rocks for opening tasty treats like mussels. Uh, and just like with sawfish, sea otters have also been devastated by overhunting and, uh, and overfishing. Anyway, back to... Uh, Back to fishes. And yeah, they get big, Claire. They get big. So now, in addition, we've seen that fish are flexible. Uh, Your people, yeah, otter do it. There you go. <laughs> they can also learn new skills. At the same time, fish can be incredibly fixed and predictable in their behavior. Hmm. This is a uh, Javasaurus says, I bet you can't see the pockets when having a look at their skeletal build. This is true, Javasaurus. Um, yeah, here. You would have, I think, no indication that they've got that fold of skin that acts as a pocket if you just look at their skeletons. They've got weird skeletons, too. The ribcage is really big compared to their, like, shoulder girdle. But yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's anything about their skeleton that would suggest that. So if we only had their fossils... We wouldn't know that they had that. And that's, uh, that's an important point, Javasaurus. Yeah. Marvin Barry, you know that new sound you're looking for? Well, listen to this. Professor Schlaff, thank you for the raid and welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? It's good to have you here. How was your stream? I hope it was really good. Tell me about it. What did you get up to? And hey there to you, Slayer Darth. Welcome back. It's good to see you. Um, 
and everyone a very, very happy International Sawfish Day to you. We are talking today, celebrating the owner of this incredible organ. This is the rostrum of a sawfish. This is my 3D print of a sawfish rostrum. This is the nose of this incredible cartilaginous fish. There are, depending on who you ask, between five and nine different species of sawfish alive today, all of them are endangered. So we're talking about these incredible creatures, what makes them special, how they behave, what's their biology, what's their fossil history, and the mythology around them, too. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. But uh, we're talking about fish intelligence. We're kind of off on a tangent. So let's finish this little video here, and then we'll get back to some of the sawfish stuff. Shall we? Yeah, and Daily Cavacito says, how does the Amazon wish list work? Oh, you place an order, and it automatically goes to me. Yeah, it's a way I can I can not dox myself. Because <laughs> it, it won't tell you what the address is, but it will get to me. Oh, and by the way, that reminds me. We had a wish list item show up from a generous anonymous donor. Let me get that out real quick. Yeah. So I had put a digging tool that I would use in the field for digging dinosaurs on the wish list. Um, because my my all this summer uh, a scratch all. Um, yeah, I don't all like this basically. Um, and it broke after about ten years almost of faithful service. It broke, so I put another all on the wish list, and this showed up yesterday. A brand new scratch all. I'm going to dig up so many dinosaurs with this chat, you don't even know. Yeah. There we go. I don't know how to... Produce. Okay, just goes like that. Check that out. Very, very nice. This is a heavy-duty one, too. Um, very nice. Thank you, thank you to whoever decided to purchase this off the wish list. I think they wanted to remain anonymous. Either that or Amazon maybe forgot to put the note inside if there was a note, but there was one with a little QR code. Let me write a very quick thank you note to, uh, to this person because I think I have that right over there. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. And, uh, Quistech, thank you for the 100 bits. Appreciate that. Thank you kindly for your support. There we go. Um. And thank you, Professor Schlaff, for the follow. Welcome, welcome. To the channel. It's really good to have you here. Uh, thanks for hitting that follow button. Slash slash a dot c o slash d. There we go. Uh, say thank you. Here we go. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah. 
You have no idea how many dinosaurs I'll be able to dig up with this bad boy. I'm going to type like sideways on this keyboard. Let me straighten it out. And bend. There we go. Good stuff. Uh, Golganek, you sent the all that was you? <laughs> did you try to remain anonymous or did they make a goof at the warehouse? But Golganek, I appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. All of these bad puns. Yeah, there you go, Arlite. There's a bunch of them, aren't they? Uh, oh, it's Kennedy 104. Kennedy. Oh, sorry. That was... Golgadek is reposting. Kennedy, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. This is a solid piece of gear here. Um, I could even use this partly for overburden. Um... Thank you, thank you, Kennedy. I really appreciate it. I guess you never quite know how big it's going to be until you get it. That's one of the downsides from ordering things off of Amazon is you often don't have a good idea of scale, but this is... This is solid. And uh, I'll have to develop some muscle memory around this. Maybe sharpen it a little bit, but it's, it's good stuff. This is... Uh... Oh, I'm excited to try this out. I really am. Yeah... Uh, and that will be an excellent tool to add to the, uh, the box. Next time I show off the uh, the tool bag, you'll see it in there, Kennedy. Yeah, it's bigger than I thought, too, when I put it on the wish list. Yeah, but it's great. It's great. Yeah, it's for stabbing rivals, Patrick Crusader. I... Hopefully it will not need to be used for such. Yeah. Um... Anyway, let's get back to talking about fishes and how smart they can be, and then we'll get back to sawfishes. Beautiful, beautiful uh, fish. It's a dusky parrotfish. The parrotfish uses... Its oh, no, you're good, Kennedy. You're good. Thank you again. Like really appreciate that. ...that have given name to the group to scrape algae and bacteria off dead coral rock. Mm -hmm. Parrotfish, by the way, are responsible for... All of those white sand beaches that are famous in the Caribbean. White sand beaches all over the world, really. That's parrotfish poop. Parrotfish make that sand. They excrete it out. They they poop it out um, because they're uh, they're after the algae. Uh, and they end up eating some of the, the like, aragonite bits of the coral. Um, and then they grind it up. So, uh, in fact... Yeah. Here we go. Take a look at this. Everyone knows Hawaii as a tropical paradise with cranky volcanoes and fabulous white sand beaches. Yep. What most people don't realize is that those beaches are almost entirely composed of fish poop. That's right. You heard me. Fish poop, but not in a bad way. Enter the parrotfish. It's still it's beautiful. A creature with an appetite for the algae that grows on coral. The fish gnaws the stuff off with those beak-like teeth, but in the process also strips calcium carbonate from the reef. And I'm talking a lot of it. A single parrotfish can eat enough calcium carbonate to produce 800 pounds of sand a year. Yep. Over in Australia, another species can lay down a ton of it, like literally a ton of it. But if you can believe it, pooping out beaches isn't even the most intriguing thing about the parrotfish. Hmm. The sleeping bag of snot is. Like a narcoleptic that's accidentally taken sleeping pills, the parrotfish is an unusually heavy sleeper, and that might put it in danger of predation. As a countermeasure, 
It'll tuck itself into the reef and excrete a balloon of mucus. What? This bubble could serve to mask its scent or work as an alarm when a predator bumps against it. Huh. Parrotfish also get busy in a very bizarre way. All of them are actually born female and huh. then join a school. But as they grow, the largest female will transform into a male and adopt a Interesting. Uh, sheephead fish do the same thing. This is actually a pretty common, chasing away rival males pretty common adaptation. Ladies, all of them constantly making sand. See, you see that sand that they're pooping out. You're enjoying a beautiful Hawaiian beach. Raise an umbrella drink to the drowsy parrotfish. That's a lot of rasses. Interesting, Jim. Okay. Back on. <laughs> yeah, it's true, and uh, there's a whole chapter about this. In this wonderful book here, um, Life Sculpted, Tales of the Animals, Plants, and Fungi that Break, Scrape, and that Drill, Break, and drill, break and Scrape to Shape the Earth. This is by paleoethnologist Tony Martin. New book, highly recommend it, and we're actually going to be interviewing him about that, about this book, uh, probably next month. I think he's busy this month because he's probably at GSA. Geological Society of America meeting. He's a busy guy. He also teaches at Emory University in Georgia. But Tony is great. You're really going to like him. And uh, chapter four of this book is entitled, Your Beach is Made of Parrotfish Poop. And it's all about this. Uh... But there they are. Bio-eroding, grazing coral predating and transporting sediment there yeah cool book and uh, I can't wait to talk about it with Tony live on stream um, at some point in the nearish future we'll say near future it'll be like in less than a month I hope yeah it is a really interesting book Neil it's all about the way that creatures kind of shape the environment around them by burrowing, by scraping, by drilling, by biting, by doing all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. And it's coral that's been run through parrotfish, right? Uh, rockophile? I mean, yeah. It's like the rocky part of the coral. It's not the soft-bodied animal part of the coral, but it's the part that they secrete. Um, yeah, you know, the rock part. Um... Yeah. Anyway, we got into talking about this because it's in the TEDx talk that we're looking at. So let's continue. Algae and bacteria of dead coral rock. Last year, with my marine biologist colleague, Rene Abesamis, we tagged 20 dusky parrotfish on Apo Island in the Philippines. Hmm. We wanted to study how parrotfish moved between living coral reef on the western Ooh, side like of the island, a tag in there. That's and the coral hurt. destroyed by typhoons on the but eastern side. But it's important stuff. Apo Island. The science. Parrotfish go to sleep in coral crevices, and we also wanted to know whether parrotfish would prefer living coral for sleeping, and whether they would make excursions to the impacted coral for feeding. Hmm. In this film, we're tagging parrotfish with acoustic tags the size of a pen cap which are placed in the gut cavity of fish where there's some extra space. And the wounds are closed with absorbable sutures and the wound heals rapidly. Hmm. And the fish is released in perfect condition. And so I guess they know that the fish isn't really impacted by this all that much, that it's not killing the fish or anything because they're tracking the fish afterward. That's the whole point is to have a tracker inside of it. So if you were worried about the fish there, like I was for an instant, you know, rest assured that I'm sure, I'm sure they're doing just fine. In contrast to the diver-based short-term observational work that I showed you previously in the talk. <laughs> Patrick Crusader says, the Sahara Desert used to be an ocean, but someone introduced parrotfish to, the, <laughs> to it and the rest is history. True story. Uh, very inventive. Patrick Crusader, very inventive. Acoustic telemetry <laughs> enables long-term observations of individual fish, which is fantastic because 
when you dive, you, you, you can collect a snapshot or, or, or you, can, you can get a short-term <laughs> uh, <laughs> perspective on behavior, but now we can really see uh, what are, the, what are these fish doing? What are they doing every day? What are they doing every night? <laughs> so the tag that's inserted inside the belly of the fish emits ultrasound signals that are picked up by underwater antenna that are mm. hydrophone receivers placed in the study area. Here's data from one of the fish in our study. And this particular dusky parrot fish pretty much behaved exactly according to our prediction. Every morning around 7.30 a.m., <laughs> it will leave its <laughs> nighttime residence on the western side and commute uh. over to the eastern side where it would spend its day feeding. As can be inferred from the red columns of depth data in the graph. Late afternoon, around 5.30 p.m., the fish would return, commute back to the western side, and once tucked into its favorite coral crevice, the signals would be lost until next morning, as can be inferred from the daily gaps in data. Hmm. And this behavior was repeated every day for the two months or, or so that the study went on. This type of recurring <laughs> <Transfer> behavior <laughs> is what we in everyday life would call a habit. Yeah, a but routine. As behavioral scientists, we look for repeatability of behavioral traits, and we can measure how significant things are being repeated. In Atlantic Cod, we have been studying behavior quite a lot, and over the last few years, we've tagged hundreds of Atlantic cod in, on the Norwegian Skagora coast with acoustic tags, and we have gained insight into their lives and fates. Importantly, though, we have found consistent individual differences in behavior. In the graph, I'm showing vertical and horizontal aspects of cod movement behavior hmm. that showed repeatability or consistency between the month of June and the three following months. Such consistencies in individual behavior can be termed personality. And differences in personality, in the case of cod, could be, for instance, a very active, exploratory cod, possibly bold, on one end of the scale, and at the other end of the scale, a shy, timid, passive individual. And we found the same uh, pattern in another of our study species, the European lobster. Mm. Question is, how do such individual differences in behavior play out when we expose fish to harvesting? Mm. This cartoon uses lobsters to illustrate the possibly dire consequences of having a personality characterized by curious exploratory behavior. Passive fishing gears, such as straps, hooks, and nets, depend on the activity of the target species and a certain willingness to take risks, because there's risk involved, clearly, with entering a trap or nibbling on a hook or on the bait of a hook, sampling it with your mouth. Curiosity probably plays a role, a role in this. In fact, curiosity, broadly, broadly taken as a widespread behavioral trait in fish, could be one of the main reasons why fishing actually works. Yeah, makes sense. In my career, we have really widened our horizon and, and widened our knowledge of fish. We've gained knowledge about fish behavior, and we've gained a lot of knowledge about how fish work. And that's changing the way we are thinking about fish, and it's changing the way we keep fish. In today's aquaculture and today's experimental labs, we think about things like environment enrichment, providing stimulating environment to the fish to lower their stress levels and play uh, the part of the biology of the fish. 
Hmm. Next time you meet a fish, perhaps you'll meet it with the same curiosity as possessed by the gold sinew wrasse in my very first fish portrait. Thank you for diving with me. Pretty cool stuff. Let me give you a link to that video. And then he said, the next time you meet a fish, well, I haven't met any fish today, any non-tetrapod fish at least. But uh, yesterday, I did happen to run into a fish. Take a look. This is when I was out for a walk. Uh, way over on the, well, I guess it's still in East Oakland, but on the west side of East Oakland, right by the Alameda Canal. That's Alameda. Right there, across the Tidal Canal. And that, dear viewers, is Myliobatis californica. California bat ray. And I love walking along here sometimes whenever I get the chance to. Because, uh... Yeah, it's like maybe one out of every ten times I will run into one or more of these rays. They are social. Sometimes you'll see them in groups of three or more. Very, very, very cool. This is right there in the middle of this human-dominated environment. This beautiful chondrichthian fish. Now, these fishes are very different from the ones that the guy was talking about in the TED Talk. Because these are chondrichthian fishes. These are cartilaginous fishes. Sharks and skates and rays are, uh... They're a very different group of fishes than the bony fishes that you probably think of every time you hear the word fish. Let's talk about that real quick. Um, Actinopterygia. Ray finned fishes. There we go. There's some of your favorite aquatic creatures. They're very intelligent, personable animals, actually. There's your ray finned fishes, Actinopterygii. And so they're one of the main groups come off of bony vertebrates. So those fishes are actually, in the grand scheme of things, they're more closely related to you and me than they are to chondrichthys, cartilaginous fishes. And this includes sawfish. Let's jump to them. There we go sawfish. You can see they are part of this group. They're related to rays and guitar fish. There we go. Actually, yeah, I guess according to this, guitar fish are a kind of sawfish? Is that right? Huh. Anyway, these are the true sawfish here. Pristidae. Named after the genus Pristus. This is the particular family. This is saying that there are seven species. I've also heard five. I've also heard nine. It depends on who you ask. How many species are around today? And, uh, yeah. It's really like, how distinct are these animals from one another? Um, should they really be different species? Or not? But, uh, yeah... Here, let me show you a quick little video of a diver diving with some sawfish amazing. in Colorado. No, that's not a joke. Take a look. Dive with so many cool things to see. I loved it. After the dive, Wendy takes us over to the top of the shipwreck exhibit, which is much larger. A sandbar shark buzzes right by the swim entry point. <laughs> and that's when she tells us that she got and permission. And Kev Gamer UK, welcome, welcome in, to so Paleontologizing. Good to, good to have you here, Kev. This exhibit has yeah, a sawfish. corridor that allows the staff to enter without disturbing the marine life. 
We sneak around and find a nice spot to settle down and watch the action. <laughs> a sand tiger shark comes over to investigate. Yeah, these guys are really, really common in Aquaria. Because um, apparently, despite looking really scary, they're actually pretty docile. Um, and I think... I don't think they're super hungry. Like, they're not going to eat the other fishes in the aquarium. They're crowd pleasers, but they're sweethearts, even though they look really scary. There we go. The sawfish. Yeah! Right in front of me, a huge sawfish. Holy cow. Beautiful. <laughs> Sawfish are essentially rays. Their mm -hmm. gills reside just like we saw. underneath their head just like a stingray. But they're long and skinny like a shark. So they're actually a lot like a guitarfish. But their distinguishing feature is the long rostrum with teeth arranged yeah. in a saw pattern. Check that out. Pretty extraordinary. The sawfish swings its saw back and forth in the sand to catch fish. It's a super effective hunting technique. A sawfish, a sawfish. There you go, trooper. I haven't heard that joke at all today yet. <laughs> we follow Wendy around the back of the exhibit to the other side. More sawfish there? Or should we? Over here, we have a good. Ah, nice. Place. Hey, Doctor Irrefutable, aren't these amazing? Sawfish, incredible. Over for a look. Sharks are curious too. <laughs> Lots of aquariums have sand tigers because they're the perfect shark. They look okay. mean and toothy, but they're actually very mellow, and they won't eat the other fish in the exhibit as long. What did I just tell you? <laughs> and what's this that I hear? <gasps> what does that sound like? Dinosaur. <laughs> You've got some good hearing there, Kev Gamer. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Is they're kept well fed. Uh, do guitar fish play good music? I don't think so. No. I was gonna make a joke about well, they only do this kind of music, and I was trying to come up with a genre of music that's like archetypically people don't like it. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I can't, sorry. Couldn't come up with one on the spot. Disco? I like disco, Clipper. The zebra shark gets its name because in the juvenile phase, it has stripes. But as the shark gets older, the stripes turn into spots. You like polka? <laughs> The sawfish normally. I, I could have said polka. Bottom, but every once in a while, they like to swim around for a look. Polka can be good though. Look at that sawfish! Holy moly! What an incredible animal! Soon it's time to leave, so Wendy takes us back to the entrance. Very cool stuff. Here's a link to this video if you'd like to watch it on your own. There you go. And now somebody was asking, I think it was Little Pink Pony was asking, uh, how do sawfish, if they, if a fish were to get stuck on their rostrum, on these big denticles, 
on the rest. And if you had a fish skewered on here, how would the sawfish get that off so it could eat it? Well, they actually evolved specifically for that purpose. Take a look at this. A study of Australian sawfish shows its weaponized razor edge snout is a stealth killer. Uh, the dynamics of the sawfish's astounding sword-like weapon make it out as nature's one of d nature's deadliest stealth predators, new research has shown. Rather than use this sword to sift for prey, as some previously thought, it uses it to fatally swipe its dinner with minimal disturbance in the water. Moving the rostrum or snout just a few centimeters above the seafloor creates almost no disturbance at all, said Associate Professor Phil Clausen of Newcastle University. Our results show sawfish are the ultimate stealth hunter, he said. Pretty cool. Uh, the Newcastle University engineers worked with fish experts at Murdoch University. So this is really cool. You've got engineers and fish scientists working together. Um, this is a really cool integrative kind of project. And they worked with Sharks and Rays Australia to better understand how the critically endangered sawfish hunts. The hydrodynamic nature of their rostra, or snouts, make any movement barely detectable in water, said Associate Professor Clausen, lead investigator of the study, which has been published in the Journal of Fish Biology. And thank you, Golganak, for gifting Kev Gamer. I appreciate that, Golganak. I really do. I do. And Amish Ace is looking forward to meeting you at TwitchCon. Amish Ace, I look forward to meeting you, too. Are you... Are you following the... Are you in the Discord? I'm going to make a special channel in the Discord. All about TwitchCon. Um, or actually, Claire, would you mind... Would you mind making a new channel in the Discord about TwitchCon? So that once I get there, Ios and Lordy and I are going to do a meetup. But we don't know where it's going to be yet. So we'll be announcing that when we get there. Um... Yeah, I'm bummed I won't be able to get to make the panel. Uh, well, Amish Ace, if you do see me, see me around, um, I'll give you a button. There they are. I have been uh, working on these buttons. Here we go. If anybody is going to be at TwitchCon... Track me down, and I'll give you one of these buttons. This is the design that I made. And then here is the button itself. Right there. I'm going to have about 100 of these, if not more. And uh, I would be glad to give you one. There you go. Paleontologizing. And that is the Yoshi's Trike Triceratops specimen right there. It's a Triceratops specimen I dug up back in 2011 with Lee Hall and Denver Fowler and um, Museum of the Rockies crew. So yeah, yeah. And it's not eating the TwitchCon icon. If you look closely, the Twitch icon is behind its mouth. But if you want it to be eating it, you could be, you, you know, you can, you're free to believe that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Good stuff. And you got swag? Oh, cool. I'm a chase. Well, I hope to see you around. Yeah. Neat. Very nice. Um, I like to think it's talking, says Murph. That's kind of what I was going for since the Twitch glitch icon is supposed to look kind of like a speech bubble. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and Dramingafite says, I was wondering if you had a good resource suggestion for learning about fossils someone finds. I mean, uh, what kind of fossils and where, Dramingafite? It's, it's like, it's kind of like saying, um, like, is there a good book to identify a fish? It's like, well, or to identify a sea creature? It's like, holy cow, the book would have to be a million pages long to be like a proper field guide for all ocean animals all over the world. In the same way that, like, identifying uh, fossils from all over the world is arguably an even bigger subject. Um, 
Learn more about fluorite replacement coral fossil. Forming a fight. Where is it from? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I know of any books off the top of my head there. But, uh... Upper Michigan. Oh. Well, I bet you you could find a good book on uh, fossils of, of northern Michigan. Yeah. A book or a website. Um, but those are all going to be like Devonian in age. This is long before the age of dinosaurs, and so I'm not going to know m much about that off the top of my head. I'm a dinosaur guy, you know? A Mesozoic paleontologist. But, uh, yeah. Look around. I'm sure you can find something good there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, there might even be a paleontologist who works on inverts at the University of Michigan if you're ever in there, around there. Um, see if they have an open house or something, or feel free to email some of the paleontologists there. I don't know. Yeah. Um. And that's downstate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last one retired a decade ago. Yeah, dreaming a fight. I get that. Upper Michigan is almost Canada. Are you... Oh, are you talking about the UP? Or are you talking about the northern part of the mitten? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, der, hey, the UP. Oh, guy. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Say yeah to the UP, eh? Yeah. Upers, says Claire Burr. Yeah. I've never actually been to the UP myself, but I've spent some time in the northern part of, uh, of the lower peninsula. So, like, Traverse City, Frankfurt, um, kind of that area around there. Uh, Ludington. Yeah. The Upers. Oh, yeah, Der Hogan. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway, TwitchCon, all that. Let's get back into... Right here, talking about sawfish arastra. Uh... Yeah, we were surprised at how fast the motion was. Our modeling clearly shows that with a lateral swipe, by the time the sword reaches the prey, it's already too late, he said. The collaboration for the study emerged after Newcastle University PhD student Sam Evans watched a feature on the TV show River Monsters, featuring associate professor David Morgan from the Mur Murdoch University Center for Fish and Fisheries Research. Uh, Professor Morgan leads Team Sawfish at the university, which works closely with Aboriginal rangers in the Fitzroy River of, of Western Australia to help conserve the fish. We have encountered instances of hunters removing the rostra as a kind of trophy, he said. Ugh, that's awful. Uh, uh, but Barbara Weringer, that's her right there, is director and principal scientist of Sharks and Rays Australia in Cairns. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, she said the study builds on her 2001, 2011 PhD research on the sawfish's feeding behavior. I need to read that if it's been published. Using computational fluid dynamics, we have found the shape of the rostrum reduces noise in the water, increasing the ability of the sawfish to detect minute vibrations caused by prey and lateral swipes of the weapon, Dr. Weringer said. Very cool. Very cool stuff. And here is an image of this fluid dynamics uh, model here. Very, very cool. Uh, huh. And, uh, yeah, the Newcastle University mechanical engineers in this study normally work on the aerodynamics of wind turbine blades. PhD student Mr. Evans said, Our work has been on wind turbines, so I'm incredibly interested in the movement and efficiency of blades. Pretty neat. I wonder if study of sawfish rostra will one day help to engineer more efficient wind turbine blades. That would be pretty incredible. And then it's maybe a beautiful example of how different scientific fields can come together. You have this consilience, as E.O. Wilson would call it. You get different fields that can contribute knowledge to one another and contribute insights that otherwise might not have happened. 
pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Um, and insert random username here. How are you doing? Uh, AI will virtually undig every living creature from the past. What do you think? Pfft. Fat chance. No. Um, I personally don't think very highly of AI. Um, but yeah, people have been talking about that since the, the 80s. And it's literally not gone anywhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good luck. You should check out some of the uh, the YouTube videos from when we were digging this summer. It's not the sort of work that a computer can do. It's not the sort of work that most people can do. Um, yeah. A Kev Gamer says, I'm a computer scientist and I ain't impressed with AI. Yeah, I think a lot of it is kind of a scam, to be honest. But yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. If... If computers aren't anywhere close to mastering something like, well, I don't know, if self-driving cars are still a fantasy, which they largely are, you know, think about something that's a million times more complicated, like, you know, excavating fossils. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I... And especially when you factor in the idea that, like, there is no way that's conceivably possible right now to to do any sort of like imaging under the ground without actually digging the things up you have to physically dig fossils dinosaur fossils out of the ground in order to be able to study them sonic imaging doesn't work ground penetrating radar doesn't work lidar doesn't work none of this stuff works you have to physically dig them out um so yeah yeah, there you go. Thank you, Claire Burr, for bringing up that command there. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. And, uh, Phone BT, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. And the ground penetrating radar was shown on Jurassic Park? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work. Believe me, um, if that sort of technology were anywhere fees like yeah the closest thing that we have to anything like that is in certain geological formations the the fossils will be like kind of mildly radioactive very very mildly but still to a detectable amount and so you might be able to kind of vaguely detect where they are under the ground if they're immediately below the surface, like an inch down or something like that. Um, but it'll just be like, it's like using a metal detector, like beep, 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 you know? It's essentially a Geiger counter, you know? Beep, 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 beep. It's not like showing you what it looks like under the ground or anything like that. So, yeah. Anyway. Um... Yeah, Jim says, Jurassic Park really did a number by planting that idea in people's minds. I know, right? Yeah. Anyway. And, uh... Insert random name here says, everyone is so pensive. Yes. I mean, this is a channel about... thinking. Did you maybe mean a different word? Yeah. Pensive. I think it's perfect, actually. Engaged in, involving, or reflecting deep or serious thought. A pensive mood. Yeah. Pensive. Pensive. Yeah. Maybe you meant... Maybe you meant pessimistic? Anyway. Freudian, Freudian slip, perhaps. <laughs> um... But yeah, anyway, I um, am neither excited about nor uh, have really any faith at all in AI. Um, it's, it's essentially just a bag of tricks from what I understand. So like artificial intelligence in the way that most people think of it, where it like... It's at all, like, 
you know, organic human thought, that's a myth. Um, anyway. I realize it's, like, dangerous to say that kind of thing on a platform like Twitch, where people are really excited about technology and really want to believe all kinds of hype about, you know, this and that, self-driving cars and Hyperloop and other nonsense like that. These things are scams. Anyway. Um, yeah. But, but, AI hype, OMG, this is admin. Uh, that's what I hear from the constant vendors that I work with. Yeah, the, see, sysadmin, you're in this industry. You you know this. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone in this, you know? I'm not a computer guy. Apart from streaming on Twitch five days a week, I, you know, I'm not a computer scientist. I don't write code anymore. Um, yeah. So anyway, it's bad, sysadmin, yeah. Um, and, oh, and don't get me started on AI art, Dan the BC man. Yeah, oh boy. And Jim says, yeah, and that tech people are skeptical. It's the non-tech people that get overhyped. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, Erkin Rana, yes, I also get very excited about 3D printing. I'm 3D printing a sawfish right now in three parts. Um... And man, it looks like it'll be done in maybe about an hour. Very exciting. But I do a tremendous amount of 3D printing. Holy cow, all of these are 3D printed. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but AI to the level they're talking about? Nah, says Daily Camasito. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and Kev Gamer, The Ancestor's Tale is a great book. Uh, I like that one a lot. It's a neat way to think about the history of life on Earth and common ancestry. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, and Mayor of Space, I like that from a screen screenwriting perspective. I almost said screen printing, completely different. And phone BT, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thanks for dropping in. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, but Mayor Space says the narrative purpose of the ground penetrating radar thing in the beginning of Jurassic Park was to put Alan Grant at odds with technology to make him seem like an old fuddy duddy so he can then prove himself against the cloning technology later on. I mean, yeah, it is there to kind of help establish his character. And it was just like a, you know, a gee whiz, neato, uh, gizmo. Um, but yeah, and it's meant also to, as like a, a foreshadowing thing to, to talk about the velociraptors, which are actually Deinonychus. That's a story for another time. Um, anyway, let's get back to sawfish here. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and felt bad for him for being portrayed like that. Yeah, says Admin. I mean, he was a realist, I think. Um. Yeah. Sawfish of the day, about six feet long. Check this out. We watched this the other day, but. To be down here on the less toothy end, and I'll hold him, and maybe you can try to. <laughs> but this does have some footage of how they actually use that rostrum in order to subdue their prey. Check it out. Try to get him out. You're not I'm scared, just... are you, Bray? Well, I'm not scared, but I'm not stupid either. <laughs> yeah, what we'll do is uh, I'll get my gloves on, and we'll just uh, we'll walk this net right off this rostrum. This is incredible, man. This is a big fish. What? This is probably two meters. This is a maybe a six foot sawfish. Can you imagine? One of these that's 18 or 20 feet long and maybe weighs over a thousand pounds. Oh, oh hey, he's moving! I mean, shoot, it would have a rostrum like this if it were that big. Yeah, yeah. He's moving! Come on, how long does it take to get some gloves? Those are some serious teeth. So that's about the size teeth you'd find on about a six foot croc. No wonder Greg's putting on reinforced gloves. The teeth are really sharp, so it, it really helps us uh, handle the animals safely. 
they play possum, you know, they'll, they're, they're they are going to cut the net there, Javasaurus. Yeah. All of a sudden, yeah. they'll just kind of go side to side. So you really need to pay attention. Crocs do the same thing. They will lull you into a false sense of security. You think, oh, this animal's scared. I'm going to kind of loosen my grip a little bit. And just as soon as you do, bam. After years of working with crocs, Brady knows their danger zone. A croc can strike in a surprisingly wide arc. Its head That's a gharial there. Very nice. Degrees, and it often uses this maneuver to ambush prey. Brady doesn't realize it, but he's about to step into the sawfish. Highway to the danger zone. There you go, Mayor Space, yeah. I've been bitten by some big pythons before, and they don't have teeth anything like this. I think this thing would just tear you up. Okay, now we're gonna go up and over. One, two, three. Let go. Oof. All right, there is gonna be a little bit of blood here, so if anybody's squeamish, you know, look away for the next minute or so, and I'll tell you when it's safe. Get you? He's not happy. He got me. Mm. You all right? Just that quick. Mm. Yeah. Brady's lucky. It's just a scratch. Didn't take long. Mm -mm. I mean, I think I just took one tooth. You need to be careful when we're gathering data on this guy. <laughs> anyway, I think that's over. How the sawfish uses its saw as a deadly weapon. It swings that toothy rostrum sideways like a croc. Yep. In this case, it was a defensive swipe. But research suggests it also uses it to kill prey. Do they use hmm. it to slash through schools of fish and, and maim prey? Is that? Yeah, I've, I've seen them do that uh, myself. And I've talked to a lot of guides that have seen them chasing, you know, bait fish. Not quite deadly. deadly. There you go, Mayor Space, yeah. Many fish species use parts of their bodies to herd or slash prey. A thresher shark uses its sharp tail to stir up the water. And again, that's not a thresher shark. Um, we talked last time we looked at this video. Uh, thresher sharks have got a much, much longer tail than that. My message up front. Try not to go extinct. Uh, Royal Mercs, thank you for the follow. Exactly. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Uh, good to have you here. Look how much longer the the tail is on an actual thresher shark. Uh, whoever was editing this video together, uh, they goofed there because this is not a thresher shark. A thresher shark uses its sharp. That's tail. like that's like a, a black tip reef shark or oceanic black tip or something. To stir up the water, trapping yeah. fish in a giant whirlpool. A and not Shark Week, just International Sawfish Day. Hi, this is Amy. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Sailfish yeah. uses it. And articulate reptile. Well, well, well. <laughs> Articulate Reptile, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. How are you doing, Articulate Reptile? I hope you had a wonderful stream. What were you working on today? What kind of critter were you discussing today? A very happy International Sawfish Day to you. We are discussing this remarkable creature. Sawfish. It's actually a whole family of, uh, uh, yeah, of critters. Let's see. And uh, came here from Chris Chat. Well, it's good to have you here, Royal Mercs. It's good to have you here. And this is 3D printed. Jonas, I would not want to have a real sawfish rostrum in my office because, well, it would have to have come from a real sawfish, and these are endangered. Every single one of the living sawfish species, there's between five and nine of them, depending on who you ask, every single one of them is endangered. But uh, as I'll show you later, if you, uh, if you happen to ever encounter a sawfish rostrum, you can notify scientists about it for some important research. Um... I'll give you a resource on that in a little bit. But yeah, we are talking about these remarkable creatures today. Articulate reptile. It's good to have you here. Yeah. 
Um, looks like you're going to play guitar. Yeah, we're also printing a full sawfish body here. Not nearly life-size. This is going to be like this long. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Excited to have this done. Yeah. But anyway, let's get back to our video here. And uh, can we see a baby sawfish? I will show you a baby sawfish in a little bit. Yes. We've got a video with that, too. It's spear-shaped upper jaw to pull it through schools of fish. So that's a swordfish. There we go. Reveal that a sawfish uses its saw in a particular hunting technique. Pretty cool. Watch, watch. It moves in sudden bursts, swiping its saw to Oof. the main prey before returning to swallow it whole. Did you see that? Check this out. Check this out. Watch how they use the rostrum here. This is wild. Swiping its saw to stop <clears throat> before returning. Just hits puree. It doesn't have the sailfish's blinding speed, but it uses its rostrum with great accuracy. It'll Pretty cool. Fewer individual fish on its teeth. Scrape the fish off and suck it into its mouth. Pretty neat. I got it. Pretty neat, right? Now that Greg's tagged the fish, it's good to go. Let's go. And, uh, hi, this is Amy says, the things on the side, are they bones or teeth? They're kind of neither, but kind of both. So those are what we call denticles, and I'll show you another video that helps explain this. But the, um, the skin of sharks and rays and skates and sawfish... They've got these things called dermal denticles. Um, this is like what their skin looks like under a microscope. So these are made of the same material as their teeth. They're made out of dentin. Um, maybe I can find you a quick video about that. Shark dermal denticles. Um... Here we go. From Sharks for Kids. Sharksforkids.com. Sounds like a fair trade. Maybe kids for shark. I don't know. Yeah, that's not quite as informative as I was hoping. But, um. Yeah. Here, take a look at this, maybe. Drick bees, the cartilage fish, including sharks, rays, and skates, have six and sawfish, which are a kind of ray, yes. Main characteristics. One characteristic is that they all have dermal denticles. Yep. Dermal denticles, or skin teeth, are tooth like scales covering the fish's body. <laughs> they point towards the tail and have a hard oh, outer that's layer cool. of enamel, just like human teeth. The V shaped a neat little denticles create handheld model there. no friction reducing drag and creating a whirlpool similar to the one of this kayak, allowing the fish to move quickly and quietly in the water while expending less energy. Very because cool. Because of their drag-reducing properties, professional swimmers design swimsuits to mimic dermal denticles, but are <laughs> unable to wear them during competition because of the unfair advantage. Yep. Along with this, dermal denticles <laughs> act as a suit of armor to protect against predators. Uh... So, when you come to see me and visit our shark lab, make sure to feel for those dermal denticles on all of our chondric fees. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. I'll give you a link to that video right there. But, so those are denticles that are all over the skin. These are just super-sized dermal denticles, from what I understand. Uh, they're just those, but super-sized. They're turned all the way up to 11. There you go. Yeah. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. And <laughs> I do not pet the shark the wrong way. It is very ow. There you go, Golgonek. Yes. Um, yeah, for certain. Anyway, let's finish this video up here. Oh, here, let's go back a little bit. Check this out. Pretty cool. 
doesn't have the pretty cool blinding speed but it uses its rostrum with great accuracy it'll even skewer individual fish on its teeth scrape the fish off and suck it into its mouth and they remain sharp I mean yeah yeah you ready? Yep. now that Greg's tagged the fish it's good to go let's go and back in the water whoa yep. on three one two Three. Oh yeah, <laughs> man! I'm into that. I got sawfish <laughs> fever. It was just great. <laughs> and that rostrum, man, that has got to be one of the most bizarre appendages in the animal kingdom. It's really not, though. It's really not, and we'll we'll talk about why. Um, first, let's find a. Uh, a video of a baby. Well. Let's see. Mm. Yeah, let's find a baby sawfish right here. Sawfish pup. With Jeremy Wade here. <laughs> Another fisherman up early before the heat of the day has accidentally hooked a sawfish. Yeah. This footer is a mere pup. But an extra pair of hands still doesn't go amiss. And I've not seen the one in Toronto's aquarium. That sounds really cool. I mean, yeah. No, Neat. Barramundi. Oh, <laughs> right. I've got everything but. Right. It's the first one of these I've seen. Okay. I'm out of range oh, now. It's only, a, it's only a small one. This baby sawfish is the monster in miniature. And my first <laughs> chance to get a safe look at this bizarre animal. What a cool yeah. creature. Right. That's the first one of these I've seen. Well, imagine, imagine one of these things 20 foot long, which is what they grow to when they get into the sea. But yeah, yeah so isn't like it cute, Charlie's dragon? Yeah, yeah. Look at the back end of it, come forward. That's just like a ray's mouth, a stingray. Yep, because they're related to, to stingray and guitarfish. And even on a small one like this, just look, you know, that's quite a fearsome weapon. Um, and actually, although this is a small one, very good thing to see because for fish like this to exist, when this is probably about a year old. They have to be breeding size adults around. Fantastic. I wish I caught <laughs> it myself. I'm here to catch a monster, but for now, I just want to return the pup unharmed. Mayor of Space asks, do they come out of the egg with the big ol' rostrum? So sawfish are actually viviparous, which means that they give birth to live young. And so you might be wondering, like, if they're emerging, you know, not from an egg, but from the mother, like, how does that work? And, um, well, shoot, you might have some idea about that. The, uh, that rostrum is pretty sharp, and, uh, they actually, it's kind of gross, but they actually literally cut their way out of the mother um, and it's really grisly, and I'm totally kidding. That's not how it happens. <laughs> um, not at all. These fishes have been around for a long time, and they've got this technique down. There's actually, like, a soft tissue, like, structure that surrounds the, the denticles on the rostrum, uh, as the baby sawfish are emerging from the mother. So she is unharmed during that whole process. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Alien fish story. There you go, HD. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's another documentary that we'll see where they kind of explain this a little bit. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Pretty neat. Also, the rostrum is pretty flexible when uh, when they're just a little baby. The teeth are still very sharp, but they're, they've got kind of a sheath over them. They have given 56 gifts. You'll see later. And Reagan Nation, thank you for gifting Joannis. I appreciate that. Regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sort of like little fleshy pads on horse poofs when they're born. Sort of like that, Truckhorn, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Now I just want to return the pump unharmed. Just moving the tail to get the circulation going a bit. Cool stuff. Uh, 
then, uh... Let's take a look at this right here. Do we have anybody here in chat? From the... The northern U.S. state of Maine? Because here's a news report from that state. About something that happened in Florida. <laughs> it's funny, like... People joke that nothing ever happens up in Maine, and, well, I guess this isn't really... If you have on Maine news something that happened to a guy who lives in Maine while he was down in Florida, then maybe it kind of speaks to that. But, cool stuff. Check it out. A fishing trip off the coast of Florida brought in quite a catch for a man from Hamden. And the moment was caught on video, so we know this is not just another fish tale. And Neutral Gnome and Reagan Nation, you're both from Maine? Holy cow. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, this this just in on Maine News. Something happened. <laughs> and Florida. As Alex Haskell caught up with that lucky fisherman. Michael Chorgi and his father were fishing in the waters off southwest Florida. That's when he reeled in an estimated 800-pound prehistoric endangered sawfish. Look at his body. Yeah. Holy it's cow. Like any other fish that you've seen. Michael yeah. Chorgi and his wife yeah, still can't get enough of the video. There he is. <laughs> Holy he's going to cut your ankle off. I'm still amazed. Every time I look at it, I can't believe I caught it. Chorgi uh, had a plan to go fishing with his father. The day started off really bad. They were getting ready to pack up and head to shore. And then uh, I heard one of the lines hit. <laughs> And it hit hard and fast. I knew it wasn't going to be a little shark. And after hmm. 45 minutes, there he is. See him? Yeah. A glimpse. When I saw the saw, I knew I had a fish of the lifetime on. He had caught an <laughs> estimated 13 foot long sawfish. It's a wow. pretty big deal. So I was very excited for him. Alexandria is Michael's wife. My first reaction was, what a terrible day to miss fishing. And the fishing expedition got even better. Get a picture, quick. Before I even had time to really recover or take a breath from that, I heard the second line on the boat hit, and then it was another 45-minute fight, and then another <laughs> sawfish at the boat. Michael and his father took pictures. Unless it was the same one. Reflected on how rare it is to see this species up close. It they did put it back. Yes, Risa Dego. Catch one sawfish in my life, let alone two back to back. Now, both sawfish... They're hanging out in pairs. The weight of the first one was so great, it actually snapped Georgie's pole in half. Wow. He also wants everyone to remember that when you catch a rare fish like a sawfish, the priority is to make sure the fish is released back in the water. There you Alex go. Haskell, New Center. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. And cut the line as close as you can to the animal's mouth um, so that it can go. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. Now, we've got a really nice little documentary. I'm thrilled that I found this the other day. A PBS documentary called Saving Sawfish. This goes into their biology, their conservation, all kinds of stuff. I think you're going to like it a lot. There it is. And the bigger they get, the saw gets shorter, says Trooper. No, the saw gets longer, too. But it gets thicker. So... Um... Yeah. So here's a fairly little sawfish. Rostrum's kind of narrow. Another one. Rostrum is kind of narrow. Take a look at this rostrum right here. That is crazy wide. This is, I think, from a large tooth sawfish, which do tend to have a wider rostrum. But uh, as I understand it, the bigger the animal gets and the longer the rostrum gets, the more it thickens up, too. It needs to be wider from side to side so that it, it's stronger in the water and it's, there's less risk of snapping. So, like, the longer it gets, the wider it has to get, too. Pretty cool, right? Like, that is, this is pretty enormous. That's pretty enormous. Yeah. Let's get into this lovely documentary right here. In the murky waters of South Florida lives 
a strange looking fish. Any Floridians in chat? If you took a shark and a stingray and kind of melded the two of them together and put a saw on their head, that's a sawfish. They swim <laughs> like a shark, but they have a hedge trimmer for a nose. <laughs> this saw-like appendage is called a rostrum. Yep. And you look at this really strange rostrum with these teeth on the side, and it's just otherworldly. And you think, wow, that, that must be an ancient fish. That's just so weird. Oh, big sawfish, big sawfish. This and is they are kind of ancient, but not as ancient as you might imagine. Okay, oh, don't wrap, don't wrap. We'll talk about that too. Sawfish are just really cool group of fishes, really strange fishes. They're a small group of batoids, so they're related to stingrays and skates. And, and guitar fish. Really yeah. big animals too, 20 feet or so in length. They're incredible creatures. Look at that. They're probably huh. on the same level of an ecosystem as a shark. They do. Amelia Bedili says, I hope they let them go. That's exactly what they're doing. These are researchers catching these for science, catching them and releasing them. They take data on them, they put a tracker tag on them, and they let them go. The whole point is to help this species recover because they are endangered. Oh boy, they're endangered. On some of the same prey items. Yeah. Another top level predator. And they don't grow back, Golganek, if those tentacles uh, break off on the, the rostrum. Animals drastic decline. Yeah. The yeah. small tooth sawfish was the first native marine fish listed on the U.S. endangered species list. I did not know that. The first native marine fish listed on the U.S. endangered species list was the saw small tooth sawfish. Let's let's look them up on our tree of life here. There we go. Pristis pectinata. There we go. Yeah, they are critically endangered. Ooh, boy. You'll see there's a lot of red over here because all of these sawfish species are endangered, including this one. Or are they wide-snouted sawfish? Yeah, they're critically endangered too. I don't know why that doesn't show up here, but they are. Yeah. Large tooth sawfish, also critically endangered. All of these critically endangered. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. But there are things that we can do to help save these fishes. Um, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit. The only place they're left in the United States is Southwest Florida. They're just so cool. I mean, how sad would it be to lose something that yeah. is just that cool? Scientists are studying the animals to help them survive into the future. Come here, little one. This is an animal we really knew very, very little about. And we're starting from square one. Can sawfish populations recover? Can these prehistoric looking animals survive in a- And by the way, I love this documentary. <laughs> I love how the narrator, it's written into the script, apparently. Can these prehistoric looking animals, normally in a documentary, it'd just be like, oh, can these prehistorical animals survive? Could these living dinosaurs survive? Oh, well, they're being precise with their language here. And keeping everything, keeping everything correct. I love it. I love it. Oh, man. Yes. And, uh, Hylocomium, thank you for the follow. That's a great name. It almost sounds like a, like a genus name of an animal or something. Welcome, Hylocomium, to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here and, uh, a very happy International Sawfish Day to you. Thanks for the follow. Cover. Can these prehistoric looking animals- And it's a genus of moss. Oh, very cool. Well, one of my fellow, uh, <laughs> my fellow biologically inclined people here, Hylocomium, you are in the right place. Welcome, welcome to paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Uh, survive in a highly developed environment. The 
theme song. Good stuff. This is actually really neat the way that they did this. I like I like that. Neat little intro. Changing seas. Major funding for this program was provided. Major funding for this program comes from uh, viewers and supporters of paleontologizing. So thank you. And scuba diving. Uh. Historically, sawfishes were a common tropical species worldwide. There are five species globally. Around the turn of the century, 1920s, 1930s, almost all the species of sawfish globally began to decline. Today, all the species of sawfish are listed as either endangered or critically endangered by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, We're in danger of losing an entire family of, of large, tropical, shallow water predators that are one of the major components of the tropical ecosystems where they live. When he says an entire family, I mean, this is what he's referring to. Like sawfish, every single species within Pristidae is either endangered or critically endangered. Every single one of these, large tooth sawfish, common sawfish, long comb sawfish, small tooth sawfish, Queensland sawfish, wide snouted sawfish, and karate hangar, also known as the pointed sawfish or knife tooth sawfish. Every single one of these is at risk of extinction. So they absolutely need to be better studied and really aggressively protected. Sawfish are different from saw sharks. Yeah, very different. Use them sometimes. <laughs> the saw sharks, there's nine known species, and they're smaller than the sawfish, and they tend yep. to be relatively deep water animals. The small tooth sawfish is the only. Hang on. Uh, we've got a little video about the difference between sawfish and saw sharks here. But first, let me show you. Here is sawfish, and then let's get into saw sharks, which are sharks, as the name would imply. And they are way over there on the family tree within, uh, within sharks. There you go, saw sharks. And it's funny, because the, the scientific name, uh, Pristioforidae, they're named after the sawfishes, which are genus Pristis and relatives. So yeah, don't get them twisted. Saw sharks and saw fish. Saw sharks are doing a lot better than uh, than saw fish are, which I, is good news for the saw sharks. But yeah, they've got kind of an, a different pattern of uh, of denticles on their rostrum. They've got gills on the side, like a shark, and they often have these like feeler things on the side of their rostrum too. Those are soft tissue, as I understand it. But I've got a video about the difference between the two. Comparison between sawfish and saw sharks. Take a look. Oh wait, no, never mind. It's not a video. Um, saw shark. Not to be confused with sawfish. Saw sharks and sawfish are both cartilaginous fish, so they're both, you know, they've got cartilage skeletons. Uh, they are the only two fish that have a long blade-like snout. Mr. Mobile, what a beautiful graph. Thank you. You know we're all about data here on paleontologizing. So thank you, Mr. Mobile, for the follow. Uh, and the sawfish is not a shark, Joannis. They are not. Saw sharks are sharks. But a sawfish... A sawfish is neither a saw nor is it a shark. It's a sawfish. Sawfish are related to to uh, to rays, to stingrays. So let's go back to sawfish here. There we go. There we go. There's your sawfish. See how they're all endangered, unfortunately. All that red. But uh, yeah, they are related to rays and guitarfish. Stingrays, etc. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it is interesting that 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 feature, that rostrum with the denticles coming off the sides, this has evolved multiple times. There's multiple different groups that have this. It's evolved at least three times in the history of life on Earth, if not more. Yeah. And swordfish are not related in any way. No, they're super far away, Patrick Crusader. Swordfish are, you know, are, uh, they're bony fishes. So... Swordfish and billfish, they are way far away. Swordfish and billfish, you could make an argument that they're actually closer related to us than they are to a, a saw, sawfish. Yeah. There you go. Billfishes and swordfish, like your marlin and sailfish and swordfish. Um, but yeah, they're related to things like trevallis, pilotfish, and sunfish. This kind of sunfish, not like a mola sunfish. And darts, too. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this tree is based on genetics. Uh, Hylocomium. As far as I know. I think... It, except when um, when morphology is the only way to go because we don't have genetic information. This is mostly going to be... Um, like a molecular tree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Only current species of sawfish in the United States. Here we go. Sawfish, and they tend to be relatively deep water. Here we go. So, saw sharks versus sawfish. Sawfish are different from saw sharks. And uh, Hylocomium says, do we use morphology for relatedness at all anymore? It's rare among living animals because you can just look at their DNA. But, of course, in my discipline, morphology is all we've got since we do not have any any genes from dinosaurs. We don't have any molecular data from dinosaurs. Um, at least no genetic material, you know? Um, yeah, we have to use morphology. It's the same for most... For 99.999% of fossil organisms, it's all morphology. Yeah. And, um, our acupensarids related to sawfish, they look a bit similar, Trooper. Uh, that, that's sturgeon, right? Or... or Acupensarids? Acupensarids? They're not close. No, not at all. Well, they're not very close at all. Here. Um, sawfish. Let's go back to sawfish over here. Away from our bony fishes. There we go. There's our sawfish there. And, um... Yeah, I was right. They are sturgeons. Yeah. Acipensards. So, those are closer... I'll put it this way. Sturgeon are closer to sawfish than either of them are to, like, swordfish or anything like that. These are, are bony fishes, um, but they're a very early branching group of bony fishes. Sturgeons and paddlefish are, you know, you might use the term primitive to describe them. They're very early branching. Um, so yeah, so as far as bony fish go, these guys are close, like they're closer to sharks and stingrays and sawfish than, like, other bony fishes are. Like trout or clownfish or halibut or swordfish or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Sawfish are different from saw sharks. Yep. People can different groups. Sometimes. The saw sharks, there's nine. That's a saw shark. Species, and they've got those barbells, too. Than sawfish, and they tend to be relatively deep water animals. The small toothed sawfish 
is the only current species of sawfish in the United States. Uh, we used to have more, but then they, they were wiped out. From large tooth sawfish, which is primarily a Central American species. Small tooth sawfish once ranged from as far north as New York to the Texas Mexico border. Uh, Imagine being able to go out and see sawfish anywhere along the coastline here. That's probably like a significant chunk of chat right now. Probably lives somewhere near, uh, you know, this, this beautiful yellow splotch right there where uh, we used to be able to find sawfish. Nowadays, well... The center of the distribution of small tooth sawfish has always been Florida in the United States. A lot yep. of those far-reaching records were probably stray animals. By the 1980s, the population had contracted to South Florida only. Yep. Fishing played a large role in their population reductions because uh. of their long tooth rostrum. They're very susceptible to any type of fishing gear, in particular nets, gill nets. Farther inch. There you go, Kennedy, yeah. Historically, gill net mortality was probably very high before the gill net ban in Florida. In a shrimp trawl, if they get caught in that, and it's a trawl net that's been dragged for hours and hours, they're probably not going to survive. So that's probably the Ugh. largest single source of direct mortality on them in Florida. Now, if you're the sort of person who eats seafood, you might be feeling a little bit guilty about this right now, and maybe that's not unjustified. But I'll be talking... Toward, well, let me just share a quick resource with you before we get into it later, in case people have to leave. Um, well, well, well. Octavius King. Welcome, welcome, Octavius King. Back to paleontologizing. How are you doing? It is great to have you here, Octavius. Hope all is well. How did your stream go? How are all the little mammals doing? I hope you and they had a wonderful, wonderful stream. It's good to have you here. And a very happy International Sawfish Day to you, Octavius. A happy International Sawfish Day to us all. We are talking about these incredible creatures. This is the rostrum of a sawfish right here. This is my 3D print of a huge sawfish rostrum. I wanted to have a really big one to put up on my wall. And uh, there you go. Yeah, pretty neat, right? This is one of those like classic curiosity cabinet items. It's a real crowd pleaser, but uh, mine is 3D printed. So no sawfish were harmed in the making of this model here. Yeah. Um. Anyway, Rylesy, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Move cubes. Thank you for the ratty raid. How you doing, everybody? It's great to have you here. Um, tell me how the stream went. I want to hear all about it. Uh, no sawfish that we know. No sawfish that I know of. And I was closely, not just closely monitoring the production of this. I, I did it. Walks like a pot-bellied bear. Deepest blue dragon. Sixteen months. Huda Tunket. Thank you, thank you for those sixteen months of support. I really appreciate that, deepest blue dragon. Thank you for keeping me online for the past sixteen months. Holy cow. Yeah. Anyway, if any of you are not yet following Octavius King, if you like me, love animals, if you're particularly fond of rats and rabbits. Go check out Octavius King. Uh, there's always some rat mischief going on over there. Uh, Octi streams with uh, a whole bunch of different rats, and they're always getting all kinds of trouble. And we were talking this, you know, earlier in the stream about how different animals, including different fishes, have different personalities. That's very apparent when you watch Octi stream. Those different rats. So yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway. Rats are cute and smart. They are, Trooper. I agree. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, go follow, Indrak. Yes, indeed. Thank you again, Octi, for the, uh, the raid. Um, we are talking about sawfish right now.
let's get back into it, shall we? Yeah. They're such a weird looking fish that you know, a lot of times people would keep them and take pictures and show their friends. Habitat loss also played a role in the yeah. decline of the population. Juvenile sawfish are very dependent on mangroves. And uh, Zega Stardust says, I'm doing a PhD in animal law right now. Love learning about new species that need some extra protecting. Very cool, Zega Stardust. We watched a little video earlier about uh, some arrests that were made in Florida. There we go. Let me show this again. Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission says the case is still pending. And yep. Here we go. And few of us have ever seen it in the wild. Well, the small tooth sawfish has been a protected species in our state for more than 30 years now. And only Local 10's Janine Stanwood has body camera footage showing the arrest of two South Florida men who allegedly caught one and are now facing serious charges. Yeah, these guys were up to no good. Here's a link. Hey. They saw some activity out here that that uh, was a little suspicious to them. They saw some. Anyway, yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Back to our saving sawfish documentary here. We've destroyed a lot of our mangrove coastline, uh, so a lot of the habitat that was available for them 30, 40 years ago is not there anymore. Once people realized the animals were in trouble, protections were put in place to save the sawfish. Sawfish have been protected uh -oh. in Florida water since 1992. Then in 2003, the small tooth sawfish was also listed. That's not good. My mic thing just, uh... hmm, I'm going to have to rig this up. This will not st do I need a new one of these now? Shoot. Um, something came loose in here. I don't know what that was. So I might have to rig this up with some mechanics wire real quick and fix it so that I can hold my mic in place because that's kind of important when I'm doing a live stream to have the mic properly in place. Oh, boy. Um, give me just a minute here on the federal endangered species list. There's a recovery plan that is in place, and so we're trying to conduct research that will allow us to track recovery of the population. Prior to them being listed on the endangered species list, uh, we really, as scientists, knew very little about the species. So we initially contacted anyone who would have information, whether it be a recreational fisherman, or we talked to people at bait shops, we talked to commercial fishermen, and we just started to keep track of those encounters. And once we started plotting those on the map, it led us to some of these areas where we want to do some scientific research. to push me off there, Joe. Dean Grubbs and his team from the Florida State University Coastal and Marine Laboratory study adult sawfish in the Florida Keys. The questions we're asking are, where are the primary areas and times of year where sawfish interact with different fishing interests, whether it be recreational charter fishermen, commercial longline fishermen, or commercial trawl fishermen? Obviously, recreational guys catching them and releasing them are far less of a concern than, you know, shrimp trawls where a lot of them die. There's a, a quota on the number of sawfish that are allowed to be caught within the commercial fishery before it has to be shut down. And so if we could highlight areas where there's the highest likelihood that a shrimp trawl might encounter a sawfish and then just say, okay, don't fish those areas during these months, then that's going to benefit everybody because that'll mean that the shrimp fishery can keep fishing as long as they, you know, they're fishing sustainably and the sawfish will be allowed to recover. We were searching in two primary areas. That'll work for now. We would prefer to spend most of our time on the edge of the continental shelf where it's about 45 to 55 meters deep, because that's where they get captured in commercial longline fisheries and commercial shrimp trawl fisheries. 
So that's off on the Atlantic side of the Florida Keys, all the way from off Key Largo, all the way down to the Marquesas south of Key West. We also sample in Florida Bay because that's an area where we know there are a lot of sawfish and that's where the recreational fishermen and the charter captains encounter a lot of sawfish too. It's quite shallow and muddy and murky and it's completely different habitat. Today winds are too rough to fish on the Atlantic side, so the team decides to work in Florida Bay. And holy cow, Jayco! Thank you for the Ko-Fi donation right there. Holy moly, what is this? The moon does exist. Uh, and Goldaline, thank you for the follow. Goldaline, thank you, thank you. Um, microphone stand funds, Jayco. Thank you so much. Holy cow, do I appreciate that. By the way, Jayco, you will be very pleased to know, I think, that uh, my old keyboard with the tape on the back and everything else and mouse with the scroll wheel that was all funky, I've been able to replace this thanks to your generosity. Here's the box. I actually just switched this out on stream earlier. I don't know if anybody noticed, but... uh. Yeah, I can keep the old one as a backup, and I can use it for any replacement parts that I might need for this new one. But check it out. The scroll wheel is so much better now. Holy cow. Check that out. No more herky-jerkiness making everybody motion sick. Yeah, very, very nice. So, Jayco, thank you, thank you. And, uh, and I'll be able to fix this now, too. I really appreciate that, Jayco. Thank you so much. Holy cow. Do I appreciate that, Jayco. Thank you very, very much for your support. That means a lot to me. It really does. Um, excellent. Excellent. Uh, anyway, welcome back, Jayco. It's really good to have you here. How are things? And happy International Sawfish Day to you. I don't know how long you've been watching, but we're talking all about these incredible animals. This is a 3D printed rostrum of a sawfish right here. These are remarkable animals that deserve our respect and our adm admiration and our protection because... Every single one of the extant species, every single species of these critters that are still around are either endangered or critically endangered. They are... They're not doing well because of human persecution. So we're watching a, a documentary on what can be done to, to help save them. And the rostrum mean knows basically, yeah, Pendrake, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I really appreciate you, Jayco. Thank you, thank you. That direct material support is, uh, it goes a long way, and I appreciate you for it. Thank you. Continue. We're primarily using kind of a modified scientific long line. We basically set 50 hooks out on a long line anchored on each end. Each hook is on its own branch line that's about nine feet long. There you go, Kennedy. Yeah. It's baited with ladyfish. We set for exactly one. Pendrick says, do they saw what the saw noses? Um, let me show you. They kind of do. They swing it from side to side in order to catch their prey. Just... Um, and you'll probably see a clip of that in this documentary. But, uh... Yeah. Here we go. Sawfish uses its saw in a particular hunting technique. It moves in sudden bursts. Yep. Wiping its saw to stun the main prey before returning to swallow it whole. Pretty cool, right? It doesn't have the sailfish's blinding speed, but it uses its rostrum with great accuracy. It'll even skewer individual fish on its teeth 
scrape the fish off and suck it into its mouth. Pretty neat. Pretty neat. One hour, and then we haul the line back. We do it for only one hour for a few reasons. One, we do want to minimize stress on the sawfish, but we don't want to kill things that we're not trying to catch. Big lemon. Hold on, hold on. Hold lemon on. shark. Settle Very down. cool. Settle down. Oh, boy. Let me get the head first. Oh, man. We're going to catch more non-endangered species than endangered ones, so we catch a lot more sharks. And we've caught about 1,000 sharks for compared to 30 or so sawfish. Rarely do we have a shark that dies on the line or anything doing this work. Okay, one, two, three. Gone. While the long line is soaking, the scientists decide to download data that gives them information on the movement of the animals. So these are acoustic receivers that our colleagues at University of Florida, the Florida Museum of Natural History put out. And so every time there's a coded acoustic transmitter that comes within the detection range of one of these, it gets picked up with a time and date stamp. Very cool. And the number of the animal. And so this animation they've here. tagged quite a few sawfish <laughs> in here. We've tagged a few as well with these transmitters. We have detections on this receiver from three sawfish. One of the sawfish was tagged last March, and it was tagged right near the receiver. The detections from that animal are from the day it was tagged and the very next day, and then it wasn't detected again. The other two animals were tagged elsewhere in the bay. Eventually, the scientists have a sawfish on the line. Oh, big sawfish, big sawfish. Look down here, look, 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 look. Oh, boy. I'll try to get him unwrapped. All right. OK. These sawfish are dangerous to deal with because they're so incredibly strong. Oh, don't wrap, don't wrap. The dangerous part of them extends three or four feet from their body. The radius of the potential damage can be, you know, 10 feet. And they are so strong and so heavy and so quick. Swinging that rostrum wow. side to side. Oof. You know, think, oh man, this is an incredible animal. What an incredible experience to see this thing. The first order of business is to get a rope on the rostrum. Once we have the rostrum, then we can cleat that off, and then we can reach down and put a rope on the tail. Now he's ours. Now, now he's ours. <laughs> then we'll take a number of typical measurements, fork length and the length from the tip of the snout to the beginning of the tail to the end of the tail. That's the biggest male. Oh, that's that's right interesting, there. Kennedy. Wow. By 10 centimeters. That's a big guy. Cool. What we channel is that, Kennedy? I don't know if I'm familiar we'll with that count channel. The number of teeth on the rostrum. 23 on the left, 24 on the right. Oof. So that might look like it would be painful, but evidently it's not really having your dorsal fin sawed through. Maybe it's kind of like cutting your fingernails or something like that. Um, yeah. So now we're putting on a satellite tag. You'll notice I drilled a small hole through the yep. front end of the first dorsal fin. You may have also noticed there was not a drop of blood. There's really no vascularization in that part, which is one of the reasons we put it in there. Huh. And so we just want this thing to stay on long enough to get the data from the tag. Once the tag pops off, we want this whole harness to come off so all these crimps and everything will, will corrode and then the, the wire can work its way out and it'll be none the worse for wear. This one's programmed to stay on for 150 days and then that will float to the surface. And all the light, temperature, and depth Very cool. that it's logged will be, will be trans. Now, that was a drill right there, yes. What, what? Did I not say it was a drill? What did I say? Um, but yeah, that 1,000% uh, was a drill that was being used there. So now we're putting on a satellite tag. Yep. On the left, 24 on the right. Yep. Definitely a drill. Did I say saw? I'm sorry, Chad. <laughs> We're talking all about sawfish and, uh, well, you know how that, you know how it works. Anyway, definitely a drill. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this is not painful to the animal. So now we're putting on a satellite tag. 
You'll notice I drilled a small hole through the front end of the first dorsal fin. You may have also noticed there was not a drop of blood. There's really no vascularization in that part, which is one of the reasons we put it in there. And the whole point of doing this is to gather data so they can help protect these animals. The tag, once the tag pops off, we want this whole harness to come off so all these crimps and everything will, will corrode and then the, the wire can work its way out and it'll be none the worse for wear. This so one's programmed for 150 days. Oh, he hasn't seen this early 2023. Oh, shoot, Kennedy. And all the light, temperature, uh, and depth data that it's lost will, will be transmitted. Uh, then we'll hopefully be able to know where it's gone. There you go. For the next three or and a months or so. <laughs> A couple of the ones we tagged in the Florida Keys in 2013, the tags popped off all the way up as far as Tarpon Springs. Wow. Dean also puts an acoustic tag on the animal. And these are the tags that will actually be picked up by those receivers we've been checking. Oh, cool. So give us information about when the animals come back to those areas. Could give us information on migration patterns up the East Coast or in other places in the Gulf of Mexico too. And then finally, we put a dark tag, and that's just a simple identification tag. It just has a number on it. It's a National Marine Fisheries Service tag. And so if someone catches that sawfish again, or if we catch that sawfish again, then we can look up the information on it and know where it was tagged. If it's measured, Very cool. we get an idea of growth rates. So that's a cheap way to tag an animal, in theory, for its lifetime. And we've Very actually nice. recently captured two sawfish in Florida Bay that were tagged with dark tags by our colleagues a year before at hmm. the same spot. So that's pretty good evidence that during that time of the year, that's where they come. So that's valuable too. Like microchipping your dog. There you Historical go, Rihanna. Historical data suggests that large sawfish yeah. may have migrated Dex Phantom. during the summer. I've had this since my very first stream. data yeah. collected from the tag so far hasn't confirmed that. Three and a half years. Before long, Same measuring the cup. scientists have a female sawfish on the line. So this one's 448. So this one ties to the largest that we've caught so far in our... Wow. Area. Females are bigger than males. Beautiful fish. And she's being so sweet. <laughs> so she's being sweet. In addition to tagging the animals and measuring them, the researchers also collect blood samples to see if the sawfish may be pregnant or have just given birth. So then hmm. hopefully we can find out, you know, okay, it seems that they are preparing to mate in spring, for example. And then if we can find from our satellite tagging data um, where they are during those time periods, perhaps we can find whether they're mating in aggregations or if it's just kind of haphazard. Um, because that all plays a big uh, role in the potential for recovery of the population. That's very cool, Kennedy. That's very By cool. looking at the sex hormones in the blood of both male and female animals, the scientists hope to gain a better understanding of the animal's life history. Sawfish, like their relatives, the sharks and rays, take a long time to mature. They have relatively few offspring compared to other fish, which means the recovery of the population takes longer. Based on what data we have, we think they mature in about You're good, Dex Van We believe that they reproduce every Thanks two years, being. but it could be that they're in reproducing every year. Uh, we think they produce about 8 to 12 pups. Unlike most fish, sawfish give birth to live young. Everyone's yep. first thought is, poor mom. Yeah, do the young cut their way out of the mother using their toothed rostrum? Hmm. Birth to live young. Everyone's first thought is poor mom you know how does that happen it's really cool and that the rostrum check that out it's got a sheath over it when they're first born so those dermal denticles those teeth do not injure the mother isn't that awesome very very cool safety caps for Karina, yeah 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 they're very flexible when they come out. But the teeth are needle sharp, but they're almost completely enclosed in a gelatinous material that sheaths the, the teeth so they don't damage the mom. And Pretty then cool. First, uh, Pretty cool. So that sheath disintegrates. Little clip. Dean also. And Patrick Crusader says, no, that doesn't make them mammals. No, of course not. No, there's lots and lots of animals that give birth to live young that are not mammals. There's all kinds of different fishes, both bony fishes and sharks and their relatives. There's all kinds of different insects and other arthropods that give birth to live young. 
Um, there's a number of different reptiles that do. Uh, snakes, many kinds of snakes give birth to live young. Um, that doesn't make them mammals, no. What makes a creature a mammal is that if it's like from the mammal branch on the tree of life, if it evolved from a mammal ancestor. So, you know, giving birth to live young versus laying eggs or being warm-blooded versus being cold-blooded, those can be clues as to whether a creature is a mammal or a reptile or whatever. But what actually matters is the ancestry. That's what makes a creature a mammal or a reptile or this or that. Um, when we're classifying living things, it's based on the ancestry. It's based on who they evolved from. Again, this is why it's extremely important to understand evolution, because if you don't understand evolution, you don't understand biology. You know, it's the fundamental underlying principle underneath everything in biology. But yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's just sparkly egg laying. There you go, Charlie's dragon. Yeah, yeah. And yep, snake, some snakes give birth to live young, including some kinds of rattlesnake, I think, little pink boners. Yeah, yeah. Um, Patrick Crusader says, I had a discussion with someone who kept claiming that some sharks were mammals because they gave birth to live young. Oh, I feel bad for that person. Patrick, that's... um. Ooh, yeah. Uh... <laughs> It's, this is why I do what I do here, you know? It's what this is all about. Uh. A small fin clip for genetic analysis that will help the scientists understand how different animals are related to one another. Nice. During the endangered species listing, it was estimated that the population may have declined by 90% or more, 95% oh boy. maybe even. And uh, so there's the potential for genetic bottleneck. It's essentially inbreeding. But fortunately, oh, all rattlesnakes are bird no living in the U.S. That. Cool, so it still seems little like pink pony. Neat. Plenty of genetic diversity out there. In addition, the scientists use the genetic samples to determine if there is a distinct sawfish population in the U.S. or if Very the cool. animals migrate back and forth to the Bahamas. Oh, interesting. So whether, yeah, you know, whether this is one population or two, whether the, this there's been a split that's occurred here, and they're genetically different enough that they're maybe eventually going to speciate. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. And Riles, he says, are there mammals that do lay eggs then? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, there used to be... Most mammals used to lay eggs. Today, there's only a few species. And we call these monotremes. But there used to be many groups of egg-laying mammals. Uh, egg-laying used to be the default for mammals. Monotremata... There we go. Monotremes. Let's zoom into them. So the echidna and the platypus are the the two, th two that everybody thinks of. I think there are several species of echidna and one species of platypus, but let's see. Yeah. Monotremes. There's five living species. I guess that's one platypus and four echidnas. Platypus. Short-beaked echidna. Attenborough's long-beaked echidna. Eastern long-beaked echidna and western long-beaked echidna. So all these guys lay eggs. Um, yeah. Find you a video. And mammals that lay eggs. Let's take a look at this. How well do you know our amazing egg-laying mammals? No, well, I think I know them pretty well. There are only two kinds of this unique and ancient mammal left in the entire world. The platypus. Well, there's five species, but two kinds, I guess. Sure. Plus, and the echidna. And yeah. we're lucky enough to have both here in Australia. Pretty neat. So these are 100% mammals, but so they lay eggs. How long have monotremes been around? Well, we need to go back in time quite a bit to the age of the dinosaurs. Around 300 million longer. years yeah. ago, amphibians and reptiles emerged from the water to also live on land. Oh, this might be a little bit out of date here. Are they going to say that mammals split off from reptiles? Because that's not true. We now know that the split goes way back to the very origin of Tetrapoda. So mammals and reptiles were never the same thing. Or at least this, the split between mammals and reptiles happened at the birth of both groups. 
So, like, it's not like one branch of reptiles turned into mammals. No. The split is further down than that. So, you know, uh, the origin of reptiles and the origin of mammals is at the same spot. They split, and they were never the same thing. You know? A few million years later, reptiles that were a bit mammal-like began to appear. But yeah, that this is not... They weren't reptiles. This is now what we understand is that, uh, that these guys never were reptiles in the first place. Both reptiles and mammals evolved from the same ancestor, it looks like, and they've been the same... They've been different ever since. Um, it's not like reptiles get started and then mammals split off from them. No. Um, no. But these still weren't mammals yet. It took another 80 million years for the first monotremes to split off from the mammal-like reptiles. Yeah, anytime you hear that phrase, mammal-like reptile, you know that you're dealing with outdated information. Because we used to talk about this all the time, but nowadays we recognize, oh shoot, synapsids and seropsids, reptiles and mammals, they've been different since the very beginning of, uh, of of uh, amniote creatures and become their own unique evolutionary branch yep this is around the same time that dinosaurs began dominating earth but well before marsupials and placental mammals arrived on the scene yep because of their reptile like features biologists consider they're not reptile like ah oh, that's such a that's so misleading they're not reptile like monotremes to be the most primitive mammals in the world most obvious and by most primitive that's another outdated term we would now say they're early diverging so they split off pretty early from the rest of mammals so that's that's what they mean by primitive there um that's kind of a loaded term you know primitive and it's also it can be misleading when we're actually talking about ancestry and everything yeah basal is a good way to put it jody fish yeah yeah they they split off closer to the base of the family tree. Monotremes lay eggs, but they also waddle like a reptile with legs on the side rather than underneath their body. And a number of- Yeah, but that's irrelevant. <sighs> their body systems yeah. are similar to a reptile, including how they pass their waste and how they mate. Yeah, the cloaca, fact, yeah. The word monotreme derives from Greek, meaning single whole, if you know what I mean. I like the little wink there. Meaning single whole, if you know what I mean. Wink. <laughs> Neither echidnas nor platypus have teeth. Instead, they have special grinding plates, which they use to eat aquatic invertebrates or ants. In Australia today, marsupials are the dominant mammal group, but platypus and echidnas have survived all this time because their ancestors lived where marsupials could not follow in the water yeah marsupials notorious for being terrible at becoming aquatic there have never been any aquatic marsupials that i know of um and it's because they're just not built for that when marsupials emerge from the birth canal they have to be able to use their arms to uh to crawl into the pouch um and so like you can't lose your limbs and become aquatic you can't evolve flippers or anything like that because that most critical stage in your early life, you wouldn't be able to do it. So it's it's just, they're closed off from the possibility of ever becoming aquatic, if that makes sense. Because marsupial joeys need to stay in mum's pouch for so long, they would drown if mum went for a swim. So that while too. marsupials yeah. established themselves on land and in the trees, the water remained the realm of monotremes. Today's echidnas don't live in water, but they are thought to have evolved from a platypus-like ancestor and later adapted to life on land. Huh. There are three species of echidna, the short-beaked echidna and two species of long-beaked echidnas that are only found in Papua New Guinea. Interesting. And, of course, we had the other one here. Uh, Attenborough's long-beaked echidna, which may have been discovered or published on after this video was made. All have long tongues to feed. There's just oh. one surviving species of platypus, and it's mm -hmm. only found on the east coast of mainland Australia and Tasmania, making it extra special. 
Platypus are pretty adaptable, <laughs> though, as they can thrive in everything from tropical streams to dams on farms in Tasmania. So while monotremes may be our most ancient living mammal group, they have spent millions of years evolving to have the many amazing features and adaptations that make them perfect for life today. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Neat stuff. And I'll give you a link to this video here. Um... Yeah. Uh, we got a great question from uh, just this guy you know. I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, what would the common ancestor of mammals and reptiles look like? It looks kind of like a weird lizard. I'll show you. Um, yeah. And... Let's see. Uh, what was that other question? Maybe it was a remark that somebody had. Oh, Dex Phantom Hawk said, I don't feel bad about misunderstanding mammal and reptile evolution after seeing all this info. I know, right? Because most people get this stuff wrong. Um, there's an excellent book about this. I've not read it yet, but I've had it recommended to me by a, uh, a fellow paleontologist who's studying mammals. If you want to really understand mammals and their incredible history in the fossil record check out this book beasts before us the untold story of mammal origins and evolution i've heard very very good things about this and i'm excited to read it once i have some time so busy lately but uh yeah check it out beasts before us by elsa panceroli um but yeah, but what would the common ancestor of reptiles and mammals look like? Well, let's talk about that. Let's go to Wikipedia. And, uh... Jenny ACW, thank you. For the four months of support and the slightly smiling face. Appreciate you, Jenny. Thank you, thank you for keeping me online for the past four months. Thank you for your support. Um, Synapsida. There we go. Synapsids are one of the two major clades of vertebrate animals in the group Amniota. Uh, so anyway, today, well, this includes modern mammals, like tigers and echidnas, and then all of these extinct groups, too. You know, like Dimetrodon, and Casea, and Gorgonopsians, and Moss Chops, and Various Mesozoic mammals. Pretty cool. Um, so let's go to the origins of Synapsida. Yeah. Evolution of mammals. So this is one of the oldest synapsids found. So when... When mammals and reptiles, or synapsids and seropsids, respectively... When they split, their ancestors, well, they, they looked like this. So this critter, it's got a few weird things in its skull that show that, like, shoot, this is on the line to mammals. And close relatives of this animal that don't have those features in the skull, those are on the line to reptiles. Uh, so this is Archaeothyrus. Yeah, it's an Ophiac Ophiacodontid synapsid from the late Carboniferous from Nova Scotia, about 306 million years old. And so the skull of this animal has got your classic mammalian shape already. It's funny, anytime you get close to like a major split in the tree of life, the two critters that like, that split in opposite directions, they'll look super, super similar to one another. Because of course they do, you know? This is where the tree diverges, where there's a major split. So when you go to where those those branches, where they split off, the two creatures that start to split away from each other, they'll, they'll look really, really similar right at the base of that split. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Um, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and Reanimated Bit wants to know if Sawfish have Empulae of Lorenzini. Uh, I don't know if they have that at the end of their rostrum. I think they do throughout the throughout the rostrum. I don't know if they have it at the very end, though. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. And Kennedy says, Chat, which of you were taught in school kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species? It's not actually quite like that anymore, Kennedy. I mean, it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. Oh, and our sawfish is done printing. Yes, we'll get to this in a little bit. But first, let's talk about classification. Um, yeah. So most of you are probably familiar with, you know, this, uh, like, method of classification. Now we've got domain as well. Um... But this is called, like, the ranked classification system. And this is still true. It's just very incomplete. And it turns out that, like, when you're trying to classify living things like this, um, there's a little bit of artificiality in there. Where, like, class mammalia, that's not the same thing as, like, class aves. You know, birds and mammals. We think of these as being two different classes of living things because it's what we were taught in school, right? But aves, birds, are part of dinosauria, which is part of reptilia. So sometimes you can have a, cla a class that's actually part of another class. And so, like, thinking of these as distinct, hard, and fast rankings like this if they're removed, misses the point. It's, it's not correct. really correct. Um, and just this guy, you know, thank you for subscribing. I appreciate that. Holy cow. Thank you very, very much for that pledge of continued support. Enjoy the emotes. Enjoy not having to watch any ads. I appreciate you. Great question you had, by the way. I love an insightful question like that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Jordy Fish says, Aves is more family than class. Well, a family is like a group of closely related genera. And then an order is a group of closely related... Uh you know, families, but that's why we've got all kinds of intermediates in here. So, like, there's infra-orders and super-orders and sub-orders. There's super-families and sub-families. When we're trying to take nature, when we as, as scientists or, or, uh, or taxonomists, when we try and take nature and, like, force it into into boxes to make sense of it. It's a very natural thing for us to do, but you can miss a lot of the nuance by doing that. Um, so these are really more of like, these are not hard and fast categories. These are not super, super rigid boxes. It's wrong to think of them that way. They're more like kind of tools for, for organizing how you think of and communicate about these critters. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And Rylesy says, This channel may be too interesting for me to go to sleep. Well, I appreciate you saying so, Rylesy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Dex Phantom Hawk says, Beast Before Us. Ordered. Very nice, Dex Phantom. Very nice. I hope you enjoy it. Might get a chance to read it before you do with how busy you are. You probably will, Dex Phantom. Yeah. Anyway. And Murph says, question, are there more dynamic branches, like three or four branches due to species radiation? Absolutely, Murph. Yeah. We call that being a very diverse group, or very speciose, lots of species. Um, and so if we look at our tree of life, back to this. Here, let's go back to, um, uh... Let's go to Lepidosauria, for instance. These are lizards and their relatives. 
So, lizards and snakes. Right here. How many living species do we have, according to this tree? 10,909 living species of squamate. Lizards and snakes. Snakes are a kind of lizard. They evolved from a lizard ancestor, so they're a kind of lizard. But then we zoom out a little bit to Lepidosauria. This one was 10,909? You go up a level to Lepidosaurs, and this is only 10,910. It's only one more. Why is that? Well, there's this wonderful creature here, a Tuatara, which is not a lizard. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not a lizard. You might think it looks like a lizard. Maybe it superficially looks kind of like a lizard, but it is from a group of once very diverse creatures. Now there's only one species left. Wait, rip. Shoot. Where did that... There we go. <laughs> Wrong tab, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. So, Tuatara, this group, the uh, Sphenodontians, they used to be really, really diverse. They used to be all over the place. Um, all throughout the Mesozoic, there's like, you find fossils of them everywhere. There used to be lots and lots and lots of species. There's a cool illustration of one right there. Um, there were even marine ones. There is one group of Sphenodontians. What are they called? I forget. Um, yeah, Ankylosphenodon from Central Mexico. Yeah, Plurosaurus. Yeah, this incredible creature is also a, uh, a Sphenodontian, a relative of the Tuatara. So, this group used to be super, super diverse, and now there's only one species left. You can find them in New Zealand. They're super cool animals. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So certain groups have lots and lots of species, and certain groups have no species at all anymore because they've gone extinct, and some have just, like, one species, or very few. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah. And uh, Skewen says, were there any tries to implement AI solutions into life's taxonomy? I don't know if it would be very helpful. We already use computers for this kind of thing, for what we call cladistics. Um, yeah. Maybe I can find you a, a really quick intro to that. I, I think I've tried to do this before, and, like, nobody has a really concise, good video on this. Um... We could try this, maybe? Maybe this will be halfway decent? Oh, come on, YouTube. Uh, there we go. There are millions of living things on planet Earth. As biologists, we must classify living things into groups in order yep. to better understand them and manage the enormous wealth of biological information which we have. So how should we classify these organisms into groups? We could make a yellow group, a blue group, a legless group, and an ugly group. And classifying these organisms into those four groups would look like this. Biologically speaking, these are horrible groups. Yeah, not good, purposes, not good. As biologists, <laughs> we're looking for groups which help us understand the natural world and help us to order an incredible amount of information. We yep. would like there to be a group like mammals so that we could study the mammalian brain and what we learn about one brain would be true of many brains. The yep. vertebrate body plan, the eukaryotic cell, etc. This would make our lives easier and help us understand nature. These yep. groups do not do this because the force... Well, because they're not actual groups. Like, these creatures don't share a recent common ancestor. They're not actually related to each other. That's what we're trying to figure out. And, yeah. and the iris 
are both flowering plants and share an enormous number of features in common, but they are classified in two different groups. Yep. The bluebird and vulture are both birds. They share a great number of features, but are classified in different groups. And so these groups have classified organisms which are not related and which share few characteristics in common. Yeah. These groups give us no predictive ability. And so therefore, as biologists, we are seeking better groups than this. Yep. Thus, biologists would prefer to classify these organisms into groups such as these. There you go. The bluebird and the vulture would be classified together as birds. Both yep. birds and the snake would be classified together as amniotes. Yep, the creatures snake, with eggs, the birds, like hard-shelled eggs. And on the two amphibians, the frog and the legless Sicilian, would be classified together as vertebrates. Yep. The vertebrates plus the spider would be classified together as animals. And then all of the individuals here could be classified as eukaryotes. Mm -hmm. These are, are biological creatures with a cell that has a nucleus. Ability. One could speak of the eukaryotic cell and make statements which are true of all of the eukaryotes. Or yep. speak of animals, you know, possession of collagen and say something which is true of all of the am animals. Or make statements which are true of all of the vertebrates or amniotes or birds. Mm-hmm. Also note that many of the biological groups form a nested hierarchy of groups within groups. So then amniotes include the group birds. Yep, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and I thought we we're going to get into cladistics here. Uh, yeah. I don't know if there's going to be a good... Well, anyway, basically what you can do is you... The idea behind cladistics and using computers to help classify living things is that you can kind of code out different character traits. So maybe, maybe this will talk about it a little bit, actually. Constructing a cladogram. Have you ever organized your room and realized that you put similar or related objects near each other and completely different objects farther away? This mm. is similar to how scientists construct a cladogram. Cladistics is a systematic method of classification which uses shared derived characters to make a cladogram. A cladogram is a branching diagram that represents the proposed phylogeny or evolutionary history of a species or group. There you go. Cladistics yeah. assumes that each group has an ancestor that other species do not share. The cladogram in our example shows how four very different species could develop from a common ancestor. The mm -hmm. common ancestor would be at the bottom of the diagram. The cladogram is constructed by sequencing the order in which the derived characters evolved with respect to the outgroup. The outgroup yep. is the species that has more ancestral characters with respect to the other organisms being compared. In the so anyway, yeah, it's the more primitive one. So, you know, you kind of get it. So the, the way that we actually construct this, though, is using a computer. So we'll... We'll basically type out the different features that uh, that these different organisms have, and we'll create kind of a rubric for them. So it'll be like, well, uh, you try and look for for traits that are actually informative. So like saying that they're oh they're they're gross or I don't like them or whatever. Like that's not a good character trait. It's gonna mess up your model. But if you say well they have radial symmetry, so like echinoderms have radial symmetry. Um, they like radiate from a central point and then they have symmetry from that. Like that's an interesting character state. That's something that's unique to them. They don't share that with any of the rest of these. The rest of these guys are bilaterally symmetrical, um, which is why they group together and these are kind of at the end. Um, well, actually that might make them an out group, but you get the idea. Um, anyway, and so the way that you do this is you code those different character traits as ones or zeros. Uh, or sometimes you can have more numbers, too, if you have a more complex model. But basically, you're just typing out all of these different uh, different like character states like that. And then you plug it into a computer, and then pfft, it spits out for you a cladogram. Showing you which one of these, which ones are more mathematically similar to others based on the traits that you've coded. Um, so it is kind of a garbage in, garbage out sort of thing. It's not perfect. It's not magic. It's 
computers, and computers only do what you tell them to do. Computers are very stupid. Um, but that's what they're designed for, you know? They're not human beings. Um, they're not really thinking. They're just running through a program. And so, I don't know. It kind of bugs me sometimes when people treat cladograms like they're, you know, a thing unto themselves. It's like, no, this is they're only as good as the data that you put into them. But that's a story for another time. This is me griping about sometimes things that other scientists do. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but yeah. Uh, quiz tech? Exactly. Yeah. Computers only do what you tell them to do. Yep. Yep. Um, so anyway. Um, but that's how we actually... When you're doing something like comparing different species of sawfish, for instance, and you're trying to figure out which ones are more closely related to each other, you can look at them, you can kind of eyeball them and go, well, these two look really similar. Maybe they're their closest relatives. Yeah, but sometimes that can fool you, because there might be convergent evolution going on where they've evolved to do a similar job in a similar environment, and so they've evolved to look similar, even though they're not super closely related. This is why you actually look at their DNA. And you can do a molecular phylogeny or a molecular cladogram where you can have, you know, if you've got the genetic code for each of them, you can use that as your data and have that spit out a tree. And that tends to be more reliable than using morphology. So yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's get back to our sawfish video here and while we're doing that i can pull the sawfish here let me pull that off of the 3d printer over there let's start assembling this bad boy yeah Very nice. Yeah. And let me caution. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. We've got our sawfish here in three parts. Let's get this assembled. Um, well, I'm working on this. Continue watching this. Here we go. Endangered species listing. Here we go. So they don't damage the mom. And then over the first uh, week or so, that sheath disintegrates. Little clip. Dean also takes a small, thin clip for genetic analysis that will help the scientists understand how different animals are related to one another. During the endangered species listing, it was estimated that the population may have declined by 90% or more, 95%, Oof. maybe even. And uh, so there's the potential for genetic bottleneck. It's essentially inbreeding, but fortunately, they found no evidence of that. So it still seems like there's plenty of genetic diversity out there. In addition, the scientists used the genetic samples to determine if there is a distinct sawfish population in the U.S. or if the animals migrate back and forth to the Bahamas. Very cool. So far, it appears they are separate populations. Origin 42 out there. You go, Andy. Yeah. Satellite tags have stayed within the United States, within Florida, actually. Another team of scientists from NOAA's Southeast Fisheries Science Center studies juvenile sawfish. Our survey is in three areas in the backcountry in southwest Florida. We're up in Goodland and around Marco Island. We also are in the 10,000 Islands area. And then our most southern area is Everglades National Park. We started in 2009. Since we began this survey, the trend is for a slowly increasing population, which is great. That is great. The animals are most abundant in the protected areas of Everglades National Park. Nice. It was very interesting that the Everglades National Park was created in the 1930s, and this was about the same time that the sawfish population started to decline. 
So it was sort of, you know, we'll call it serendipity, call it luck, that historically this was the core area of their population in the United States to begin with. And then to have that core area set aside as a national park was probably one of the reasons why we still have sawfish left in the U.S. Uh, think about that. If it weren't for Everglades National Park, sawfish would probably be extinct or extirpated in the U.S. No more sawfish in the U.S. if it weren't for Everglades National Park. That's kind of incredible to think about. Every month, the researchers spend a week in the field studying the animals. So what we're going to be doing is tracking the abundance of the individuals through time because for recovery to occur, we have to have the population abundance to occur. Prior to the listing, we really didn't have a sawfish survey that would measure the abundance of animals through time. We use small, very small gill nets. The teeth on the saw, they swim right into the net and they get caught and they can just rest yeah. on the bottom and wait for us to come get them. So it's very low stress. So they've got to check them very frequently. An though. hour to maybe two hours, but we check yeah. the net continually. A lot of catch and release going on. This team collects a lot of the same data as their colleagues studying the adult sawfish. Tag the animal externally with a dart tag and internally with a pit tag. Pit tag is a tiny little transponder. It comes with a like a barcode, like what your vet would huh. use to tag your cat or your dog. So if Very cool. animal ever loses its external tag. Who was it who who said that it's like getting your, you know, uh getting a what is it called? Tracker tag on your pet? It you were right, whoever said that. We yeah. Scanner, so we Very scanner funny, Jody Fish. Like <laughs> Juvenile saw hey Alex Vixen, how you doing? On mangrove habitats. Um by the way, Alex Vixen, you will be very pleased to know that the Mastodon and Mammoth uh files that you found for me the other day, uh I'm super excited about those and I've started printing the Mastodon. Let me show you. Um, yeah, we were talking the other day about how to tell the difference between a mastodon and a mammoth. Their teeth look very, very different, but also the animals themselves look different. I already printed the teeth. Mammoth tooth, mastodon tooth. Very, very different looking teeth right here. But I wanted to have like a, you know, a fleshed out model for uh, each of those animals so I could put them side by side with the teeth and, and show you. And I've started printing the Mastodon. Um, they might look fairly similar, but they're different enough. Uh, this is the Mastodon that I have printed so far. Um, as you can see, it looks a lot like a mammoth, except... The tusks are a slightly different shape, the skull, the shoulders. Uh, the biggest difference is that mastodons, uh, they've got fewer legs than mammoths. So you'll see this one here has only got the one in the front. So I guess, I guess they are fairly different. I'm of course, 100% kidding. This is not complete yet. The other three legs will be printed on the back half. I haven't printed that one yet. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty excited about that. Thank you again, Alex Vixen, for tracking these down. There we go. Uh, that's what it'll look like when it's done. And this is by Charles R. Knight himself. We talked a little bit about Charles Knight yesterday on the stream. So anyway, Alex Vixen, I appreciate you. Uh... Thank you, thank you. Very excited to have this done. And, uh... And, yep, Patrick Crusader, you do remember correctly. And these are indeed... Life-size. Mammoth teeth get even bigger than this, actually. Uh, for whoever was asking that. Uh, yeah. Yakbone, Battle Axe... Both of these get larger. I wanted to print these um, 
you know, like manageable size on the 3D printer, but I've seen bigger Mastodon teeth than this, and I've definitely seen bigger Mammoth teeth than this. They'll maybe get another 50% larger or something like that. They get big. Yeah. Um, good stuff. And I don't have a file for Platybeldodon, or else I would, uh, Joannis. That would be really cool, but I don't have a file for that critter. The big uh, shovel tusker elephant. There we go. These guys were neat and weird. What a strange creature. You can see why they're called Shovel Tuskers. Yeah. Pretty cool. Uh, anyway, let's get back to our sawfish here. Um, and I'll continue... ...getting this, uh... ...this fleshed out sawfish assembled animal ever loses its external tag we have a scanner that we can scan over the animal and it'll pop up like a barcode number juvenile sawfish depend on mangrove habitats as their nursery areas current theory is that they're using the mangroves when they're very small for protection from predators uh, probably the predators for a small sawfish would be something like a bull shark or a lemon shark or maybe even alligators might feed on the occasional sawfish the mangroves also maybe uses a food Hansik, source. how are you doing? Lots welcome, welcome. And stuff in Good there to have you here. What's puzzling the experts is why the sawfish the seem to prefer some mangrove area. Evolution. If extinction didn't occur, successful group would dominate and it would last forever. Nescalo, thank you for the nine months of support. I really appreciate that. Welcome, welcome, Nescalo. Areas over others. The areas may be nine very months. Close it's together. a long time. What is the difference between you, that spot? And that spot, and why are they always right on that mud flat adjacent to that section of mangroves, as opposed to that mud flat on the other side, when easily they could swim a hundred yards and go to that spot? To figure out what the sawfish might be attracted to, the scientists try to quantify the environmental conditions. One of the things we've been examining is three factors related to the mangroves. One related, more related to black mangroves, is what is the density of these pneumatophores? The structure of the prop root system. Some prop roots are very much spread apart. Others are much more dense. So we've been counting the number of prop roots within a 150 centimeter squared grid. And then also we, one thing we noticed that was interesting too is the distance of the overhang that covers the shoreline will differ depending on what mangrove stand you're at. So we've been measuring the distance from the edge of the last prop route out to the, where the edge of the overhang ends. Looking at the data that we've collected over the last five years, there appears to be some difference between how the mangroves are structured and whether the sawfish is there or not. The NOAA team also collects tissue samples for genetic analysis. We'll catch sawfish on the same mudflat year after year after year. Hmm. What we found is that actually some of those animals are siblings or half siblings. Huh. The current theory is that the females come up in here to give birth. She may give birth on the same area, and the individuals are always returning to that same area. Sort of like sand very cool. coming back to the same natal river every year. This very, very cool. Locations for animals living in less pristine areas where lots of human development has taken place. That's where Greg Polakis and his team from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission come in. Based out of the Charlotte Harbor Field Laboratory, they also study juvenile sawfish, but their study sites are a lot less pristine than the wilderness of Everglades National Park. Both of the areas that we mm. sample are much uh, more developed and have a lot more human influence. In the Charlotte Harbor area, the two primary locations where we sample are in the Peace River, as well as some of the upper harbor areas, and the Clusahatchee River, which is down by Fort Myers. We've been working in this area, doing research on small two sawfish since shortly after they were listed on the endangered species list. Just as in the Everglades, the animals here also seem to have hot spots they prefer. They will stay on a flat, probably very close to where they were born for several months. Probably the majority of the first year is in the greater region where they were actually born. As they get larger, they tend to expand 
their use of space and use more of the nursery. We catch newborn size, which is about two and a half feet or so total length, including the saw, up to about two and a half feet long when they're first born. That's bigger than I would have imagined. That's really cool. About seven feet. Uh, huh. That's uh, two to three years old. Sawfish grow very fast when they're young, doubling in size like during dinosaurs. their first year of life. Very cool. This greatly reduces their risk of being eaten by sharks or other predators. We'll keep this punch from the fins for genetics and stable isotope type of research. Stable isotope analysis provides information about the diet of the animals. That information has kind of shown that they eat primarily fish at all the sizes that have been sampled so far. So hmm. that's something that is new. There's very little information beyond just anecdotal things on feeding biology of these animals. Sawfish use their rostrum to catch their prey. Here we go. So we had some questions about this earlier and I showed some videos. We'll see. I listened to this the other day as I was doing laundry. I didn't get to watch the whole thing. So I didn't actually see this part here. I wonder if they have actual footage. Swinging it back and forth into a school of smaller fish, for example. They wound a couple of those and then return and feed on them. Yep. The first fin is going to get a roto tag, we call it, where it actually has the number of this fish and a phone number. So if an angler happens to catch this one, they can tell us which one it is. And then the second dorsal will use the, the same setup and that we've glued a, an acoustic tag to. So we can tell where they're swimming. We have a series of listening stations out here in the river. They're distributed in both the upper harbor, Peace River area, as well as the greater Clusahatchee area. Those units listen for those acoustic tags 24 hours a day. Hmm. So we're able to let's see how long they stay in the hot spots and then hopefully Pretty cool. estimate when they actually leave and move to other coastal habitats. Very, very Recently, cool. There was a fish that we tagged in April of 2011 in the Clusahatchee River and it died and showed up on a beach in Key West. Oh. So that is obviously a pretty significant move. Well, I am now ready to start assembling the pieces of our sawfish 3D print here. This full animal. It's going to go like this. Holy cow, is that going to... Oh, man. I'm excited already. Here, I got to do a little bit more sanding along here and here just to make sure that everything occludes per correctly. Um... So let me do that, and then I'll get to glue in here. Because sawfish are listed on the endangered species list, it is illegal for fishermen to target the animals. If a recreational fisherman you know, does accidentally catch the sawfish, we want the animal to be off the hook as quickly as possible. And instead of trying to remove the hook, we would ask if, you, if it's not possible to cut the hook off as close as you can to the mouth to release the animal. The, the longer the animal fights on the line, the less chances that it would have a survival. Oh. We have had some cases recently of fishermen actually removing sawfish from the water to take photos. Technically, that's illegal, and they could get in trouble for that. What we would yeah, like don't to, do that. to catch them is to estimate the size and call the International Sawfish Encounter database folks and report what? it. And that goes a long way to informing us of where sawfish are. There is an International Sawfish Encounter database, by the way, and we'll take a look at that in a bit. Much is being done to save the small tooth sawfish from extinction. With support from the public and through the diligent work of researchers, this prehistoric looking fish may have a chance to survive in a modern world. Let's hope so. Very, very cool. What a neat documentary. And like perfect timing here. I'm just about ready to assemble this. Very nice. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, Emotion Club, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventures and scuba diving and by the Do Unto Others Trust.
cool stuff. Thank you, thank you to all of the uh, the viewers like you who uh, who support this stream and allow me to do stuff like this. Let's get this assembled. Yes, yes, yes. There is the correct camera. There we go. So first off, let's do... The, uh... Let's attach the tail to the torso here. So, using two different kinds of glue on this. People always ask me about the glue, so I always find myself repeating myself. But I use a cocktail of cyanoacrylate and gorilla glue, because I find that that works really, really well for this application. The gorilla glue by itself is a little soft and takes too long to cure, but you add the super glue, the cyanoacrylate, it speeds things up. And it provides a nice kind of rigid bond. And that looks really good. I like that this is occluding really well. Yeah. Just gonna put a little bit of pressure on as that super glue starts to kick. Yeah. Very nice. Ho 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 ho. Check that out. Yeah, and it looks like a guitar fish at this point without that big rostrum. Let's put the rostrum on. Yeah. And yeah, look at that face right there. It looks a lot like a ray or a skate, right? Like a stingray. We've got the nostrils and the gills and the mouth all underneath. Yeah. Pretty cool. Patrick Crusader says, how will you glue that huge saw to this little thing? Watch, you know. It's easy. You just go like this, and that that looks pretty authentic, right? You know? Pretty lifelike. No, very funny. Um, there we go. It's just a little dab of our Gorilla Glue. I don't even know if that's super necessary, but we're gonna do it anyway. And then... Super Glue. Do a decent amount on here. lined up properly. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Check that out, chat. Check that out. Oh, this is way cooler than I thought it was going to be. I was like, do I really want to do a, a fleshed out sawfish? But holy cow, it looks super, super neat like this, and I'm so glad I did. Pretty awesome. Check that out. And such a sleek, streamlined shape. This really kind of hammers home the point that these are related to, to stingrays and guitar fish. And not to sharks. They're not... They're from the same broad group as sharks. They are cartilaginous fishes. But sharks are not their closest relatives. Those are, uh, are guitar fish and rays. And you can see that in just how flat they are. Like, top to bottom, this is a flat animal. Look at that. And just like a stingray, they've got those gills on the ventral side, on the underside of the animal, and the mouth right there. Excuse me. And the nostrils. Pretty cool. And beautiful lines. Yeah, Joanna. It's like, I don't know, whether you're an aircraft engineer or a, I don't know, an 
automotive artist, or you you would appreciate these lines, I think. That is a gorgeous animal. Very nice. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Holy cow. That makes me happy. It makes me really happy. Um, took a while to print, but man, was that worth it. Yeah. We've just... Now, uh... Here we go. Um, let's take a look at this real quick. So there are a few places in the world where you can see sawfish in captivity. And there's a place in the Bahamas where you can do that. That's right here. Let's take a look. Today I'm going to introduce you to our small tooth sawfish. Here at Atlantis, we're the only facility in the world that has successfully reproduced the small tooth sawfish. Wow. Is, is shark fin soup even good? No, and it's... No, it's not. Anyway, don't get me started on that. Yeah, well, shoot. Okay, that was shorter than I thought it was going to be. Um... And Patrick Crusader says, Danny, someone was asking before about sawfish fossils. Let's talk about that a little bit. Here, um, those of you who are very interested in dinosaurs, you might already be familiar with sawfish or sawfish relatives, because that's the point that I'm making here, from stuff like this. And hang on, we might need to, this is BBC, I think we'll have to go like this and get rid of our closed captions so uh, YouTube doesn't freak out over this. But here we go. So this is the Moroccan Spinosaur, uh, called Spinosaurus moroccanus. It's probably not the same animal as Spinosaurus from Egypt, but they call it Spinosaurus here and, you know, whatever. Yeah. But check this out. Yep. Hey, up ducks. How did you make that happen? Those follower alerts are randomized, and you got the duck one? Wow. That was pretty cool. Um, welcome to paleontologizing. That seems like a fortuitous coincidence, or maybe it's fate, but welcome to the channel. It's good to have you here. Welcome to paleontologizing. And happy... International Sawfish Day. Holy moly. This oh, this makes me so happy. This is this is this is cooler than I thought it was gonna be. Ah, oh, I love this. Yeah. Uh yeah. This is Uncle Pristis. Yep. An eight meter long giant sawfish, similar to those alive today. Pretty cool. It may not have actually been quite that big, and it's not a true sawfish. It's not. So yeah, like today, they probably did swim up river in order to breed. They're probably mostly oceanic. Um, but yeah, yeah. Today, sawfish, like we saw in the documentary, they actually swim up river to breed, and that's kind of a nursery for their young until they're big enough to uh, to go out into the open ocean.
like the Mutos are. Yeah, I have to reverse the footage or else YouTube will freak out. Rat acid. This is from BBC. This means it'll also be muted in the YouTube VOD. <laughs> it is funny. You're right, Rat Acid. You're right. <laughs> no argument there. And this is almost certainly not how Spinosaurids caught fish, but that's okay. Oof. Anyway, you get the idea. We're not going to watch this poor Uncapristus be torn asunder. But let's talk about this animal. This is probably not the same creature, like the same sawfish that we have today. It's probably a, a related group. But, as I understand it, this group actually went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, at the same time as the non-bird dinosaurs. Here on Wikipedia, let's see what uh, all Wikipedia has to say about it. It's an extinct genus of Sclerorhynchoid. Um, yeah. Very cool. From the Cretaceous of North Africa, Europe, and North America. I didn't realize we had them in North America, too. Holy moly. Uh, they've been found in coastal and fluvial deposits dated to the Beremian and Cenomanian stages. Or from the Beremian to the Cenomanian, making the genus one of the oldest and longest-lived sclerorhynchoid gen uh, genera. There is one of the, uh, one of the barbs... Or uh, denticles, one of the teeth on the rostrum. And it's got a barb on it. Holy cow. This is different from, like, our modern sawfish, where it's just... It's just kind of simple and more xiphodont like this. It's just... Yeah, these do not have a barb on them. I mean... They're just... Pretty simple kind of point there. Uncapristus a bit different there. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, very cool. So, these are not the same as modern sawfish. This is a group that is now, now understood to have gone extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So these are sometimes called saw skates, and I've actually heard Jim Kirkland talk all about these. Um, they're not the same as your modern sawfishes. They probably look more similar to, like, guitarfish. Yeah. Uh, so they've got a long rostra with large denticles similar to sawfishes and saw sharks. This feature was convergently evolved. Very cool. And their closest living relatives are actually skates. Very nice. While they're often called sawfishes, saw skates is a more accurate common name for sclerorhynchoids, this now extinct group that includes Uncapristus here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's five named families. Holy cow. Ganopristidae, Isar... Ischyrhizidae, Oncopristidae, uh, Tycho Trigonidae, and Skyrhizoridae. Schizorhizidae. Several genera see below are not currently placed in any of these families. They first appeared in the Beremian and went extinct during the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. So when that big asteroid hit, that wiped out this group. So yeah. Yeah. Um. Interesting stuff. And man, there are a lot of different genera. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so yeah, different hunting strategy with barbed rostrum denticles. It might just be, Golganek, that the bigger a rostrum gets and the bigger prey you're going after, the more likely it is that the prey will not be instantly killed by it. Um, and will escape. So having a barb on there might actually be 
an adaptation for going after larger prey. That would be my first guess. It's a guess. I don't actually know. Um, yeah, and it would be really interesting to see if... Well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. They may have just had a different hunting strategy, too, because... There may have been more competition back then, and maybe you need a barb in order to hold your prey to your rostrum so somebody else doesn't eat it. I don't know. That's a guess, too. That's a little bit more arm-wavy than the first one. But, yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Pretty cool. So this group, to which Uncle Pristus belongs, is, uh... Not related to your modern sawfish. They're not the same things. They're distantly related, but not closely related. And Golganek, thank you for that gift sub to Hugin. I appreciate that, Golganek. Thank you, thank you. You don't have to worry about ads anymore for the next month, Hugin. Thank you, Golganek, for your generosity. Yeah. And uh, Thistle Bridges. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing, and a very happy International Sawfish Day to you. Good to have you here. Uh, um, yeah, and Hugin says, so since it's now thought, again, that Spinosaurus was a waiter, what would their paddle tail be? That's a good question. I can't really, really talk about that right now because that has some bearing on the paper that I'm going to be publishing, but... um. I'll put it this way. We don't necessarily have evidence that Spinosaurus aegypticus had a paddle-like tail. That comes from Moroccan specimens, which are probably a different kind of Spinosaurid. So, yeah. Yeah. Mayor Space says, The barbs are a convenient way to kill your prey while keeping them forever out of your own reach. Yeah. There you go. Just keep swimming, you know? Always swimming. It's good exercise. Um, yeah. And Kennedy says, Danny, will you be changing your P.O. box because of the move? N I don't think so, Kennedy. No, I think I'm going to keep the same one. Um, yeah, because I'm not going to be moving far. My plan is to stay in the beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. And, uh, and I already shared that P.O. box with Lordy and Ios. We went thirdsies on that, so we split it the cost three ways. I can afford that. So, yeah, it would, it would cost a lot of money in order to get a new P.O. box, and I don't want to do that. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Uh... Stretching yourself a bit. Oh, Golganek, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Golganek, for your generosity. It really does mean a lot to me. Yeah. Um, anyway. So, yeah, you might be familiar with Ancapristus. It is not actually a true sawfish, despite what you may have been told in the documentary Planet Dinosaur. Um... Kind of a goofy documentary in a lot of ways, but, uh, yeah. It does not detract from its awesomeness. These are very, very cool critters. And then it goes to show that that, uh, that that rostrum, that adaptation, it's a very, very useful one. If it's evolved at least three times in the history of life on Earth, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Mighty Holmes says, where were those located? These are from Morocco. They've also been found in Europe and North America. Um, yeah. Uncapristus. Here's the Wikipedia link for ya. Yeah. Oh, and very nice, Hugin. That's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what are the ones that haven't evolved at all? They all evolved, Doki Doki Baka. Yeah. 
That's how they came to be. They evolved. Um, haven't evolved at all. Oh, do you mean ones that are the same as they were, the same today as they were 66 million years ago? During the Age of Dinosaurs? There aren't any. Yeah. The, the concept of like a living species that's completely unchanged over tens of millions of years is a fallacy. There's no creature like that. As long as creatures are still alive and reproducing, that means they're evolving. So it's because one generation is always a little bit different from the one before it. You're a little bit different from your parents. Your parents are a little bit different from, from their parents, your grandparents, etc., etc. That's the nuts and bolts of evolution right there. Variation between generations. If a if a population of living things has ever stopped evolving, that means it's dead. It means they're no longer reproducing. It means they're gone. If you're around and producing new generations, that means you're evolving. Yeah. Um. So yeah, yeah. And uh, Dan the BC man, hey, thanks for being here. I appreciate you. Good luck with your class too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so these guys went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. Uncapristus and its relatives, they went extinct. Modern sawfishes? These critters probably date back to after the extinction event. Um, so there's your living species there. In addition to the living sawfish, there are several extinct species that are only known from fossil remains. The oldest known is the monotypic genus Paeria, whose remains date back 100 million years from the Cenomanian Age Late Cretaceous, though it may represent a rhinid rather than a sawfish, and it probably is. It's almost certainly like a guitarfish or a wedgefish, and not a true sawfish. I like that they make that distinction here. Indisputable sawfish genera emerged in the Cenozoic Age about 60 million years ago. So that's after the asteroid. So this group, your modern sawfishes, they originate, or they only seem to show up in the fossil record after the extinction of the non-bird dinosaurs, after that asteroid impact. They're a little bit more recent, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. And Matty Holmes says, evolution is the statistical shift of genetics between subsequent generations. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, interest, right? It seems like pretty soon after that asteroid impact and, like, maybe 80% of life on Earth gets wiped out, these guys evolve. And they're, they look similar to their distant relatives, like Ancapristus. And they probably occupy a very similar niche. And they've got very similar rostra, probably. It's it's pretty neat how that works. This is just... This is a body plan that just works. And so it's evolved at least three times, independently. Which is pretty cool, when you think about it. Yeah. Um, also, I'd love... This uh, difference here. Big rostrum, small rostrum. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's fun. I'm gonna do that again. Somebody can clip that, you know? Small rostrum. Big rostrum. <laughs> yeah. Now, I wonder what the world's largest sawfish is that's ever been found. I feel like we should look that up right now. I want to make sure that this one that I printed is authentic. I, I've seen photographs of Rostra bigger than this. Um, but I want to know how big that animal would be. We can maybe run a quick calculation here if we use this and then just kind of scale it up let's measure that shall we so the rostrum on this guy metric here we'll say that's 13.5 centimeters and the total length of the animal 
from stem to stern, from the tip of the caudal fin, that's 52 centimeters. So, 52 divided by 13.5 equals 3.85. So, if we take the length of our big rostrum and multiply it by 3.85, we should get the full length of the animal. Of how big this sawfish would be in life. So let's measure that out. We've got 60 plus 40. That's a hundred, it's a meter long. Holy cow. So one meter times 3.85 is 3.85 meters. Um, yeah, holy cow. That's going to be like 15, 16 feet long. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and diagonal... No, I'm familiar with Ancapristus. We were just talking all about it. But Ancapristus is from a different clade, so it's maybe not super relevant for trying to scale up the roster, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Kennedy says, Danny, can you clarify extinction? There's the type... Uh, because all the members of a species die, say from an asteroid, but when there's evolution, say two new species emerge from one, can that parent one disappear just because all members have evolved? That's an excellent question, Kennedy. That is an excellent, excellent question. You would think that something like extinction would be easy to, uh, to define. And it is on its face. Like, that's when all members of a species are gone. They're extinct. They're no longer reproducing. There's no more of them. But yeah, if a species does split into two different species, do you say that the parent species is extinct? The thing is, the, the term extinction... We kind of apply this to modern species and not... The term extinction, when Cuvier was talking about this, he wasn't thinking about species evolving. So Cuvier didn't realize that species evolved. So let's talk about that. Uh, and it would help if I'd turn on the sound, huh? Georges Cuvier was a French scientist in the 19th century who was an expert at comparing animal species by their bones. One yep. day, he noticed something strange. Some of the fossil bones he was studying didn't quite match those of animals that were alive in his day. This discovery was very puzzling. In Cuvier's time, most people thought that all life had been created at once and had stayed the same through many, Hooped many generations existence. up to the present yeah. day. Animals didn't change from one to another and they certainly didn't disappear altogether. So where did these strange bones come from? <laughs> To solve this puzzle, Cuvier got out of the museum and visited mines around Paris to study rocks and their fossils. He noticed that strange bones seemed to be buried deep in older rocks, and as you moved up through younger and younger rocks, they disappeared entirely. That gave him an idea. Some animals are not found today because they completely died out thousands, even millions of years ago, and the history of their appearance and disappearance is preserved in the rocks. Cuvier identified more than two dozen of these extinct species, leading him to yep. think about revolutions. So this is um, dramatic periods when many animals went extinct. As in this is one of the reasons why Cuvier is often called the father of paleontology, because he was one of the first people to ever have these insights. Essential part of the history of life on Earth. Today, five mass extinctions are known to have occurred, and while we think of evolution as the main force that drives, and so. Mass extinctions are when more than, they're usually defined as when more than 50% of species go extinct. So you've got some sort of major event that happens. Um, it's like an external force exerted upon life on Earth, and it wipes out more than half of species. So the end Permian, this is like massive volcanic eruptions caused runaway global warming and acidification of the oceans. That's the end Permian mass extinction, where like more than 90% of life on Earth died out. The end Triassic, I think we're still trying to figure this out, but it might be something similar. Late Devonian, I think there's actually like, it's like a pulsed extinction event in the late Devonian. 
Or no, maybe this is the end or division I'm thinking of. Anyway, this may have been like a cooling event. The end Cretaceous is an asteroid hit the Earth. And uh, the general consensus now is that that's what caused the mass extinction. Because it lines up perfectly with that mass extinction event. And this, I'm, I predict, will probably get higher in the future. There's a few papers that should be coming out relatively soon, I think, that I've heard rumor of um, that might be upping the numbers for the end Cretaceous extinction event. But anyway, a mass extinction is like when more than half of life on Earth dies out. And these happen to line up with the, diff the end of these different geological periods because that's how we recognize these different geological periods. It's like, hey, this group of animals is going really strong and then they just disappear. And so those fossils were used when the uh, when these rocks were first being studied to be like, hey, something weird happened here. We'll call this a new time. You know, we'll call this, uh, you know, the the difference between the Cretaceous and the, uh, you know, the Age of Mammals, the Cenozoic. They used to call it the Tertiary, but anyway. Um, yeah, it's like those mass extinctions kind of punctuate Earth history. And you can see them in the rock record. Sometimes they're plain as day. Yeah. Um, anyway. As new adaptations and forms, mass extinction events also play a large role by creating ecological niches for different species to occupy. You yep. might say that thanks to Cuvier, our knowledge of abrupt changes in the history of life is rock solid. Yes, and so extinction, we're used to thinking of this as like entire groups going extinct. But when we're talking about particular species going extinct, you know, it's easy to tell when, like, a species goes extinct nowadays. It's like humans drove it into extinction. But if one species is evolving and it splits into different lineages, does that mean that the parent species went extinct? Because it disappears from the rock record. Is that an extinction event? Well, it's not. It's not like they ceased reproducing or they disappeared. They just split into two new species. So... Cuvier didn't understand that animals evolve, that they change over time, that lineages split and stuff like that. And so the terminology that he used, like extinction, it doesn't really do justice to... some of the nuance that we now know about. Does that make sense? The vocabulary just isn't there for really talking about this in, in a, a way that's more helpful for understanding it. Um, Denver Fowler shared a cool paper about this not too long ago. And it was right here. So-called background extinction rate is a sampling artifact. And I think this is really neat. There's this idea in paleontology that you've got like, oh, background rates of extinction. But, you know, uh, species only last for a few million years and then they go extinct. It's like, well, no, a lot of this is probably anagenesis. It's just species evolving into new species. So the old one disappears because they've changed. And it might seem abrupt because it's a sampling artifact. We can't see that smooth gradation because we have very few fossils oftentimes. And so it might seem like, bow, this species just went extinct and it's replaced by this other one. But there may have actually been a smooth transition from the ancestor to the descendant, and we just don't have all the fossils in between to see that nice smooth transition. So really, really cool paper about this, and I hope it gets cited more. I think this will be, if this is correct, this is going to be a big deal in, for instance, the study of dinosaurs. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and Chartron says, we do consider human precursors extinct, though. In some cases, yes, because they split off and then they went extinct. But when you've got a smooth gradation, we, we kind of got to talk about the difference between anagenesis and cladogenesis here. Um, this is really at the heart of the matter. We've talked about this a few times before on this channel. But there we go. This kind of works, yeah. Anagenesis versus cladogenesis. So these are two different kind of modes of evolution. 
or they're kind of the same with minor differences, it the stuff gets a little confusing because our language around it isn't super clear. So cladogenesis is where you have an ancestor that splits into different descendants over time, whereas anagenesis is just one population slowly changing over time. Or maybe quickly changing over time, but the point is it doesn't split on this side. You've got lots of splitting, new clades being formed, cladogenesis, clades being generated, clades splitting off, being generated versus anagenesis, it's just one population changing. So when the butterflies look like this, a million years after they looked like this, does that mean these ones are extinct? Well, no, they just changed, you know? So sometimes the language that we use around these things kind of muddies our thinking a little bit. And I think that's part of what this paper is about and um yeah yeah anyway and little pink pony says like neanderthals didn't go extinct really they co-mingled with modern men yeah i mean a lot of people are carrying neanderthal genes um myself included uh i did a 23 in me uh or was it ancestry.com i forget but it It'll tell you the uh, the percent of Neanderthal DNA that you have. And with me, I'm within like the 99th percentile or something like that. A lot of Neanderthal DNA from my ancestors. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Extinction can be a little bit more complicated when we're discussing it. because Especially when we're talking about geologic time. Did the species actually go extinct, or did it just evolve into a different species? And we don't have the intermediates yet because of sampling bias. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, and Kennedy says, with anagenesis, can I assume that the butterfly from a million years ago could not reproduce with the more modern one? That they, Then they are two species. Well... We're going to get into species concepts now, aren't we? Um, the thing is, we as scientists, when we're studying the natural world, you know, we're trying to make sense of it. That's what we do. But sometimes things are complicated and they're squishy gray areas. And these neat little boxes that we try and put things into, sometimes they don't really fit. So let's talk about that. What makes a species a species? Classifying living things is kind of like Pokemon. It appeals to our instinct to collect and identify. And the fact that we have a classification system is super useful for scientists. I mean, it shows how every type of organism we know is connected to all the others. We've mapped out all of life in one giant chart. It's amazing when you yep. think about it. But deciding how to classify Chartrone says, we're running you through your paces, Danny. I know, right? I love it. This is, this is good stuff. A new type of organism often isn't simple, especially when it comes to assigning it a species. In some cases, yep. it's obvious when two things should be separate species. A jellyfish clearly is very different from a jaguar. But the more similar mm -hmm. organisms get, the harder it can be to sort them. There's no one rule that will always tell you whether two organisms should be in the same species. So different taxonomists use different rules in different situations. The most wide... Because life is squishy and there's gray areas and there's all kinds of weird edge cases and stuff like that. Um, which I find really fascinating, you know? Spread definition of a species is called the biological species concept, or... Yep, and so biological species concept is what Kennedy was referring to right there. Um, with like, oh, well, if they can't reproduce, then they're not the same species, right? Well... BSC. It was popularized by evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer in 1942, and he continued to refine the idea over the next several decades. According to the BSC, organisms are part of the same species if they can produce offspring that can also breed. If they can't yep. produce fertile offspring, that means they belong to separate species. The BSC hinges on the idea of reproductive isolation, where something mm -hmm. separates two species to the point that they're not compatible anymore. That's separate. But maybe you can start thinking of examples where where this kind of falls apart, you know? 
there are sometimes distantly related species that can still interbreed and produce offspring. And sometimes they're like, yeah, sometimes they're not close at all. Um, a good example of this would be... Um, pilot whales can actually interbreed with dolphins, even though these are not close relatives. It's pretty crazy. They're called wolfins, the hybrids. A wolfin is an extremely rare cetacean hybrid born from the mating of a female common bottlenose dolphin with a male false killer whale. These are not sister taxa. So... Bottlenose dolphin. Common bottlenose dolphin. There you go. They are down here on the tree of life. There you go. And they are within this group. They are nested within dolphins. So, you know, they are 100% dolphins. So there they are right there. Common bottlenose dolphin. They can actually interbreed and produce offspring with false killer whales. Which are way over there. Nuts, right? These are not sister taxa. These are not sister... So yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if these are sterile or not. Um... Yeah. And wolfins have been bred in captivity and also been reported in the wild. Um, sometimes they die shortly after being born, but being found in the wild implies that they can survive for a good deal of time. So yeah. So clearly, bottlenose dolphins and false killer whales are not the same species, even though they can reproduce. Which is crazy, right? There's an even crazier one, though. Way, way, way crazier than that. Does anybody know what I'm going to mention here? <laughs> ah! Well, there's a different SciShow episode about it. Should we get into that real quick? The Sturtlefish. Holy cow, is this nuts. There's a reason you don't see hybrid animals like ligers running around very much. Not only are they separated by geography, but the genes of different species don't usually play well together. But recently, researchers in Hungary accidentally crossed two very different fish, the Russian sturgeon and the American paddlefish. Their Which research is was nuts. published in the journal. Nuts, nuts, nuts. Not just because these are geographically separated, but because they've got like... 400 million years of evolution separating them. Sturgeon and paddlefish diverged a long, long, long time ago. ...genes, documenting hybrid fish that, according to what we know, were not supposed to be possible. These scientists yeah. didn't set out to make a hybrid, though. They were originally trying to create sturgeon offspring that had only their mother's DNA through a process hmm. called gynogenesis. Usually, this process involves fertilizing egg cells with deactivated sperm cells from another species, making hmm. it possible for only the mother's genetic material to be passed on. In this experiment, the researchers crossed sturgeon eggs with paddlefish sperm because they thought it wouldn't create hybrid offspring. These fish are fairly distantly related, and until they are. now, nobody had been able to make a sturgeon paddlefish hybrid, and they'd tried. So, so here's the thing: they are very distantly related from one another. So let's jump to paddlefish right here, American paddlefish. Yeah, and hybridization is far more common among plants than vertebrates. Absolutely diagonal. Yeah, it's it's like a matter of course in plants. So there's the American paddlefish there. And sturgeon are over here. So sturgeons and paddlefishes do form a clade, but they diverged 184 million years ago. So depending on how you look at it, either there's 184 million years separating them, or I guess if you wanted to think about it this way, you could double that number because uh, they've each been evolving for that long. So they've been separated by 
what, 368 million years of evolution between the two of them? Pretty cool, right? Yeah. And yet, they were still able to produce offspring. That was finding number one. That's it crazy. Out, it is possible. Then the researchers got That's to insane. work analyzing the anatomy and genetics of the offspring. And what they looked like depended on what kind of chromosomes they inherited, or really huh. how many. See, at some point in evolution, this group of sturgeons acquired another two copies of their chromosomes, giving them four <laughs> copies of each chromosome, where paddlefish only have two. And in the So we call this genome and duplication, and Diagonal can tell you this is really, really common in plants to have the genomes duplicated like that. Usually it doesn't work super well for animals, but Sturgeon managed to do that somehow. So these two animals were able to reproduce with one another despite having at least 184 million years separating them and having totally different numbers of chromosomes. It's nuts. Chromosomes, giving them four copies of each chromosome where paddlefish only have two. And in the world yeah. of fish hybridization, when parents with mismatched sets of chromosomes reproduce, their offspring can inherit different numbers of sets. And sure wow. enough, the offspring in this experiment could be split into two different groups. Some were triploid, meaning they had two copies <laughs> of the sturgeon mom's chromosomes. That's crazy. And one copy from paddlefish dad. Uh, and A up ducks. America loses them forever. Thank you, thank you for subscribing with Prime there. I appreciate that. Thank you for the support. Appreciate you. For a total of three full sets. Or they were yeah. pentaploid with four sets from mom. And one there set. you go, Diagonal. Yeah. Now, that's yeah. a little strange because in birds, mammals, and reptiles, having more than two sets of chromosomes can lead to serious errors in cell division. And it's usually oh, yeah. fatal. It's more common in fish. It may have even been an advantage over their evolution, but only in even sets of chromosomes two, four, six, eight, and so on. Organisms with three. Who do we appreciate? Five... Polyploidy. Polyploidy. Go, go, go. For seven sets of chromosomes usually run into fertility problems. In this experiment, the number of sets of chromosomes in the hybrid offspring depended on what they inherited from their parents. The offspring huh. with three copies of their chromosomes look- Oh, these are so weird. It's like, it almost looks like some sort of garbage AI image or something, but like, but it's real. A, a paddlefish sturgeon hybrid with a really long rostrum on it like that, really long for a sturgeon looked like a pretty even split between sturgeon Weird. and paddlefish, while the Weird. offspring that got more sturgeon chromosome copies looked a little bit more sturgeon-y. That now, makes sense. These two fish weren't supposed to be able to reproduce. How'd they pull it off? Well, while these two families of fish split a long time ago, like 184 million years ago, the researchers think that their relatively slow rate of evolution means their genes and anatomy hadn't actually diverged that much. And Interesting. And then we get into like discussions of rate of evolution and stuff like that, which is really complicated in and of itself. Yeah. Um, anyway. And I'll give you a link and to the, the video, fact yeah. The sturgeon had four chromosome copies might have set up these two fish for increased chances of making successful babies. That's because past hmm. fish hybridization experiments have shown that when the mother has more chromosome copies than the father, the hybrid offspring have better odds of survival. So now the researchers are looking into filling up fish farms by making more of these sturgeon hybrids just on purpose this time. Another pretty wild. Here is a link to that video right there for you and uh so yeah yeah so the biological species concept that like if you can reproduce and that means you're the same species this doesn't always work you know yeah produce fertile offspring that means they belong to separate species the bsc yeah. hinges on the idea of reproductive isolation where something separates thank two you species to the point i appreciate you compatible anymore yeah. that separation could be time or geography or behavior or physiology alder and willow flycatchers used to be considered part of the same species because they meet up in the wild they look the same and it seems like they should be able to breed but ornithologists mm. eventually realized they're totally different species they sing different songs to attract different mates so alder flycatchers never try to mate with willow flycatchers and so this is an example of what we call sympatric speciation. So these guys are super closely related. They split really recently. Uh, or maybe they're still kind of, well, they probably did split entirely pretty recently. They're not still in the process of splitting. They've already done that because um, their DNA is different enough to distinguish them. But the reason they split is not because they were geographically isolated from each other. It's not like 
one of them ended up on a different continent than another, and that's why they split. No, they live in the same environment. They're neighbors. But they've got different mating habits, and so they split because of that. They're no longer passing genes back and forth. So that's why they had that split. Because um, I guess they have, like, different mating songs or something. Yeah. They sing different songs to attract different yep. mates. So alder flycatchers never try to mate with willow flycatchers. They're reproductively huh. isolated. So that's what we call sympatric speciation, when they're in the same spot. Sympatric, like, same. Allopatric speciation is where they're geographically separated from each other. And that's why they can't reproduce. Maybe there's a river that gets diverted and it cuts their habitat in half, or maybe a mountain range comes up and cleaves their the population in two, so they become two separate populations. That's allopatric speciation. Um, yeah, yeah. And Diagonal says peacock spiders have different mating dances. Same idea. So they live in the same in the same area, like their ranges overlap, and yet they've speciated because they have different mating dances. That's interesting, Diagonal. Yeah, that's just a cultural difference, says uh, Skage Well, I mean, a cultural difference, like different songs that birds sing, that starts off as just a cultural difference, and eventually it makes them split into different species if they're not sharing genes anymore, you know? Wild. A species is therefore basically a gene pool, one that doesn't overlap with the gene pools of other species. That's a good rigorous scientific definition. It can be tested and observed in the wild. But there are yep. lots of cases where it doesn't work, like with yeah. microorganisms. Or plants. Bacteria, for example, don't reproduce sexually. They can share genetic material with each other, but it's not part of the reproductive process. So reproductive <laughs> isolation is totally irrelevant, and a scientist looking to classify a new species of bacteria can't rely on the BSC. Instead, the biological species concept. Ed, they might look at genetics, at the shape of the microorganisms and the way they grow, and at their evolutionary relationships. They go to different to party organisms. bars. There you go. You also yeah. can't use the BSC to classify yeah. fossils, since you can't exactly observe the mating behavior of a skeleton preserved in rock. So Unless it does happen, extremely rarely, but um. Like at Messel. This fossil site in Germany, there are, I think, a few different examples of turtles being caught in the act of mating. They died while mating. So you can say, oh yeah, well shoot, these are the same species then. But usually with fossils, you can't observe them mating, and so you can't tell who's mating with whom and what species they are. Sometimes you get unbelievably yeah. lucky and two specimens are preserved while they're that's mating. That's interesting. That's way too rare to be definitive Sunfish. about which animals mated with which other ones. That's why paleontologists huh. usually use morphology or the physical characteristics of a creature to classify it. Then there's... We were talking about this earlier. We had a chatter asking about, do you ever use morphology for determining what's the same species and that sort of thing and how to, you know, uh, how to classify living things. We use morphology if we don't have genes. So like for fossils, it's a good then example. Then there's the issue of hybrids, where creatures that should be part of separate species mate. When two species hybridize, there are a number of things that can happen. Often, even if they produce offspring, the offspring are sterile. That's what happens when you cross a female horse and a male donkey, for example. The yep. offspring are mules, and mules can't breed. But Although, apparently, there have actually been a few observed cases of mules that are not sterile. So, whatever's going wrong to make them sterile, sometimes that doesn't happen. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes, two species can produce fertile offspring, and biologists have found that animal species hybridize way more often than we used to think. If the offspring hmm. go on to mate with their parental species, it's called introgression. It provides a means huh. for gene flow between two species, meaning their gene pools aren't totally isolated. So, does that okay. mean that you have to revoke their status as separate species? Scientists haven't settled that question <laughs> yet, but some think the barriers between species are much leakier than the biological species concept allows. Sometimes yep. this leakiness can lead to two groups being classified as subspecies within a single species. Subspecies give you a little wiggle room. Sometimes organisms overlap geographically and can share genes. In cases like these, subspecies means we know that they can share genes. It's just that they usually don't. Then Interesting. Sculpin says, rarely a few mules can breed. Ah. And Harass says, so question, can humans evolve and split in the future? I guess globalization prevents us. I mean, yeah, when you had different groups of humans that were reproductively isolated from one another, I guess with enough time, maybe a few million years, we 
maybe it would have been possible to get to a point where, you know, uh, trying to reproduce again after people have continued changing would no longer be possible. So you would end up with, like, different human species. But humans are kind of a weird case in this because we are not genetically diverse. We are very genetically homogenous for the most part. Um, in the early history of, of humanity, there seems to have been a big bottleneck genetically. So, like, you know, I might look very different from somebody, uh, you know, of, like, Aboriginal Australian descent. But we are very similar genetically to one another. Because, you know, the ancestral humans, like, there was a pretty small population. So there's not much genetic diversity at all among all human beings today. In fact, I've heard it said before that there is more genetic diversity in a single troop of chimpanzees than there is, you know, across all of humanity. Uh, let me look this up real quick so I can verify. It's the thing I've heard a million times, but I want to make sure that this has got something backing it up. Um... Uh, and in all of humanity, um, there we go. Yeah, from Science Daily. Nearby chimpanzee populations show much greater genetic diversity than distant human populations. Chimpanzee populations living in relatively close proximity are substantially more different genetically than humans living on different continents, according to a new study. Studies suggest that genetics can provide a valuable new tool for use in chimpanzee conservation, with the potential to identify the population origin of an individual chimpanzee or the provenance of a sample of bushmeat. Oof. Bushmeat. Ugh. Um. Yeah. Here, let me give you a link to this. There you go. Yeah. Um, and Skewen says that could be possible if humanity spreads from the Earth? I guess. Yeah. I'm sure there are science fiction novels about that already in existence, about like, you know, um, you know, like Martian humans being different, you know, once humans if and when humans make it to Mars. I'll say if, actually. I still don't know why people would want to live on Mars. It might be nice to visit, but why in the world would you want to live there? Um, anyway, uh, there's probably already, like, science fiction novels about that, about, like, population splitting, and then you get, like, morphological differences to the point where humanity, like, speciates. But yeah, yeah... And Charcon says, it's crazy to me because all humans look different, but I couldn't tell the difference between one chimp to another. You know, chimps probably think we all look the same, too. But they can identify other chimps, Charcon. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, also, I guess the kind of the point is that, like, our differences are only skin deep as human beings. With chimps, they're genetic differences. Yeah. There are ring species. In oh, ring species example, are wild. There's a species of salamander. This is super cool, and it kind of challenges the whole idea of different species. Oh, man, this is one of my favorite concepts. This is really, really cool. ...that lives in overlapping populations of subspecies on either side of the San Joaquin Valley in a big, yeah. elongated ring. Those subspecies can all interbreed, except for two. At the southern part of the ring, <laughs> two subspecies can't interbreed. So, so, yeah, I mean, look at this diagram again. That's where the two subspecies can no longer interbreed with one another. And this is because salamanders, um, I think these guys like to live in, in uh, you know, kind of like wet areas in, you know, mountain streams and creeks and like, you know, little waterways up in the hills in the Central Valley, which tends to be very hot and relatively dry, although you get marshland and stuff too. It's just not suitable habitat for them. So they can live all around it in a ring, but they can't live in it. And yet you get this variation across there like this. So green can interbreed with yellow. Yellow can interbreed with red. Red can interbreed with pink. Pink can interbreed with purple, but purple cannot interbreed with green. 
It goes all the way around, and then by the time you get to the end, they're just too different. So at what point do you call them different species? San Joaquin you know? Valley in a big elongated yeah. ring. Those subspecies can all interbreed except for two. At the southern part of the ring, two subspecies can't interbreed. So according to the BSC, those two subspecies should actually be separate species. But even though they can't interbreed, genes can still flow between them through the other subspecies. Where really wild, that? right? You can't answer that question with the BSC. So having a hard and fast definition of species that you can test and demonstrate is useful, like in conservation when you're looking to protect a species and its habitat, but the biological yep. species concept isn't an absolute rule that scientists are bound to. It's a tool, and scientists try to select the best tool for the job. That might be the BSC, and it might not. It depends on what you're studying. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Here is a link to that video. There you go. And yep, that's the ring species concept. Or the that's a ring species there, Kennedy. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we have gotten a long way from sawfishes here, but how did we even get into talking about this? I guess we were talking about extinct species of sawfish. Or sawfish uh relatives. Like the saw skates. Yeah. But anyway, sawfish extraordinary animals and uh, I've got a couple more videos about them. Are there any other ring species? There definitely are little pink pony, yeah. I'd guess a lot of... Oh, I'm not sure who else. Let's look that up. Or if you're really fascinated by ring species, we could watch another video on them. If I can find one. Yeah. Um... Well, maybe we'll watch this one about the salamanders again. I guess this is kind of your classic example. We'll see if they mention any others. The oh, this is cool. The forests of Northern California can be perilous. <laughs> Having a dangerous reputation can mean the difference between life and death. Hmm. Even if that reputation is, well, not exactly true. <laughs> the yellow-eyed Encetina salamander happens to look a lot like its very toxic neighbor, the California newt. Oh. So predators think twice before chowing down. <laughs> when threatened, the Encetina even tries posing like a newt, flashing bright warning colors on its belly. Very cool. But this Encetina is a phony. It's So this is mimicry like we were talking about earlier. Oh, man, it's come full circle, hasn't it? There you go, Kennedy. Yeah, that's a mimic. Very, very cool. See how these concepts come up again and again when you're studying uh, the evolution of life on Earth? It's pretty neat. Pretty neat. Not poisonous like the character it pretends to be. Hundreds of miles away in the mountains, you'll find one of its many relatives, the Sierra Nevada and Satina. Huh. It uses a completely different defense. Disruptive patterning. Ah, Patches camouflage. High contrast colors make it harder for a predator to figure out where the Encetina's body ends and where the forest floor begins. Yep. These two very different looking Encetinas are actually members of the same species. <laughs> that means they can and do mate and have offspring in places where their ranges overlap. Cool. And they aren't the only two branches of this eclectic family tree. <laughs> Encetinas are part of a sprawling clan of salamanders, separated Pretty cool. and shaped by place and time, evolving different ways to avoid predators. Scientists think millions of years ago, ancestors of our yellow-eyed friend began moving down the west coast of North America. <laughs> Their newt disguise became more convincing with each generation. The more they looked like poisonous newts, the better they fared. Yep. For our spotted pal, its ancestors took a different path, inland, along the forest floors of the Sierra Nevada mountains. They passed splotches that helped them survive from generation to generation. Still, other types of Encetinas developed more subtle patterning, which helped them blend in with their surroundings. Surprisingly, 
this motley crew can all have fertile offspring with one another. We've oh. got an amazing 70 million year old dinosaur egg. And they're perfectly preserved. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> oh no. Ikawala. Thank you for the 20 months of support there. That's a long time, Ikawala. Thank you for keeping me online for uh, it's almost a whole year, isn't it? Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get back to our our salamander ring species friends but here. Two members of this family, yeah. the large blotched Encetina and the Monterey Encetina, rarely mate and have offspring in places where their ranges overlap. Hmm. Researchers think over millions of years, as the Encetinas branched and spread south, they diverged a little too much. Now some <laughs> combination of behavior, where they like to live, and genetics is molding them into two separate species. Encetina salamanders are an example of a ring species. There you an go. An animal that yeah. spread and adapted around a geographic barrier. In this case, the dry California Central Valley. Mm -hmm. only to come back together millions of years later as near strangers. <laughs> Over this stretch of time, Encetinas have continued to adapt to the places and predators where they've spread. But during that long journey, the branches of the family tree went separate ways. Pretty cool. Typically, the in-between versions of species fizzle out long before we can observe them. But with a ring species like the Encetina, we get to see the steps it takes to become a new species. <laughs> it's evolution in action. Oh yeah, a baby. A rare glimpse of how one species becomes many. Pretty cool. Neat stuff. I'll give you a link. Do you need more? Yeah. Give you a link to that video right there. Kennedy says, important question, can Vulcans and Romulans mate? I don't, I don't know. Are they, do they share a recent common ancestor? Because if they don't, then most likely no, they can't. They do share a recent common ancestor, says Jody Fish. Well. Yeah, that, uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why I never really got into Star Trek that much, is because as someone who is intensely interested in biology, I feel like any time they bring up biology on Star Trek, it's always like, ooh, boy, what do they think? What? This is completely wrong. Um, I don't know. But like, having humans and Vulcans being able to interbreed? Like, they evolved on entirely different planets. Like, it makes zero sense at all. You know? It would be like, I don't know, like a sawfish being able to interbreed and produce offspring with an ant or something like that, you know? Like, and those are both animals that evolved on the same planet. It would be like a sawfish being able to produce offspring with, I don't know, a magnolia tree. So yeah, yeah. Um... So anyway, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense at all. And it's like the writers from Star Trek did not understand biology at all. Um, yeah, no, and I'm, Star Trek is fun and I, you know, yeah, I don't mean to be ragging on Star Trek. And some of my favorite people are big Star Trek aficionados. And, uh, shoot, Jim Kirkland, um whom I worked with for the past couple summers. He actually wrote a Star Trek novel, and... Where did I put that? I forgot to get him to sign it this summer. Or to really talk about it. But, uh... Here you go. Star Trek First Frontier was written by dinosaur paleontologist... Dr. James Ian Kirkland. And Diane Carey was kind of his, like, ghostwriter for that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. 
Yeah. Anywho. Um. Yeah. Uh, Pendrick says crosses between all those are canon on the show. What are you gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> it uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's okay. So my friends are Star Treks. There you go, Tommy Flaticus. Yeah. And hey, Ken, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here, Ken. A very happy International Sawfish Day to you. We are talking about these remarkable creatures. Sawfish, which are, uh... I think some of the coolest critters currently swimming around our oceans and estuaries and rivers. Uh, so here's... A smaller-than-life-size sawfish. I guess even a, like, a baby sawfish would be bigger than this right here. Um, and then I have 3D printed the full body of a 20 foot long sawfish right here, but, um, but I, I can't show you the whole thing for reasons. I'm just kidding. I didn't print it. I, yeah, just printed this. The rostrum of a, like, I guess this one would be something like 15 feet long. Was it 3.85 meters? We'll say a 17-foot sawfish, because why not? Anyway, remarkable animals. Let's get back to our uh, our sawfish discussion, shall we? There we go. Um, where did that go? Well, we haven't watched the International Sawfish Day... Uh, here we go. From SeaWorld Orlando. Julie, and I'm an Aquarius here at SeaWorld Orlando. I'm here today to talk to some of our ambassadors about our sawfish in support of International Sawfish Day. Yeah, International Sawfish Day. False. Sawfish are actually fish. What do you think? Chat, are sawfish considered fish? Yes or no? Hmm. You know, test your knowledge a little bit. Dex Phantom says no. Jody Fish says no. Hmm. Patrick Crusader says yes. Freelancer says yes. <laughs> Anakin Gabriel has preempted my joke I was going to make. They are not fish, they are actually saws. <laughs> uh, the correct answer is... I mean, yes, because they're a kind of ray, which is a kind of fish. But, uh, yeah, but strictly speaking, I am also a fish, and so are all of you watching. Uh, because Sarcopterygian fishes are what gave rise to tetrapods land living vertebrate animals etc so they they are fish but they're not bony fish i think when most people use the word fish what they're referring to is actinopterygian fish so let's see i guess fish is actually Wait, where the, where is this taking us? I typed in vertebrata. Where is it? <laughs> well, it serves me right. Vertebrata apparently is a genus of something with no common name. Vertebrata ionosa? Lanosa? Huh? Is this a kind of sponge? Is there a kind of sponge that's genus whose genus name is vertebrata? These all have no common name. What are these? This has really thrown me for a loop here. Are these different kinds of plants? 
Tylus truncatus. It's a kind of red algae. So there's a kind of red algae whose genus name is Vertebrata. That's wild. Uh, uh. So what I was trying to show you is vertebrates. <laughs> Thank red algae. Thank you, Diagonal. Yes. That's really funny. Um, anyway, vertebrates. I guess if we're talking about fishes, to me, vertebrata is synonymous with fishes. All of these animals are fishes. Because they all evolved from a fishy ancestor. Your jawed vertebrates here. Nathostomes. Fishes. Bony vertebrates. But I guess when most people hear the word fish, they're thinking of ray-finned fishes. So no, sawfish are not ray-finned fishes. They're not actinopterygians. But they are fish in the same way that all vertebrate animals are. Yeah. False. Sawfish are fish. We'll see. Yeah! <laughs> Sawfish are indeed fish. They're they are. one of the largest species of fish and can get up to 23 feet long. That's actually, well, one of the largest species of aquatic fish. <laughs> well, but that would also include whales if we're... Uh, ah, these things are difficult to explain sometimes. Um... One of the largest species of non-tetrapod fish. Yeah. Saw Question two. Are most closely related to sharks. Ooh, what do you think, chat? Are they most closely related to sharks? Hmm. Jody Fish says no. Dex Phantom Hawk says no. Not most closely related to sharks. Grim Deviant says no. Yes, ish, says Ariathalia. Interesting. Seahorses Forever says yes. Oh, I, I said most closely related, but the question is are they closely related to sharks? Well, that's subjective. They are more closely related to rays and guitarfish, I think, than they are to sharks. But they're also kind of close to sharks. They're both chondrichthian fishes, so... This should have been worded in a different way. I think I actually know this. I think it's false, because I'm pretty confident I remember it's stingrays. Yep. It's actually false! <laughs> the sawfish have the tail end of a shark, but they actually have their gills and their mouth underneath their body, which is exactly yep. how the stingray is built. Yep, this is true, and this is one of the ways that you can tell, you know, sometimes morphology is really, really helpful like that. Where, if you look at the sawfish model here, yeah, you turn that over, and they, just like a stingray, or any other kind of batoid, they've got the gills underneath, the mouth underneath, those, I don't think those are nostrils, those are spiracles or something, aren't they? I've been calling them nostrils. Ontogeny. But anyway. Yeah, and what about their ontogeny? They're not like flounders where they where they go flat through ontogeny. No, they're born like this. In fact, they're born looking like a miniature version of the adults. They give birth to live young. Sawfish. Um so yeah, yeah. Let's continue. So they are actually most closely related to stingrays. And Thagomizmer says, at what point do you stop being related to another creature? That's a good question. Close close relatives means that you share a, a recent common ancestor. But, like, how recent? It kind of depends on who you ask. But when we say that, that these are not closely related to sharks, well, what we're talking about here is... Uh, jump to uh to sawfishes up there yeah i guess that means that they're more closely related to other creatures like for instance guitar fish rays stingrays etc does that make sense so in order to get to sharks 
You to go, got to go further up here, past the skates and the guitar fish, and then uh, yeah. See, raised skates and sawfish, they form a clade with these other critters. They are close related, closely related to them. They're more distantly related to sharks. See, sharks are over here, but they're closer to sharks than they are to, I don't know, trout or something. Way closer to sharks than they are to trout. So it's all relative, you know? Yeah. Um, anyway. And yeah, didn't the model come out really cool? Totally tubular? Pretty happy with that. So let's continue. A saw Question number three. Or saw is used for A, defense, B, trimming underwater hedges, C, detecting prey and feeding, D, dueling with other sawfish. Ooh. All right. Which one of those do you think it is, chat? So, is it used for? Uh, let's just play it one more time. A, defense. B, defense. Trimming underwater hedges. Trimming hedges. C, detecting prey. Detecting prey and feeding. D, dueling. Or dueling. What do you think? Hmm. Actually, it's A and C, says Kennedy. Well, let's see. I'm gonna go with dueling because that sounds like the best. The correct answer is A and C: defense and detecting prey and feeding. There you go. A ding, ding, ding. Yeah, very nice, very nice. And look at look at how they use that. That's so cool that they have footage of this right here. Um, really neat. So that's an, a previously dead fish, I think. I don't think that's a live fish right there. It's just kind of drifting there on the bottom of watch. Prey and feeding. The no, 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 no. for defense and is packed with receptors that help them find prey <laughs> in soft sediment. They also yeah. use it to hit and stun fish to help them get their next meal. Well, and they'll use it as, you know, they'll accidentally get you with it if they're defending themselves, I guess. Or like they'll they'll maybe swing it at you if you're trying to hurt them. So they can use it for defense also. Oh wait, was defense C? If it was, then great. Reganation, holy cow! Holy cow, Reganation! Reganation Thank you for those five gift subs there. Gift subs. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Reganation. Good stuff. Thank you very, very much. There's now five more people. They won't have to worry about ads at all for the next thirty days, thanks to you, Reganation. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you kindly for that uh, that offering of support. It means a lot to me. It really does, Regulation. Thank you, thank you. It's because of that kind of support that I can continue to, you know, bring you information about these remarkable creatures. Let's continue. Here we go. You're fishing. Question four. You have caught a sawfish. What do you do? A, be amazed and excited. B, okay. keep the animal in the water and take pictures. C, cut the line as close to the hook as possible. D, report the encounter to the International Sawfish Encounter Database and Florida Fish and Wildlife. First, let me take a selfie. Cutting the line as close would make sense. And then... And the music is loud in this video. It would make sense. It's actually all of the above. So you can be amazed and excited because seeing one is awesome. Yeah. You can take pictures because if you report it, they will ask for the pictures. And then you cut the line as close to the hook as possible. I wish we had closed captions for this. As long as you report it, that tells the researchers where they've been seen. Yeah. Oh, 95% decline. And what was that? The estimate, estimated population around U.S. waters may be around 270 to 500 or so individuals. That's so low. Holy cow. I've had more people than that just watching this stream at one time. That's nuts. Oh, man. Well, shoot. Let's, uh... Let's talk about celebrating International Sawfish Day, and let's talk about their conservation. I'll tell you another way. And Maelstrom Doll. Holy cow. About oh, yeah. A million years ago. 
or 18 months ago. You're not gruesome, Maelstrom Doll. Thank you. Thank you for the 18 months of support. Thanks for keeping me online for that long. That's pretty extraordinary, and I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah! Really spectacular. Spared no expense. And Kitefish. Kitefish. Thank you very, very much for that gift sub there. I appreciate that, Kitefish. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And Ninja Duck is a happy viewer there. I'm glad you got that from Kitefish. Thank you, Kitefish. Good stuff. Yeah. So the... Yeah, there we go. Five species of sawfish in the world. They are all either endangered or critically endangered. Yeah. What can you do to celebrate? You can do a live stream like this. You can print some sawfish. Or we can go to the Sawfish Conservation Society. And these are resources that I would recommend. Good stuff. Yeah. We've got coloring sheets too. Very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. So internationalsawfishday.org, yes, that is a website, and I'm sharing it with you right now. October 17th, 2023. Yeah. Looks like they they don't have like a 20 well posters oh that's pretty cool yeah oh man Oof. so someone who's asking why these creatures are in decline well tangled in fishing that's probably the number one thing that happens to them this big rostrum that gets stuck inside of nets, and that is... It's pretty much a death sentence for these animals. They're often hunted for trophies trophies as well. A rostrum can sell for more than $1,000 on illegal markets. I've seen them on eBay for like $3,000. Uh, or not eBay, it was some other website like that. But you can find them online. They like... I saw one for like $6,000. They're sometimes killed for shark fin soup. Ugh. Yeah, and wiped out by habitat pollution and habitat destruction. Um, by development of their habitats, wiping out mangrove forests um, and estuaries like that where these animals, you know, raise their young. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to make a big deal about International Sawfish Day, I think, next year. Maybe we can interview some researchers and stuff. Yeah. Um, but the Sawfish Conservation Society, this is the other website that I wanted to share with you. There you go in the chat. October 17th. Yeah. Oh, and they've got shirts? Shoot, I should have gotten a shirt. That's really cool. Um, very cool. Very, very nice. From the Sawfish Conservation Society. So, International Sawfish Day. Find an event, host an event. 
you can take a survey, you can download a poster, all this other good stuff. They've got brochures. If you're an educator yourself, this, there's some good resources here. There's some good resources here. And... Oh, yeah. Uh, they've got a link at the bottom. Where was that? Yeah. You can report a sawfish here. They've got advice on what to do if you encounter one in the wild. They've got links for who to call no matter where you are in the world. You can help contribute to the study and hence the conservation of these animals. Yeah. Uh, if caught on a fishing line, use long-handled tools to cut your line from large sawfish. For smaller sawfish, you can try to remove the hook if it is caught in the mouth, but do not attempt this by hand with a large sawfish. Do not remove the hook if it is swallowed. If necessary, just cut your line close to the hook. Um... Yeah, and we've got ID guides for different sawfish. Yeah, I can identify the rostrum that I printed. Yeah, but also, this goes for any museum people who are here. You can actually contribute to sawfish research like this. Here, I'm going to run to the bathroom real quick. I'll be right back. Welcome to the CSAW Citizen Science Sawfish Project. In this project, scientists are asking for you to measure, photograph, and record any sawfish saws that you may have. Researchers are exploring the differences between sawfish saws from throughout the world to better understand the five species of sawfish, which are at a high risk of becoming extinct. For this project, Researchers have to measure a large number of saws, and they have asked us at the Sawfish Conservation Society to reach out to you to help them with this important task. Although we would like you to report any saws that you already have, we do not want anyone to remove these from live sawfish, as the sawfish need these to hunt and protect themselves. We also ask that you do not measure saws from live sawfish, as it can be dangerous to you and to the sawfish. You are going to need a few things to get started. These include your sawfish saw, your data sheet, or the online form, both of which can be found at the SES website, your measuring tool, and your camera. Now let us get familiar with the saw and the measurements you are going to need to take. Place the saw in front of you with the darker side facing up. This is the top of the saw. Now go ahead and please count the number of teeth on the left and right side of the saw, and make sure to include broken and missing teeth as well. Next, measure the standard saw width. Starting at the rear base of the first left tooth, measure straight across to the other side of the saw. Now please measure the standard saw length. To do Pretty this, cool. measure from the tip of the saw to the midpoint of the saw, just next to the rear base of the first left tooth. So if you want to do some citizen science, this Finally, is the way to do it. measure the tip width. Starting at the rear base of the last left tooth, measure straight across to the other side of the saw. So you might be thinking like, well, how in the, how would I ever encounter a sawfish rostrum like this? Well, you might be surprised. There are, I've seen a bunch of sawfish rostra in, well, in museum collections. I've seen some at zoos. I've seen some in curiosity shops before. Um, I've even seen some in bars before, like, I've seen at least two different sawfish rostra inside of tiki bars. Bait shops, says Sculpin. Yeah, like uh, like uh, Jeremy Wade showed us in River Monsters. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, Neon Coffee Cat says, that's my university. Very cool, Neon Coffee Cat. Very cool. Yeah. And thank you, Lenina, for redeeming Rebeccasaurus from Matt M33. Good stuff, good stuff. Uh, maybe we'll do that tomorrow, Lenina. I think that's great. So yeah, yeah. There are sawfish rostra all over the place. And you un you encounter them in unexpected places sometimes. So, yeah. Now prepare to take a picture of your saw by placing the saw on the ground in front of you with a darker top side facing up. Hmm. Also, place the tool you use to measure the saw along with a small piece of paper next to the saw. On the paper, write down the ID number of the saw. 
if your stall already has an ID number, which will be the case if it came from a museum, then please mm -hmm. use that number. Otherwise, huh. if it does not have an ID number, then please use saw one for the first saw you measure, saw two for the second, and so on and so forth. Hmm. Now, take an overhead photo of everything that you put on the ground, making sure that saw is directly below you. Once you've collected all your information, you can submit your data and photograph to the SCS through our website or by email. Pretty In addition cool. to your measurements, we also ask for other information, such as your email address. All information is optional, but is important to researchers. Unless required by law, your personal information will be kept confidential and will only be used to contact you if researchers need further information. For further details about this project, please visit the SCS website at www.sawfishconservationsociety.org. Pretty cool. If you have any Pretty questions, cool. feel free to email us at sawfishconservationsociety at gmail.com or join our Facebook group. Neat. Thank you for helping us to better understand these rare fishes and make sure to check out the SES website for updates on this project. Anyway, good stuff. Um, and here's a link to that video right there. Yeah. And let me subscribe. I have not subscribed to the Sawfish Conservation Society yet. How many videos do they have? Okay, cool. You can even make a paper sawfish if this is the sort of thing that you're interested in. If you've got kids at home who might be interested in this. Oh, pretty neat. Oh, very cool. That's actually pretty darn nifty. A little simple paper craft sawfish. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. Of course, I didn't have to do that. Got something a bit more advanced here, but uh, yeah, if you don't have a 3D printer at home and you want your very own sawfish up on the wall, don't go purchasing a rostrum off of eBay or something like that. Make a paper one. Very cool. Yeah. And you want to make one? Well, here is a link to that video right there in the chat for you. Yeah. Uh, third all says, I have never seen this fish. Well, let's pull up another quick video on sawfish. There we go. Check this out. Looks like a shark with a hedge trimmer for a nose. Uh, we watched this video earlier, didn't we? But let's watch it one more time, and then I'll show you a couple more things. You can't confuse it for very much out there in the ocean. Let me put it to you that way. My name's Greg Palakis. I spend most of my time working on the small two sawfish and endangered species that we have here in, in our estuary. Do we see them in another video too? Or am I just having deja vu? Greg and his we team are this on video a tagging earlier. mission. They've worked with babies before, but today they want to go big. The goal for the day is going to be to to catch five, six, seven, eight foot, you know, a meter and a half to you know, three meter sawfish and uh, put a variety of tags on them so we can see where they go. Our hypothesis is that they hang around in the estuary for a small amount of time, maybe move, start to move south toward the Florida Keys. And then Pretty once cool. they're mature, they would come back here in every other year pattern to give birth in our nurseries. No one ever studied these animals. Uh, so the first couple of years, we spent a lot of time uh, learning about Swimming the, the smallest That's so neat. juveniles. So, but when they get to be a little bit bigger, you know, we, uh, you know, they change habitats. They start to move toward open water, and we want to learn more about that uh, part of the life history. Anytime we catch. And a now, how are you doing? Welcome, day. welcome. These things are Good to have you so, here. You know, anytime we can catch one, any more than that is bonus. Yeah, what a remarkable Sawfish creature. Are, you know, one of the coolest animals on the planet. They're really a, an example of successful evolution to me. You don't have a long snout like that that has teeth on it by accident. Sawfish nope. are one of the top predators Definitely in the system. They use the saw to feed. They swing back and forth really fast in schools of fish, and then they come back and eat whatever was injured. Uh, yep. They can also use it to defend themselves. They're raised, <laughs> so they hang out on the bottom for a, a, a lot, and they, uh, you know, they don't move. Yeah, <laughs> with the shark. Aburate. <laughs> uh, 
themselves. <laughs> They're raised, so they hang out on the bottom for a, a lot, and they, uh, you know, they don't move too, too much. They're able to pump water over their gills so they can they stay still for long periods of time. The reason they're endangered is, is the main reason uh, is yeah. because of bycatch, Nets. you know, fisheries bycatch. Because they have this, um, you know, this, this saw, this rostrum um, with the teeth on it, if they even think about getting near a net of any kind, they get caught really, really easy. Yeah. Greg wants to know where the sawfish go so that those habitats can be protected. Bull shark persuader. So people fishing in those areas can be taught what to do if they encounter a sawfish. There you go, I freed, yeah. We've caught a couple recently here, and uh, we're hoping to have some luck today. Greg's not the only one. The state of Florida has an app that's good for reporting any wildlife, and sawfish are one of them. We oh, cool. We get a handful of reports from around this, this area. We're at five, six. We'll use a depth finder. So we're kind of targeting this uh, this deeper hole here at the entrance to Tarpon Bay. So we're looking at, you know, between four and seven meters of water is where we want to drop these. Yep. We were talking about this earlier. And there we go. Even though sawfish are docile, Greg still has to be careful of those chompers. But once we get it to shallow water, and uh, usually we use welding gloves and we hold those teeth, and the sawfish <laughs> is secure so that it's safe and we're safe. We wear the. It's always really cool, actually, to see like the tools that different scientists use to do their work that were not designed because there are not enough, you know, sawfish researchers in the world. I think to uh, for there really to be a market for companies to make sawfish proof gloves so they use welding gloves it's like how we in you know in paleontology use various tools um you know like awls for uh for digging fossils um because there are not like purpose-built tools for this there's not enough of this in the world so it's always really cool to like see different like hacks that scientists have pulled together different tools that can be uh exapted for different tasks if you will yeah Welding gloves because they have those teeth obviously we need to be really careful Welding gloves. those fish are pretty strong side to side so they can swing that thing and be just fine we spend a lot of time we use a variety of tags we've kind of been thinking as a recovery team that it would be uh decades before they would be to the point we could take them off the list but you know they're showing signs some signs of recovery and and we're optimistic that maybe in our lifetimes they would be uh, at least downgraded maybe to threatened or something like that, that i agree be... kennedy gillnut should be out loud everywhere yeah and he did mention that there's an app that you can download if you live in Florida for reporting all different kinds of wildlife. Hopefully any Floridians in chat already know about that because I don't actually know what it's called. Maybe I can look it up. Um, yeah. Uh, the FWC Wildlife Alert. Yeah, there we go. Fish and Wildlife something releases new app to report fish, comma, wildlife sightings. There you go. I'm sure you can find it through this link. But I wanted to talk to you about a different app also. Um, I know many people here in chat probably eat seafood on occasion. And there is, there is a way to be responsible about your seafood consumption so that you're not going and paying for seafood that was harvested in a really environmentally harmful way or unethical way. You know, maybe fishermen are using gill nuts and that's killing beautiful animals like sawfish. You want to be as, you know... You don't want your consumption habits to be driving these creatures further toward extinction. So, the Seafood Watch app for the Monterey Bay Aquarium here in coastal California. Um, this is a great thing to have on your phone if you're a seafood aficionado. Maybe you know about this already if you are into seafood, but we've got people in chat who I'm sure are already very familiar with this. 
people are going to eat lots of seafood. They're going to eat more seafood going into the future. And if we're going to protect the oceans, we've got to be as sustainable as we can. And the people that Seafood Watch has recruited have a really good feel for how the business has to work and understanding how markets work, but still having that environmental ethos is kind of unique. See, somebody like me who gets grouchy about these things might be like, you know, shoot, if I were president of the world, I'd be like, nope, no more seafood. <laughs> you can't have it anymore. I've shown you can't handle it, world. But maybe that's not the most realistic approach. So something like the Seafood Watch app and Seafood Watch as an organization, they're trying to actually work with people who make their living through, you know, harvesting creatures from the sea. Part of the reason why the Seafood Watch standard is so credible is because they have such a strong scientific background. The Seafood Watch team really gets out there and understands the fisheries and the aquaculture that they're assessing. We don't just look at expertise from the United States. We really go into the regions where the seafood's being produced, the regions that are importing the most seafood. We really want to understand the realities of what's going on out there. <laughs> no more fish. This really is President of Earth Daily. Yes, Dr. Irving. In developing countries, <laughs> in data poor situations. I think in general, the credibility that Seafood Watch brings to us as a company in our sourcing is amazing. And it's really good to know that what you put into your products comes from sustainable sources. This is but not some sort of greenwashing nonsense. This is really to use markets to drive change. This is real here. We are at a really critical point where we can really affect change on the water and have healthy oceans for future generations. So the app, um, 12 years ago, holy cow, I'm sure this is, it's it gotten better by leaps and bounds in the 12 years since this video went up. Holy cow. The Monterey Bay Aquarium is literally putting sustainable seafood on the map. Project Fish Map, a new feature of the Aquarium Seafood Watch iPhone app, lets people across the United States tag restaurants and stores where they find ocean-friendly seafood and learn where others have found sustainable seafood. We want you to know that you can find ocean-friendly seafood no matter where you live or travel. With Project Fish Map, anyone who finds sustainable seafood can share their discoveries. Here's how it works. Once you download cool. the free Seafood Watch app, use Project This may have changed by now, but uh the best choice and good yeah. alternative seafood items you find at your favorite restaurant or market. Oh, cool. We can't do it without you. It's a real community endeavor. With each item you add, you're helping others find sustainable seafood wherever they go. And we're trying to make it fun by giving you badges for using Project Fish Map. Ooh, they're gamifying it. Well, this is advanced stuff for like 12 years ago. Holy cow. This, by the way, is the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which people were talking about Star Trek earlier. Um, part of Star Trek IV Revenge of the Whales was actually filmed at the Monterey Bay Aquarium in Monterey, California. Um through some movie magic they tried to make it look like it was in marin california but it's in monterey california um anyway yeah our ocean is in trouble fisheries across the globe are rapidly declining due to unsustainable fishing practices and many sea creatures will disappear in our lifetime the question is Let's make what sure can it's you not do sawfish yeah the answer you can do a lot jackie is at our local store and she's shopping for dinner she wants to buy fish because it's a healthy option, but she wants to make sure it's sustainable. In the ocean, fish populations are declining, but our demand for seafood continues to grow. Yeah. We take more than a half a billion pounds of seafood out of the ocean each day. It's not just that we're taking too many fish out of the sea, there are also problems with how we fish. Turtles. Some boats drag yeah. fishing gear across the seafloor, damaging sensitive habitats like corals and others use nets and hooks and accidentally kill species like seabirds, seals, and turtles. And sawfish. This is like the number one threat to sawfish, and it's why all five living species of sawfish are currently endangered, uh, or critically endangered. It's mostly due to bycatch and by things like gill nets. And so if you want to actually... 
make give these creatures a fighting chance at survival, we got to change our ways here. You know? As wild fish numbers have declined across the globe, fish farming or aquaculture has become more and more popular. Just like we raise cows and chickens, we also raise fish. Over half the fish we eat actually comes from a farm. Hmm. Fish farming can be great, but it isn't perfect. Chemicals and waste from fish farms can pollute nearby habitats, and diseases from fish farms can spread to nearby wild fish. So given all these problems, what should Jackie buy? The good news That's is that there are ways yeah. to farm and catch fish that are environmentally responsible. And the moderate Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you could just not eat fish. <laughs> like, I don't. I'm not trying to push the idea of eating fish or any other kind of marine creature here. But if you're going to eat fish or any other kind of marine creature, you know, be it you know, whatever... Here's a good way to do it and to, to try and be responsible about it. Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch program can help you know which seafood to buy and where to find it. Seafood Watch has a team of scientists who evaluate the environmental impacts of fishing and farming so that you know which seafood to buy and which to avoid. We also partner with fishermen and farmers to improve their practices and with businesses to help them buy better seafood. Whether you're a health conscious shopper, a chef, a small business owner, or a large corporation, you can help protect fish and other ocean animals. Join the more than 60 million people who are using the Seafood Watch recommendations. To learn more about the Seafood Watch program and how to get involved, please visit seafoodwatch.org. So yeah, there you go. Good stuff. Now it says just don't buy gas station sushi. I think that's probably sound advice all the way around. Um, yeah. You know, if you're trying to avoid getting sick, that's probably sound advice. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a snob about gas station food. But, I don't know. If you're in the middle of Kansas and you're getting gas station sushi, I don't know. There were sushi restaurants in Bozeman, Montana. I'm like, why? What? Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anywho. Oh. It's Nano. Oh, the U is supposed to be flipped. I will remember that, Nano. Sorry. I've been calling you Nowo for forever now. Yeah. Um, and Minnesota sushi is another beast? That's the land of 10,000 lakes, a truck horn. Those are all lake fish in that sushi, aren't they? Yeah. Anyway. Um... But yeah, if you're at all concerned about, like, is this fish that I'm considering buying, is this a good idea? This is a great way, a great resource for you. And uh, I hope you'll use it if you like eating fish. Or any other kind of seafood, not just fish, but maybe marine arthropods, like crabs or lobsters or shrimp. Or sea squirts. Or um, if you love barnacle soup or something. I don't know. I'm not an expert on seafood. There you go. A very happy International Sawfish Day to us all. I hope you had fun today. I hope you learned something, and I hope you were inspired maybe to learn more about these remarkable animals and help protect them. Because heaven knows they need our help in that regard. And with that having been said... I've been streaming now for over six hours. It's time to wrap this thing up. So let's do it. Let's run our credits and let's find somebody to raid here. Well, thank you, Tommy Plotticus. And uh, Otter Do It says see you this weekend. Oh yeah, shoot, hang on a second. 
Hang on. Don't go away just yet, chat. I totally forgot. There we go. Uh, I will not be streaming later on this week. Because... I'm going to be going to TwitchCon in Las Vegas. So no stream Thursday, no stream Friday, and no stream next Monday. I'm going to be attending TwitchCon Las Vegas. I don't know who any of these people are. I know who that is. The rest of these people, I don't know who they are. I'm going to be attending TwitchCon in Las Vegas. And uh, if you're going to be there, I hope to see you. I've got a special science panel that I'm going to be uh, one of the presenters on. Super, super exciting. And also, I'll just be kind of walking around and doing the normal TwitchCon stuff. If you are going to be there, make sure you attend this panel. Because it's going to be super, super cool. And if if you see me around, ask for one of these buttons. I'm making a ton of these. Uh, and you can have one for free if you run into me. Some exclusive paleontologizing pinned back buttons. So, uh... Yeah. Anybody who's going to be attending TwitchCon like you ought to do it, I can't wait to meet you. I will be having a meetup, too. Um, I'm going to be making a special Discord channel for that, so if you're in the Discord, I can tell you where and when I'm going to be. Because I don't really know the lay of the land there yet, and like where there's space for a meetup, so... Anyway, stay tuned on the Discord. And, uh... It's going to be... Real good. Anyway, well, that having been said, it is time to wrap this thing up after streaming for six and a quarter hours now. Uh, good stuff. Let's find somebody to raid here. do we have on? Let's see. Oh, Melissa is streaming right now. We might go say hello to Melissa from Melissa in Denial. Melissa is an archaeologist and Egyptologist. I guess we can ask her if sawfish have ever appeared in Egyptian mythology or art. Kind of doubt it, but maybe. Anyway, she's always just fun to hang out with. So, uh, yeah, join me in raiding into Melissa. Everybody, thank you so much for a wonderful stream. I hope you've got a newfound love and appreciation and respect for sawfish and a desire to, to make sure that they do not go extinct. They can help these creatures. And, um... You can do your part, stuff like the Seafood Watch app. Anyway. That's just one small way. But it's better than nothing. Thank you for your support and your viewership. Thank you for, uh, for your good questions and your kind words and your enthusiasm, everyone. I appreciate you more than you know. Let's go say hello to Melissa here. And I'll catch you all tomorrow for our last stream of the week. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.